Section 14 of Tin Horns and Calico by Henry Christman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 14 For the Land is Mine. Alvin Beauvais had been on hand to welcome Dr. Boughton because George Evans had sent him on a speaking tour of Albany, Rensselaer, and Columbia counties as much in the larger interests of national reform as to give Thomas de Vere moral backing in his fight to maintain his place in the anti-rent movement. The energetic Irishman had no intention of being pushed aside. Instead of leaving Albany, as the politicians hoped he would, he went up into the Helderbergs at once, striking back at intriguers and drumming up support and subscriptions for a new anti-rent paper. Through the pages of Evans's Young America, he told the farmers that Booten and Harris had robbed them of the freeholder and were using it as a personal political sounding board without regard to basic anti-rent doctrine. Refusing to sell the paper to De Vere on the ground that it might be directed from the purpose for which it had been got up, they gave the editorship to Alexander G. Johnson, a law partner of one of the members of the Whig Party Policy Committee. Johnson was a friend of Ira Harris, and used to boast freely that if he had control of the anti-rent paper, he would make Whigs out of the farmers in less than two years. Benedict Arnold's De Vere called these political opportunists, and when Johnson retorted that De Vere was never pleased with anything they did and had set out to ruin them, De Vere did not deny it. In the course of his campaign to win the farmers' support, he joined Alvin Bove for many of his thirty-two scheduled appearances in the manor towns. For three days they also shared the platform with Dr. Boughton, who was still pallid and weak from his long term in jail. By the end of July de Vere was back in his print shop in Albany, for, as he had once written in The Freeholder, our field is the editorial table. On the 16th of August, he brought out the first issue of his own paper, The Anti-Renter, with the words from Leviticus that he had used in 1836 in his pamphlet Our Natural Rights. For the land is mine, saith the Lord, for ye are strangers and sojourners with me. He promised that the new paper, unlike the freeholder, would be the forthright foe of feudalism in all its aspects. Whether overgorged and gouty in the old world, or lean and hungry in the new, wrinkled with age in the grey castles of Europe, settling down like a suckling calf on our own public lands, or scouring over New York State under the name of patroonery, you may depend I will be down upon it like a sledgehammer whenever I get a chance. He called for a strong union of all working men against the exploiting classes, May this heart become cold, this right hand palsied, when the one will not feel and the other strike home for the cause of the working men. Indeed, our greatest object shall be to unite the farmer, the laborer, and the mechanic in one solid phalanx. Their interests are the same. Their hearts and their votes should be united. Toward this end, de Vere started a second paper, The Albany Workman, aimed at the disgruntled laborers of the pasture and the docks, but it did not last more than a few weeks. Meanwhile, the young school teacher Alvin Bove was proving a good ambassador for both de Vere and the national reformers. He was far more cautious than either Evans or de Vere, for he knew from his own rural background that the farmers were not by nature radical. He never asked more of them than he knew they would willingly do, and the resolution he offered at every meeting was temperate enough to be adopted later in part as government policy. Resolved that we are in favor of freedom of the public lands to actual settlers, with the quantity limited forever. His letters to George Evans from the anti-rent towns were filled with careful observation, understanding, humor, and common sense. On August 3rd he had written from Rensselaerville, I have fairly opened the campaign in the Helderbergs, and if I do not misjudge the signs of the times, it is going to tell in favor of the national movement. In these parts I have heard but one expression of the farmers toward the great measure for which we are contending. From the first to the last with whom I have talked, they are in favor of the freedom of the public lands. 
The first impression, I know, is the most favorable, but the readers of Young America must understand that they are not always to receive so cheering an account of my labors in these regions, for this, many must know, is far ahead of most sections of the oppressed counties in radical doctrine. Agrarianism is not here quite so much used to frighten children with, and the old women of both sexes, as in other parts. But there were, and perhaps are yet, some few even here, who turn a little ghostly at the mention of the awful word. No matter, the hearts of our friends were cheered by the elucidation under this head, and the terror of agrarianism is pretty much departed from Rensselaerville. I undertake to say that the anti-renter who will not set his face like flint against the recurrence of land monopoly in the West does not deserve success in his own behalf, that the national reformer who will not go heart and soul for the upheaval of the same abominable monopoly here is but a poor apology for a reformer after all. Beauvais attended a meeting in Albany on August 7th, at which candidates for the November election were discussed. De Vere was there, and also Big and Little Thunder. Beauvais wrote of the two released prisoners, Both are weak, wan, and emaciated, Belden to the last degree, and it is supposed that the treatment he received at the Hudson jail, such as I did not suppose was inflicted on any human being this side of the Empire of Morocco, had thrown him into hopeless consumption. I do not write this for effect, I write nothing for effect, but I greatly fear the odious prison is killed Belden. He is a young man, not more than twenty-two, I should say, and he assures me he was a perfectly sound man at the time of his incarceration. God knows he is far enough from it now. The Albany Conference was a real success, in Beauvais' estimation, it was a most intelligent and determined body of men, and for the first time, except in our own meetings in New York, I heard the name of anti-rent spoken with respect and conscious pride. Beauvais was delighted to find that de Vere's loss of the editorial post with the freeholder had not affected the farmer's regard for him. They would still stand by him to the last gasp, and so they ought, for he is worthy." Back in Rensselaerville, on August 10th, after having addressed seven meetings in seven days, Beauvais wrote again to Evans in New York City. He found the village of Rensselaerville rather too sanctimonious. The people smothered down their beard with a good deal of self-complacency, and rather thought we could not have one of their churches. Anti-rent wasn't so bad, but agrarianism, oh, that mustn't be tolerated upon any consideration. Well, now we can have any church they have got, certainly, but we won't. His letter continued. All things look charming in the Helderberg country politically, but physically, bless me, it looks as parched and dead as if the destructive Samuel had passed over it. The drought never was so biting within the memory of the oldest inhabitants. Beds of streams are destitute of water. Meadow and pasture are dry as stubble. All nature stands agape for water. So far as my knowledge extends, this seems to be the case in all parts of the county. And still I believe there is a tolerably fair yield of most kinds of agricultural products. Just about here, decidedly the best crop raised this year, though others are good, is that of anti-rent. This probably never was in any former season more flourishing." Wherever I go, I meet the most cordial feelings. National reform is received with open arms. The great principle of limiting individual domain over land, after much of that confused and fragmentary discussion which always precedes the audible utterances of a momentous truth, is very generally adopted in that part of Albany County. In seven meetings, not a voice or a hand has been raised against it, on the contrary, the universal expression, from the ladies and all, is affirmation. While speaking at Smith's Corners near Rensselaerville, Beauvais saw his first Calico Indians. A celebrated chief called Yellow Jacket was understood to be in command, and about the strangest show I ever witnessed. Cooper might do it justice, perhaps, but I can't, and therefore I shan't try. Of the forty disguises, no two bore the least resemblance to each other. 
the chief made a speech full of fine sense declaring the ability and the determination of the indians to watch over and protect the people of these counties so long as present circumstances exist penal laws to the contrary notwithstanding after the speech about eleven o'clock the children of the forest returned amid whoops and yells and blowing of horns on horseback to the rocky mountains from whence they came on august seventeenth when bovey wrote from new scotland that he was staying over to attend a sheriff's sale he gave some amusing sidelights on anti-rent methods this is a mountainous broken country divided by gulfs dark passes and deep ravines and you should know that it is one of the most perverse parts of the united states for officers bearing declarations writs of ejectment etc to travel in they rarely meet with any irreparable accident but the moderate sized stone in the road and there's enough of them no doubt of it over which citizens carriages will pass harmlessly is almost sure to upset a sheriff and break his thills perhaps accidents of this kind are said to have been quite common up here in the time past indeed i passed a spot lately where something of this kind happened not very long ago the circumstances were related to me by a veteran as we rode along the sheriff had carefully tied his horse as he supposed to the fence and had gone into the lots to drive off a flock of sheep suddenly a gust of wind arose tipped over his carriage with a terrible crash frightening his horse and causing him to swear prodigiously well a little boy who was just passing along with a basin of salt in his hand taking fright as was natural at such strange sights and being greatly shocked by the impiety of the sheriff ran with all the might he had in him and the sheep as sheep will do attracted by the salt ran after him before the sheriff got his broken vehicle on its legs again of course boy sheep and all had disappeared so there was nothing left for him to do but limp his bootless way back to albany it is a pity but it can't be helped that i know of furious winds will upset sheriff's carriages especially up this way little boys will be afraid sometimes and run away sheep like salt in a moderate degree and we must make the best of it the good old custom which so generally obtains among the farmers elsewhere of blowing tin horns for dinner is here an obsolete idea the delicate instrument is now only used in these parts on great occasions of state such as the grand entry of the sheriff of albany and perhaps the same honor is paid to one of his inferiors when the august minister of the law appears on capitol hill taking his course toward the setting sun the first farmer as in duty bound sounds his horn straightway then family after family hamlet after hamlet and village after village take up the sound and throw it forward until it climbs the helderberg sweeps through the valleys beyond the passes on to the borders of schenectady schoharie and green for a minute every hill and vale and quiet recess in the twenty-four mile square resound with delectable music of the tin horn then all is silent as the grave the hammer is dropped on the anvil the scythe in the field the plough in the furrow and all is busy preparation to honour the approach of the sheriff soon again a single horn is heard it indicates the road by which this gentleman proceeds he passes another farmhouse and the eternal horn rings forth his progress the sale that bovey witnessed was sheriff batterman's third attempt to sell conrad matthias's stock to satisfy van rensselaer's claims but as he later described it for george evans and the readers of young america it was a fairly tame affair the people came in great numbers the sheriff came but the horses the cows and the sheep did not come in short it was a sale whereat nothing was sold no obstruction no indignity of any kind was offered to the officers they patrolled for two hours or so in search of the horses etc which were advertised for sale but so especially dry was it we have had a beautiful rain since that the animals had probably wandered off in quest of water or more pleasant pasturage 
the fates were adverse, the fun was spoiled. The sheriff drove away his own team and nothing more. The crowd slowly closed up the passage after him, and all was still. No, all was not quite still. The thirty or forty women on the lawn commenced to laugh, cackle, and make other feminine noises, indicating, I should say, a rather dislike for Sheriff Batterman and his companions. The sheriff is a very good-looking man himself, but he is on the shady side of forty and married, and not satisfied with this demonstration of ill-will, they called out to the men, "'Why don't you cheer?' But it wouldn't do. They answered only by a sullen shake of the head, and a determined, "'Not a word, not a word.' Up to this time I was a silent spectator of the scene, had witnessed the passive resistance of the people, like that which the atmosphere offers to a cannon-ball, giving way when it was pushed aside and closing in immediately after and I was glad that it was so. But now I was called upon to provide part of the entertainment. Barn doors were thrown open. Men and women arranged themselves around, sitting, kneeling, standing on the floor and earth outside, clinging to the margin of the haymow, suspended from every beam and pin, hanging all silent there and still. They waited for this individual to open his mouth in speech. To my knowledge, none of the unrivaled corps was present, wherefore I must be content that what was then spoken on the mountain top is never destined to reach the swarming world below. The ever recurring resolution was passed, patriotic songs were sung, hope sat on every countenance, joy beat in every heart, and we went on our several ways. The Helderberg anti-renters were the only ones who were actually successful in resisting without employing the Indians. When bidders came from the city, the tenants sometimes kept the bidding going all afternoon and into the night, up to several thousand dollars for a single cow, until the sheriff had to give up trying to conclude the bidding and called off the sale from exhaustion. Or, if a sale was completed, the city buyer heading out of the mountains would hear unearthly voices, and the animal would be frightened and stampeded into escape. In some instances, the cow was shot from ambush while being led away. Occasionally women took part. Once, as Batterman's horses jogged along in the mountain coolness, bound from Albany into the hills beyond Rensselaerville, two women appeared, one mounted and the other on foot. They followed him, alternately blowing tin horns vigorously, and pouring out the vilest abuse imaginable. Batterman pretended not to notice them, but their signal was heard, and as usual he had his journey for his pains. He finds it impossible in almost every case to serve a declaration. The sharp twang of the warning horn precedes him and ere he arrives the birds are either flown or are safely locked within their domestic castles. Beauvais's next destination was the anti-rent towns of the East Manor. In a letter from Dr. Boughton's home, he furnished vivid glimpses of the country around Alps and of Big Thunder himself. This is the center of Rensselaer County, a forbidding alpine region, but inhabited by a people generous, hospitable, and patriotic. Here reside the two most notable individuals, in some respects, of the present time, perhaps, the famous Hudson prisoners of frightful name. Boughton is nearly restored, Belden far otherwise. And now, seeing that such folios of lies have been printed about Boughton, representing him as every description of villain from the callous murderer down through intermediate grades to the weak, skulking, and treacherous coward, I will give my impression of him from an intimacy of three days' duration. I should say he is a cultivated man, of fair natural abilities, having the domestic and social affections large, with a considerable shade of generous romance pervading the whole character, there is nothing of the thunderer in his appearance. His stature is middling, his voice mild and musical, his eloquence touching and persuasive. He has been the object of excited prejudices of a senseless tyrannical mob, and of a more senseless tyrannical corps of public officers, 
all of whom will live to discover and repent them of their wicked injustice. But can a lifelong repentance in dust and ashes, can a thousand pilgrimages to holy sepulchres raise the dead, how then shall they atone for the inhuman, torturing, inch-by-inch inch murder of Belden? That's the question. Can they raise the innocent dead? While in the East Manor, Bove visited Burton Thomas at West Sand Lake, a nice little country village, rather elite of country villages about here, built upon a small plain, surmounted by a gay, irregular amphitheatre of hills covered with cultivation, or wild, waving boscage, and possessed, I am told, of a considerable degree of refinement. At East Sand Lake, Bove wrote to Evans, I made the acquaintance of that terrible man, Rance Coyle, who is indicted at Troy for various and grievous offenses against the laws, as an Indian chief under the name of Red Jacket. He is a glass-blower by trade, has, notwithstanding the adverse circumstances with which from the first he has been surrounded, attained a considerable degree of cultivation, has collected about him a library of rather remarkable books for a man in his position, and spends his hours of recreation from physical labor in intellectual pursuits. How dangerous to sheriffs he may be, I know not, but he does not look precisely like the man who shall shortly put on the stripes of the penitentiary. The speaking tour ended when Bove had to return to New York City to report to the National Reformers on September 10th. By that time, serious trouble had broken out in Schoharie and Delaware counties, and Dr. Boughton was no longer a free man. Yet Bove felt that the situation as a whole was encouraging. He had traveled several hundred miles through the anti-rent districts, and at all places had been hospitably received. He was, however, strengthened in his conviction that the farmers were not generally radicals who had dug deep into the science of political economy. When their chains began to gall, they determined to throw them off. But as might be expected in the incipiency of such a movement, their measures were fragmentary, and when something more radical was proposed, as might be expected, their leaders held back fearing in some cases that radical measures might interfere with their own project of overthrowing the patroons. His report summed up, The result of my experience in these counties is a conviction that the anti-rent cause is destined to be a most triumphant success. In seven counties their union is perfect, and there is no such thing as a Whig or Democrat among them. They are all anti-renters, their banner is equal rights, and under it they will not go back, but advance. They are strong enough to hold the balance of power, and force the attention of the people to a consideration of their grievances, and the feudal titles they are determined to alter, modify, or abolish. They are too completely organized to think of giving way, and their movement, in connection with that of the national reformers, will yet redeem the condition of labor in this country." End of section 14. Recording by Maria Casper. Section 15 of Tin Horns and Calico by Henry Christman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 15. Lead Penetrates Steel. Four months of the combined efforts of Charles Hathaway, Sheriff Green Moore, and his deputy Osmond Steele had failed to subdue the tenants of Delaware County. Even the threat of Sing Sing was ineffectual. The landlords had been unable to conduct a sale since March. Still hopeful that resistance would break down if they could once force a rent payment, Hathaway turned to Andes, which was anti-rent to a man, and selected Moses Earl for his victim. A less likely candidate for anti-rent heroics could hardly have been found than old Moses Earl, whose farm sprawled across the shoulder of Dingle Hill. He was known as a sober man who would step out of his way to avoid trouble. He had lived on Dingle Hill since he was nine years old, for it was about 1790 when his father, a Revolutionary War veteran, had settled at the foot of the western slope. 
As a boy, Moses took his place beside his father, helping to clear the land and plant and harvest crops. After he grew up and chose Sarah Washburn for his wife, he leased and cleared new land nearer to the summit of Dingle Hill, where his house commanded a wide sweep of the Tremperskill Valley. He could look down across his own broad meadows and wooded slopes and see new clearings beyond. His father, long dead, slept in a rocky field at the foot of the hill. In a few years Moses would join him there. In the meantime, the spare, hard-working old man wanted to be left alone with his wife Sarah, a thin-faced woman twenty years his senior, and their foster children, Parthenia and Henry Davis, whom they had taken into their home in 1826, to take the place of their only child who had died in infancy. Moses had managed to get clear title to one hundred of the two hundred and sixty hard scrabble acres he tilled, but on the rest he paid an annual rent of thirty-two dollars to Charlotte D. Verplank. In the years of his life he had paid over and over again what the farm was worth, but he was an old-school Baptist fatalist who all his life had lived too close to wind and rain, storm and sun, to believe that God's design could be changed. He did not like the feudal economy which shackled him as the hobble-bush tangled Catskill farms, but he would have gone on uncomplainingly paying rent the rest of his life, had it not been for Parthenia, a young woman of strong will who wanted him to take up the gun that his father had laid down. Pressed by Parthenia and his anti-rent neighbors, Moses had withheld his rent, until he owed sixty-four dollars. Once in July, Sheriff Green Moore came to sell some of his cattle for back rent, but nobody made any bid. Fifty calico warriors waited in the woods above the barn, but their services were not needed, and the sale was adjourned to the first Thursday in August. As the first shafts of morning slanted down Dingle Hill, on August 7, 1845, the very day when Boughton and other anti-rent leaders were meeting in Albany to discuss the coming elections, young Edward O'Connor led a band of disguised bovina farmers to Moses Earle's farm. While he stopped at the house for breakfast, other men in Calico were arriving by the score, from Andes, Shavertown, Roxbury, Wolf Hollow, Cabin Hill, Bloomville, Courtright, they gathered near a spring in the woods beyond the upland clearing. It was eleven o'clock when Sheriff Green Moore and Peter P. Wright, land agent for Charles Hathaway and lawyer for Charlotte D. Verplank, turned up Dingle Hill. They expected difficulties, for on the way they had been told that a wagon load of firearms had gone up the hill the night before. Nevertheless, they found Moses Earle calmly gazing down the valley, where men were working in the fields. Confident that the farmer could be persuaded, Moore greeted him affably. "'Did you sign this letter saying you were ready to pay?' he asked. Moses nodded, but added that he had changed his mind. "'You'll have to make the rent out of the property,' he said. Moore and Wright urged him to reconsider, warning him that there might be trouble, as they had seen Indians in the vicinity. Moses wavered and went into the house. He picked up his pocketbook and was about to step outside, but Parthenia Davis stopped him. When he admitted that he had decided to avoid trouble, the young woman snatched the purse from him and triumphantly secreted it in the bosom of her dress. Fixed in his philosophy of never resisting fate, Moses went back to the sheriff. "'You'll have to sell,' he said. Behind the sheltering screen of maple and birch on the hill, Two hundred masked men were organizing the band. Warren Scudder, the deacon's son, was elected chief. He sent forty crack riflemen down the hill to a spot near the home of Richard Morse, the justice of the peace. They were to lie in ambush for Deputy Sheriff Osmond Steele, who was reported on his way from Delhi. If he comes with a posse, Scudder instructed them, turn him back, shoot the horses from under them. Let him pass if he comes alone. The Indians were anxious to avoid a direct clash. There was to be no attempt to block the sale, since this would mean manhandling the sheriff. But as soon as any cow was sold, it was to be shot. 
This strategy was covered by a mutual insurance plan worked out by the Delaware anti-renters. When cattle and horses sold by the sheriff for rent were killed, the tenant became entitled to indemnity for the loss, the value being fixed by a committee. When the sun moved overhead and beat down hotly on the west slope of Dingle Hill, Sarah Earle sent mutton, potatoes, and bread and butter into the woods. Just before one o'clock, Warren Scudder led the Indians out, single file, and lined them in formidable array in front of the house. Moses lugged a pail of whiskey from the house and handed it to the first Indian. He watched as it passed along the ranks. Peter Wright, the landlord's agent, stood it as long as he could, then rode down the line, peering into the masked faces. When he reached Warren Scudder, standing in the center, in a flaming scarlet disguise, the Indian chief stepped forward and thrust his broad sword against Wright's breast. "'Stand back, twenty feet,' he commanded. Angered and astonished, Wright whipped out a pistol. "'Withdraw your sword, or I'll make a hole through you,' he snapped. "'You are breaking the law. I'll not stand back an inch for you or your tribe.' "'Damn the law,' Scudder retorted. "'We mean to break it.' Keeping his sword pressed against Wright's doublet, he reached a free hand under the folds of his calico costume and drew a pistol from his pantaloon's pocket. "'I've got a gun as well as you,' he said. Calico warriors closed in, and, as Wright later testified, commenced blackguarding him. "'Have you come to bid?' Scudder demanded." I've come on lawful business, parried the agent. I'll bid if the property is offered. If you bid, a voice threatened from the long line of masked faces, you'll go home in a wagon feet foremost. Then Osmond Steele and Erastus Edgerton were sighted approaching on horseback. Wright backed away, pocketing his gun. A blast from one of the horns notified the ambushers down the hill to let the two horsemen pass. As they drew near, Sheriff Moore asked a bystander to go with him to the upper pasture to drive the cattle down. The man said he did not want to go. Moore turned to two other spectators, who agreed to accompany him. When the three started off to the pasture, Scudder sent a dozen Indians after them. Presently Moore came back, driving the cattle before him with the help of the men in Calico. His two aides were missing. The last I saw of them, he said, they were close pressed by Indians with swords drawn. I understand they got pricked some. As the sheriff drove the cattle into the lower pasture, Scudder's tribesmen quickly formed a crescent behind him. There were solid ranks of Indians all the way back to the pasture bars, so that Wright, Steele, and Edgerton were excluded from the field and also from the opportunity to bid. On the way to Dingle Hill, Steele and Edgerton had stopped at Hunting's Tavern in Andes. Ephraim Hunting had urged them not to go to the sale, warning them that Indians were already there in full war dress and in menacing numbers, and that their hatred of Steele was at a fighting pitch. The red-headed deputy made a scornful boast. Lead can't penetrate Steele. On his arrival at Earl's, he was in such an ugly mood that the farmers said he must have sweetened his brandy with gunpowder, the legendary potion of Catskill warriors. Now, enraged at being shut out of the pasture, he and Edgerton pressed their mounts up to the gate. Safely barricaded between them, Peter Wright stepped up and demanded that the cattle be driven into the road for the sale. At this moment, William Brisbane drove up. The young Scot had been to Andes to have his horses shod, but he knew his brother Robert was somewhere in the pasture wearing calico. Overhearing Wright's demand, he asked, "'Has the sheriff a right to draw the cattle off the premises and sell them anywhere else?' "'Do you want to dictate to the sheriff?' Wright growled. Brisbane modestly explained that he was not a lawyer, but the notice of the sale called for the bids on the premises." Wright sent Osmond Steele to the barn where the notice was posted, only to learn that Brisbane was right. In the meantime, Brisbane turned to Sheriff Moore. "'Do not attempt to drive the cattle out of that lot, I beseech you, if you value the public peace,' he said earnestly. "'But I will do what lies in my power to protect you in the discharge of your duty.' "'Yes,' agreed the masked Warren Scudder. "'We will not molest the sheriff in the discharge of his duty.' 
but Peter Wright insisted on forcing the issue. The horses' hoofs clattered against the bars as Steele and Edgerton urged them into the pasture, and Wright, hat in one hand and cane in the other, hurried a little ahead. Edgerton called upon all present to render assistance. "'The first man who offers to stop me from driving up the cattle, I will shoot dead,' he cried. He drew his pistol in a circle, as if he were bringing it to bear upon some of the Indians, and fired. Immediately a farmer sprang from the line and fired back. Blood spouted from the breast of Edgerton's horse. Brisbane gave a graphic description of the events that followed, in a letter to Joseph Hoag, a Vermonter who had come to Delaware County to teach school, and had been discharged when he expressed anti-rent sympathies. I then said to myself, I have been here long enough, and I ran out at the barway. If I should judge from the motions of Steele's fingers, he fired twice, and was in the act of firing the third time when he fell. As I was running toward the road, I heard a volley by the Indians. I felt it is no use to run further, for the balls could fly faster than I. During the volley, Steele's horse was shot. It turned its breast toward the fence, and as it was falling on its neck, an Indian ran along the line, raised his rifle, and fired. Steele fell over his horse's neck, mortally wounded. As he fell, a pistol ball passed through an Indian's dress. Sheriff Moore rushed up to the fallen deputy, pleading with the masked men, "'For God's sake, men, desist. You have done enough.' The tumult died to a whisper. Brisbane ran to the house and told the women to get a bed ready. Sarah Earle sprang from her chair, clasping her hands in distress. With the help of Dr. John C. Calhoun, an unbending anti-renter, Brisbane carried the wounded man into the house. There he bathed Steele's temples with vinegar while Dr. Calhoun treated the wound. Peter Wright knelt beside the bed, trying to stem the blood with finger and thumb, but he was weeping so that he could render little assistance. The sheriff sat down at the bedside, gazing with mingled pity and astonishment at the wounded man. If it had not been for the rashness of Edgerton, this would not have happened, he said. Steele suffered stoically, though once he cried out to Peter Wright, Oh, cut my throat and put me out of pain. Someone in the room inquired who fired first, to which some replied, It was the Indians. No, said others, it was Steele. Steele, did you fire first? asked Wright. The wounded man gave a faint cry of pain. Wright repeated, Steele, did you fire? Steele answered plainly and distinctly, Yes, I fired. A moment later he murmured, Lord, have mercy on my soul. Once he looked up and exclaimed earnestly, Oh, my poor wife! Your wife will be cared and provided for, Wright promised. At another point, Steele looked up at Moses Earle, standing over him with face impassive. Old man, if you had paid your rent, he said, there would have been none of this. I wouldn't have been shot. If you'd stayed home and minded your own business, corrected Moses gravely, you would not have been shot. I have paid rent long enough. Until I know what I pay it for, I shall pay no more if I can help it. If they will show me their title, I will pay every cent of the rent, but if they mean to bully me out of it, I will not pay it if it costs forty lives. A former resident of Delhi, who was back for a visit, stopped by the bed. Steele asked him to take his hand. This isn't the way we done business when you left Delhi, he said. No, and little did I expect to find Delhi in this fix. Sheriff Moore was standing at the foot of the bed with one of the wounded man's feet resting on his shoulder to ease the pain. Steele asked the other man to take the other foot. I wish I had been at the bars, said the sheriff. I think I could have prevented all this. It was most reckless of Edgerton to rush into the Indians. Shaken by his own imprudent part in the tragedy, Wright said to Brisbane and Dr. Calhoun, I think there would have been no difficulty if Edgerton had not acted as he did. For some time the Indians remained in the field by the fallen horses, although many begged Scudder to disband them. Several of them had already retreated to the woods. I'll be damned if I go until sunset, Scudder declared. They may yet return to the sale. Many of the warriors remained with him, milling about the pasture, 
until word came that Steele was dying. Then they fled to the woods, many to prearranged hiding places in the dingles of Dingle Hill. Dr. Edward Mackenzie, another anti-rent physician, was called into the woods to treat a wounded Indian, but he said later that he did not know the man. The Indian said he was Edward O'Connor, but an admission by O'Connor would have convicted him of being at the sale in disguise. When told that Edgerton claimed neither he nor Steele had fired, O'Connor said dryly, A fellow about my size has two bullet holes through his clothes. Steele weakened rapidly. About seven in the evening, his wife, a sister, and an uncle, Dr. Ebenezer Steele, arrived from Delhi. Soon after the last shafts of sunlight had withdrawn from Dingle Hill, and the sun had dropped behind the western Catskills, leaving the sky a blaze of dry summer red, Osmond Steele died. Moses Earle's face did not change expression. We are born to a world of trouble, he said. It is the Lord's will that it should be so. As Mrs. Steele sobbed over her husband's body, Moses Earle walked up to the dead man's uncle and offered his hand. It is a very hard case, said Dr. Steele. I do not know, answered Moses. He was created for the very course he has taken. He was ordained to die that way. You must be a fatalist, the doctor said curiously. The Almighty makes no mistakes, replied the old man. Immediately after the death of Steele, the Indians scattered. Some left the state. Others secreted themselves in wild and remote parts of the country, where they slept in caves and under the shelter of the rocks. Some hid closer to home. Many an anti-renter's barn had a comfortable chamber in the belly of the haymow, reached by a narrow tunnel through the hay, which could be found only by someone who knew which two boards to remove from the side wall. Once inside, a hunted man could conceal the entrance by stuffing the tunnel with hay. Women carried food to the fugitives at night, or left provisions at a specified place in the forest. Meanwhile, the press ground out page upon page of vilification. The newspapers reported that Steele's friends would not leave his body on Dingle Hill even for the night, among savage men and women in whose marble bosoms the ravings of his almost distracted wife failed to awaken one kindred emotion. A correspondent for Thurlow Weed's Evening Journal wrote that Moses Earle, who had the coolness and inhumanity of a fiend, had far better be dead than live as he must, dying every day. Oh, if there is justice in heaven, may we not hope and expect that these murderers will be punished. Another said, Steele could not have found a more glorious grave on any field where glory was ever won. When Horace Greeley failed to join in the clamor, pointing out that the farmers had grievances, his own party turned on him. His espousal of free soil and anti-rentism made him guilty, in the opinion of the Whig New York Express, of Fourierism, agrarianism, and infidelity, meaning denial of God. There is more gratification in the camp of our enemies than among the anti-renters, observed the Albany freeholder. The Delaware Express, edited by Charles Hathaway's brother-in-law, called for suppression of all anti-rent newspapers. Liberty of the press is a sacred right, but when it is perverted to such base uses and heaven-daring purposes, it should be at once stayed. Law and order meetings in non-leasehold towns of the county passed resolutions, some reputedly drawn up by John Van Buren, calling on the governor to bring the anti-renters to justice. Uprent Delhi was making a hero of Osmond Steele, a brave and unfortunate man. While the anti-renters were singing, Steele is dead and gone to hell, the uprenters produced a dirge of their own. Lamented Steele, well may we weep o'er thy untimely grave, and angels round shall vigil keep, thou fearless one and brave. Clergymen of several denominations joined with the rector of the Episcopal Church in the funeral service, and the largest church in the village was too small. Three preachers spoke from the piazza, extolling the man whose only crime, they said, had been the faithful discharge of his duty, and exhorting the people to eternal vigilance until the murderers were brought to justice and the majesty of the law was satisfied. 
At a meeting in the Presbyterian Church, Charles Hathaway proposed a monument to Steele's memory, but in spite of the pressure, the two-dollar subscriptions failed to come in. In the end, some influential citizens paid for the tall shaft that was raised over his grave, giving Delhi something worthy of the man and those noble virtues it is designed to commemorate. Sheriff Green Moore made the rounds of the law and order meetings, enlisting citizens to march against the tenants. Within a week, five hundred men were under arms in Delhi. Steel was scarcely buried before posses were down on the farmers like packs to the hunt. Crowds leaving the funeral turned away to see three anti-renters being brought into Delhi in irons, and many a Delhi man, incited by the funeral orations, took up his gun. The scaremongering methods that had succeeded in Hudson were used again. The villagers were told that the farmers were massing to destroy the town. Frederick Steele got leave from the United States Army to lead a posse to avenge his brother's death. James Howe, a brother-in-law, and Timothy Corbin, who had not forgotten the coat of tar and feathers he had received the preceding summer, both went up into the hills with armed deputies. The freeholder saw but two ways of preventing such outbreaks as the one at the Earl's sale. Either an organic change of usages of law not founded in justice, or a suppression of schools and annihilation of the press. Choose ye between them. The ignorant are ever debased and humble, and the partially informed too much inspired by abstract patriotism to clearly discern the intricacy of the social machine or to be submissive to the law's delicacy. Wounded or not, Edward O'Connor had fled across Dingle Hill with another Indian, planning to seek refuge in Pennsylvania. Within a few miles, Edward turned back to visit his sweetheart, Janet Scott, whose father's farm was on the Platte Kill. After seeing her, he decided to work his way south to Baltimore, establish himself there as a singing teacher, and then send for Janet. He got as far as the Neversink Valley, where he had meant to join his friend, but by that time he was tired of sleeping under God's blanket, and so went to work near Palin's factory repairing clocks. There a posse caught up with him. He was taken to Delhi Jail, where, as he reported in a letter, guards with bayonets fixed forced me through the grief hole and swore bitterly if it were not for a merry Friday soon they would come in and stab us. Warren Scudder did not at first see the need for going into hiding. He returned to his home in West Settlement near Roxbury, and the next day was working in a field when a friend raced over the mountain to warn him that a posse was on the way. Jotham Scudder, the old school Baptist deacon, persuaded his son to go to friends on Blenheim Hill. But just as the young man was about to leave, the posse appeared. Warren hid in the haymow until the next night, and then made his escape to Schoharie County. Timothy Corbin swooped down on Roxbury with one hundred men and rearrested Daniel Squires, who had not even been at the sale. From Squires's farm, the posse went clattering up Hard Scrabble Road, flourishing swords and muskets. Terrified, Chauncey Burroughs fled over the hill before them, taking refuge at Grandfather Kelly's. There he crawled under a bed, but he left his feet sticking out, and the posse found him. A neighbor claimed he had heard Chauncey say that if the posse came, he would shoulder his old musket and help the Indians. But when it happened, Chauncey insisted that the most he had ever done was to attend anti-rent meetings. Thorn Moore led another posse to Dingle Hill, took Moses Earl prisoner, and sent him on to Andes with some of the men, while he and the rest went after William Brisbane, who wrote to his friend Hoag, Just as the sun was dipping behind the hills, I heard the clattering of horses' feet coming up a stony bray from the woods. I said to my wife, who was working in the hayfield with me, There comes the posse. The next moment their bayonets glittered in the setting sun, and in two minutes more I was a prisoner. They mounted me upon a tumble-down kind of a machine called a horse, which was so extremely lame in one leg that every step he took I thought he would pitch me over his head. In fact, if it had not been for a fancy I took that the up-and-down sort of motion which he had resembled the words, down with the rent, down with the rent, pretty quickly uttered, 
I don't believe I could have sat on him. At Andes the two parties reunited, and a wagon was procured to convey Earl and Brisbane to Delhi. The Justice of the Peace, Richard Morse, and another neighbor followed in a second wagon to arrange bail. When Moore stopped the posse to raid a house along the way, Morse asked if they might go on ahead. "'I'll be damned if you shall,' Moore replied. When Morse protested that he could not see how they could be detained on the highway, Moore pressed a pistol against his breast. "'I'll blow you through if you attempt to stir an inch further,' he said. Needless to say, the two men were compelled to follow in the wake of this almighty posse, as Brisbane termed it. When Morse reached Delhi, he began to prepare for the next day's legal battle, but instead he found himself in jail, charged with conspiracy. He had to admit on oath that he was the treasurer of the Anti-Rent Association, and was standing by when Steele was shot. And so, although he was a justice of the peace, the captain of a rifle corps, and a man of affluence and good standing, he was held a prisoner, and later indicted for conspiracy. William Brisbane wrote a vivid account of the arrival at the jail. When he and Earl were led inside, Sheriff Green Moore and District Attorney Jonas Houston were there to welcome them. Here is the two old chaps, the jailer said to the sheriff, speaking with a marked brogue. We've got them at last. As the night air had somewhat chilled them, Brisbane asked permission to warm themselves. No, said the District Attorney unpleasantly. Let them die and be damned to them. Turning to the sheriff, he asked, Is this the man, pointing to Brisbane, that has got Steele's pistol in his possession? The sheriff nodded, but Brisbane spoke up. Sir, he said, I have not got Steele's pistol. I never possessed arms of any description in my life, bought, borrowed, or stolen. You are a damned liar, said Houston. I can prove it by some of your neighbors in less than three days. The door of the cell clanged shut, and the two men were prisoners indeed. Presently a voice which they recognized as that of Sheriff Moore called up through the stovepipe below. "'When do you expect to be hung?' it inquired. "'I don't expect to be hung at all,' the young man replied. "'Well,' said the voice, "'there is one thing I can tell you. I am pretty well—' And here, wrote Brisbane, he used such a coarse expression that it is not fit for repetition, upon which I named him and asked if he did not feel shame for himself. We heard no more of him, so I laid myself down upon bare planks without covering of any sort. In due time Brisbane was summoned before the coroner's inquest, which in Spain would have been called the Inquisition. District Attorney Houston struck the table with his hand and greeted Brisbane with an accusation. Damn you, you was at Earl's sale. Yes, sir. Immediately Houston and five or six others put questions to him at the same time, so that he became confused. Once he made the mistake of saying he supposed something or other. No, God damn you, yea or nay, no supposing about it, said Houston roughly. Then he wanted to know whether this one or that one were an Indian or not. Brisbane told him he could not swear they were. You're a damned liar, said the district attorney. He wanted to know who Brisbane thought the masked men were. If you won't take suppositionary evidence on the one side, retorted Brisbane, you shan't have it on the other. God damn you for a liar, a damned perjured villain. All I ask, gentlemen, is simple justice. No mistake you'll get justice, said Colonel Amasa Parker, an uncle of the circuit judge, in a sarcastic tone. Yes, said one of the others, if there is a rope in Delhi. Then they taunted Brisbane with the influence he possessed with the anti-renters. If you had only wagged your little finger that day, one of them said, Steele would not have been shot. I never knew before that I was somebody, wrote Brisbane. I was astonished when I saw that by some strange sort of ledger domain I had become an American Robin Hood. Colonel Parker, then with a sort of mock gravity, for I cannot bring myself to believe that he actually believed what he himself said, told me that by my eloquence I had acquired more influence than any other man in the county, and that if I had not been checked I might have subverted the state itself. The district attorney again wanted to know who Brisbane supposed the Indians were. 
I know nothing about the Indians, Brisbane insisted, and would drag no man from his farm upon mere supposition. At these words his inquisitors raged and shouted at him. The district attorney, by his extreme violence, seemed more like a madman than anything else, but seeing I am but an unlearned man, and knowing but little of such matters, maybe it is the way that men of talent take to prove to the world that they are really such and no impostors. The storm of abuse had such an effect upon my feelings that I burst into tears. "'You are getting excited, Mr. Brisbane,' said Colonel Parker rather mildly. "'You are getting excited.' Then he tried very persuasively to get Brisbane to tell who the Indians were. "'Since this is the way you use your witnesses,' said the young man violently, "'God knows how you mean to use your prisoners. You have had my answer. You will get no other.' "'Take the damned old curse to a dungeon,' Houston told the jailer, "'and let him lay ten years till he rots if he won't tell.' Brisbane's own account follows. "'I was doomed to a far severer ordeal than that. "'If they had sent me there, they would not have seen my agony. "'There the tears that I shed would not have nourished their revenge. "'There some ministering angel on his errand of mercy and love "'might have soothed my sorrow-stricken heart and assuaged my grief.' but no such comfort awaited me. I was taken from the jury-room up into the court-room, where the guard abused me in a most brutal manner. Once he made a pass at me with a fixed bayonet, and damned me as a foreigner. By, he would run me through, and he wished to God that every ship might sink that came over with old country people. During the enacting of this scene, some five or six people came into the room, one of them spoke kindly to me, but still his very kindness was mixed with gall and wormwood that sank deeply and bitterly into my soul. Among other things, he told me that my character was gone, and that the jury was dissatisfied with my evidence, and that the only chance I had of saving myself was to go down and throw myself upon the mercy of the court and tell them all I knew. I told him I was innocent of the charges brought against me, and that I did not beg for mercy, I demanded justice, that I had told the court the truth and asked no favors. Then they let me alone. I walked to the window and saw Dr. Calhoun upon the square with Peter P. Wright, Edgerton, and some others, talking apparently very angrily to him. I called to him and told him to tell my wife to employ counsel for me, for I had seen by that time that the prejudice that existed against me would compel me to stand trial. While I was talking to the doctor, a guard came into the room, raised his musket, and swore he would shoot me down if I did not quit talking. I told him to blaze away, for I was desperate, that he had heard all I was saying, and I would take the opportunity I had of sending my message to my wife. In the evening I was again removed to the jail." So complete was the disappearance of the Indians that a month after the Earl's sale, harvests remained ungathered. Hay, heaped together on that morning, lies rotting in the meadow, unmade and unshocked, one newspaper reported. Fields of grain have ripened and fallen down because the reapers are fugitives from justice. Posses rode roughshod over the farms, pillaging and destroying. They go to the people's houses at night, take the men if they find any, load them with chains, fling them into a wagon, some of them without hats, coats, or shoes, and they will drag them around in that condition in the hot sun all next day, wrote one letter writer. If they don't find them in their beds, they drive their bayonets through everything in the house. If they are anti-renters, that is sufficient. They destroy their property, they go to the milk cellars, upset the milk, and destroy their victuals, ride through the fields of grain, and do all such lawful things. Innocent people were arrested and clapped into jail merely because they were politically opposed to the uprenters. William K. Jocelyn, taken to Delhi through a soaking rain and locked up without a fire to dry his clothes or a bed to rest on, was told he had been arrested on the statement of a man whom he had opposed as a candidate for the legislature. He was told it would be proved that he was at the Earl's sale in disguise, even though he had never been an Indian and he would hang for it. Others were punished for having too much influence among the farmers. On August 20th, Dr. Jonathan Alaben was arrested, though he had nothing to do with the Earl case. 
having just returned from the Industrial Congress in New York, where he and Devere had carried the message of anti-rentism to a notable gathering of radical leaders. Although District Attorney Houston told him he would not be indicted if he would vote the law and order ticket, Dr. Alabin wrote a letter to Devere, making it clear that he would not compromise. Today I find myself incarcerated within the walls of the Delhi Bastille, surrounded by the vigilance of the keen-eyed aristocracy. I am not gagged, bound, or handcuffed. Yet, though I have been more than once threatened, I ask no sympathy from tyrants, nor do I expect any favors shown by their tribunals. I only regret that my voice is confined. Imprisonment was no real hindrance to a man like Alaban so long as he could get letters out of the jail. His metaphors may have been confusing, but his sentiments were plain. The tenants would win, he said, in spite of the strong arm and shaggy mane of aristocracy. Anti-rentism is moving swiftly, and every jog it receives from its opponents gives new impulse to the accelerated motion of its massive wheels. Rest assured that the friends of democracy are only to be up ere morning breaks and the shadows flee away, tugging at the helm, and we shall be able to bring our little crafts alongside, casting our anchor, suffrage, into the ballot-box, and pouring into the old worm-eaten, copper-corroded patroonery the contents of our well-charged basilisks, and send her, mastless, sailless, rudderless, to the bottom. Some of the most graphic descriptions of the terrorist campaign in Delaware County were contained in the letters of Joseph Hogue, the school teacher, which were published in anti-rent papers. A few weeks after one letter described a drunken raid by a posse led by James Howe, another man named Hogue happened upon an uprenter who mistook him for the author of the letter. He was seized by the throat and shamefully misused before the law and order gentleman realized his error. He may bless his stars that he was mistaken, wrote the real Hogue. I can assure him I would be the last Yankee, the last Vermonter, that he would wish to abuse. Later, when Sheriff Moore refused to admit him to the Delhi jail to visit his anti-rent friends, Hogue said firmly, My mouth shall not be padlocked, my hand shall not be fettered easily. As the number of anti-renters in the jail increased, Dr. John Calhoun organized a meeting of witnesses to the shooting of Osmond Steele, in order to give the public a correct statement of the facts. A posse raided the meeting, arrested the secretary, and confiscated all the affidavits. One of their first objects, observed the Albany freeholder, has been the arresting of every spectator who would cause an impartial account of the deplorable tragedy to be published. Gradually, though, the truth about the Delhi reign of terror did get out, and there was a reaction. Even the Whig press revolted, although politics and an unparalleled opportunity to destroy Silas Wright may have had something to do with their change of heart. Weed's Evening Journal began to publish articles condemning the crusade as bordering on barbarous revenge. Shall our fellow men continue to be hunted like wild beasts in the forest by self-constituted avengers of violated law, the journal demanded, dragged upon mere suspicion before a tribunal, exercising, it is said, the powers of the Spanish Inquisition. The county of Delaware cannot be dragooned into quietness unless a war of extermination be commenced and prosecuted. James Gordon Bennett of the New York Herald dispatched a reporter to Delhi for a first-hand account. The same man he had sent to interview Dr. Boughton in the Hudson jail earlier in the year. Bennett explained to his readers that the ignorant farmers had been duped by outside agitators, including Horace Greeley, who had preached radical agrarianism and made Delaware County the abode of anarchy, confusion, and murder. Men with minds imbued with the spirit of a fiend have marched forth in battalions and resisted officers in the execution of their duty, in mere wantonness put to death an innocent and harmless individual, for the gratification of evil passions and base desires, the offspring of cupidity, meanness, and avarice. Having taken this uncompromising position against the farmers, Bennett must have been as shocked as he was enlightened when his reporter began to file stories actually favoring the tenants. 
one of the first sights to confront him in Delhi was a tall, raw-boned youth with an ear-piercing fife to his mouth, marching up and down one of the village's three hotel stoops, playing patriotic strains to awaken the surrounding country to the alarms of war. All the three hotels were as hard at work making money as their fellows at Saratoga. Mounted soldiers galloped through the streets in clouds of dust, flourishing swords and muskets. Squads of armed men marched before the jail. The reporter surveyed the fine houses of the landlord's agents and the politicians, and then went to the little jail, which he found neat outside, but far from particular within, more like a dirty emigrant boarding-house than a county jail. He admitted that perhaps these conditions were not easy to avoid, with prisoners being brought in by the fives and tens, but they might afford to pay some old woman for sweeping the floors, the stairs, and the hall, which are extremely filthy, and in strong and discreditable contrast to the outside of the building, all white and spruce as it is, just as if turned out of a great big bandbox. This cleaning of the outside of the cup and platter I detest. There is, he continued, a terrible earnestness in the thoughts, actions, and manners of almost all I have met on either side, which forbids anything like dispassionateness and impartiality, either from the down-renters or the up-renters. When he looked for anti-rent farmers, he could find none. They were all in hiding. I might indeed have had long talks with the women, he wrote, but the females are so excited and abusive, I know their remarks would be sound and fury. He described one old woman who rushed from her house near Andes to confront a passing troop of horsemen, with violent gesticulations and the whole recourse of her billingsgate. When the posse continued on their way, ignoring her, she yelled after them, "'Hallo, spies! Have you Bub Steele with you? If you have, I'd like to see him, that's all.' It was with great difficulty, wrote the reporter, that the men could keep their tempers at this last insult to the dead. To the old men, he found, the anti-rent question was as clear as the sun at noon. The man who lives on, labors, and rears a family on the soil is the true and rightful owner thereof until a better title is shown. Until a good title, honestly, fairly, and constitutionally acquired, is shown by the landlords, they are usurpers. If the present tenants, fathers and grandfathers, were fools enough to enter into any compact with such men, it is preposterous that such should bind or be precedent for them. Even their own payment of rent in a moment of incautious simplicity is a precious bad reason why they should always do so with their eyes open. It is foul, cruel, and oppressive to protect and encourage a lazy, worthless, immoral, and bastard aristocracy to ride roughshod over the pith and marrow of the country, the laborious husbandman. Say what you will, continued the herald writer, paraphrasing the old men's words, there was a time when these lands belonged to the state, and so they do still, unless it had in exchange good and lawful consideration, show us what that was. If you cannot do this, you authorities, you would betray your trust by interposing your power to supplant honest men who are willing to treat with you, but not with base and ambitious interlopers in the person of landlords. The old men told the reporter that it was visionary and hopeless to expect reform from the legislature, and therefore they had no alternative but to right the wrong themselves. As for the use of disguises, they will not be tempted to forfeit any advantage derived from cunning, the arms of the weak, until their adversaries meet them on equal terms. After his visit to the infected countryside, the reporter became an outright anti-rent apologist. In contradiction to the Herald's previous statement, that the tenants were rich in the world's goods, worth twelve thousand dollars, the profits of their leased land, he was ready to state that the tenants were of inferior circumstances, many of them poor, he saw the evil effects of the leasehold tenures in the neglected condition of their farms, dwellings, and appurtenances. He would be of a strange temper indeed, he wrote, who would cherish and enrich land and accumulate property and improvements on it, while he knew that he could not dispose of it at his decease, nor sell, nor convey by deed or mortgage, nor in any way alienate it. 
he who suffers from these oppressive conditions is bound hand and foot, and he would be more than a man if he did not feel his energies prostrated and his courage daunted by their pressure. When the reporter went down from the Delhi jail to see the men who had been dragged from their homes to the filthy prison, he found nearly all of them cheerful and anything but despondent. In meeting Dr. Boughton earlier in the year, he had been struck by the total absence of any of the qualities needed to direct and control a fierce mob, and he found the present prisoners equally gentle. He described Brisbane as a man of great natural abilities, possessed of extraordinary influence with the masses, and reported that he and Moses Earl were made the butt for the untempered brutality of the authorities. Earl's demeanor bespoke a grave and discreet individual, he wrote, but the old man had become eminently the object of antipathy. More than three or four times the newspaper man had heard persons swear that the damned old villain, pointing to Earl, was sure to get the rope and would have got it sooner, only for respect for law and order. All this, and ten times as much in the same spirit, the bold fellow listens to with thorough sang-froid, he is a tough subject, otherwise he could not stand it for one day. Brisbane, too, was impressed by Moses Earle's stoicism. In one of his many letters he wrote, Only one in the jail came in for a greater share of abuse than myself, and that was Earle. But he seemed to receive it with perfect coolness, I thought sometimes with indifference. They would come and damn me for a foreign bee, bring him out and hang him up without judge or jury. I remember while I was one day brooding over my misfortune, but it is like drawing a file across my heart to think of it, a voice at the door called me by name. I thought it might be someone come to give me a little consolation. I went to the door, and there stood a well-dressed man, but a strange sort of malice seemed to flash from his eyes. I felt my heart tremble. Brisbane, said he, you are poor, and we will scatter your family to the four winds of heaven. He said no more, at least I heard no more, for my blood seemed arrested in its course. I thought my very heart would burst. John Latham, one of my fellow prisoners, tried to calm me. But when I again thought of the dark, unfeeling revenge that seemed to be let loose upon my helpless family, my spirits would again sink within me. But then I would say, surely the ear of heaven will never listen to such a prayer, and it did not. The abuse became so intolerable that as a last recourse I appealed to Sheriff Moore, and hoped he would do what lay in his power to put a stop to it. They were not so bad after that. I must accept Jim Howe, however, for whether it was to give him an appetite for his breakfast or to help his digestion I cannot say, but most every morning after breakfast time he would come and give us a round or two of abuse. We had become so used to his tirades that we actually felt lonesome if he happened not to come. I often wondered where he got such a stock of slang phrases, seeing he lived in the quiet village of Delhi. Surely he must have possessed a Billingsgate glossary and studied it well. Time passed heavily and slowly with us. Having few books to read, we resorted to various petty expedients to beguile the time, such as pitching scents into an old shoe. Those among our visitors who were most civil and polite, I would sometimes ask the favor of lending me a book. A Mr. Runnels supplied me with several numbers of Blackwood's magazine, and we would sometimes amuse ourselves by contrasting the liberal sentiments expressed in that Tory journal with the rude and barbarous slang and bloody expression of those feudal Republicans of Delhi. A Captain Webster was among the most civil of our visitors, we were always glad to see his honest-looking face at the diamond hole in the door. I always thought he looked too honest to be a real uprenter. Mr. Shepherd, too, was a most pleasant and agreeable visitor. Perhaps the highest compliment I can pay him is that I believe he was a Christian in every sense of the word. I yet remember, but I shudder when I think of it, some of the prisoners requested of the sheriff the privilege of hearing a sermon— so upon the Sunday following we were taken down into the hall to hear, as we thought, the gospel preached. But to our astonishment we had to listen to our funeral sermon, for a more bloody hang-them-all discourse could not have fallen from the lips of Jack Ketch himself. 
there seemed to be no hope, either in time or in eternity, to be an anti-renter was to commit the unpardonable sin. What a relief it was when Shepherd closed the exercise with a prayer. As he fervently addressed the throne of grace, he seemed to feel that he himself was a sinner, while his countenance brightened as he contemplated that ransom whereby the chief of sinners can be saved. For that bloodthirsty preacher to kneel by the side of Shepherd was to commit an act of the very blackest impiety. You may readily conceive we asked for no more uprent sermons. It is astonishing to me how we kept our health as well as we did. During the period of nine weeks I was only once allowed about one hour of outdoor exercise, and there we were surrounded by a fence of bayonets. I stepped forward to the line to shake hands with Dr. Alaben, but a couple of guards immediately made their muskets clash between us. To shake hands with a friend was a luxury I was not allowed to indulge in. Our cell was, I think, about twelve feet square, and for the most part of the time there were six of us confined together in that narrow space. On the heels of Osmond Steele's death, Governor Silas Wright had urged an end put forever to this perpetual relation of landlord and tenant, a relation already so fruitful of anything but peace and prosperity. Now he seemed to feel that the proper method of achieving that end was indeed the extermination of the tenants. On August 27, 1845, twenty days after the sale, with the Indians in complete rout, and nearly one hundred anti-renters in jail, including the most effective leaders, Wright declared Delaware County to be in a state of rebellion and sent three hundred troops to the already armed village. As soon as the new troops arrived, Charles Hathaway, with the state treasury at his disposal, ordered all tenants to pay their rent within three days, or the distress warrant shall settle it. A writer for the freeholder visited the farmers and reported that dejection sat upon their faces, but they were silent. Governor Wright's move, declared Thurlow Weed in the evening journal, made the state the aggressor, adding fuel instead of dampening the flame. That odious instrument of despotic power, the distress warrant, as a kind of retaliatory measure, certainly will not in a very high degree help bring about harmony. Horace Greeley said that instead of dispatching troops, Wright should have investigated the influence of large estates on the moral, intellectual, and general well-being of their inhabitants. Building prisons to hold all the anti-renters and poor houses for all the ejected families would be rather expensive, he prophesied. The absentee landlords of Delaware County were delighted to use Silas Wright's troops as rent collectors. This will add heavily to the burden already upon the tenants, was the sanctimonious comment of the Atlas, Wright's mouthpiece in Albany, and there is little doubt that more than a thousand, two years ago, happy and prosperous people in this county are ruined, or are on the road that must end in ruin, and too, too many with their property will lose their character. How true that the way of the transgressor is hard." Former Governor William H. Seward took note of the situation in a letter dated August 30th. Governor Wright and his friends despair of weathering the anti-rent storm. How bloody instructions return to torment their inventors. His proclamation would have been needless now had mine commanded the support it deserved. When September frosts brought the first color to the western Catskills, Farmers were still being dragged to jail for the Earl riot, sometimes as many as twenty a day. When every room in the prison and the courthouse was filled, state troops shouldered axes and went to the woods to cut logs for three emergency buildings, two for the prisoners and one for the pitchfork guard. The log pens, as they were called, were finished on September 6th, and the courtroom was cleared to make way for the trials. End of section 15. Recording by Maria Casper. Section 16 of Tin Horns and Calico by Henry Christman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 16. Brimful of Wrath and Cabbage. 
Word had reached Blenheim Hill, Schoharie County, as early as July 1845, that it was important to anti-rentism to make a decisive stand in adjoining Delaware County the next time the sheriff tried to hold a sale at Moses Earl's. The Indians of Blenheim Hill were anxious to make good their failure to send help in March, and fully aware that a successful sale in Andes would mean redoubled efforts by the landlords in all the counties, they held a series of special drills in Hilton's woods. On August 4th, three days before time to go to Dingle Hill, the Calico warriors were unexpectedly kept busy at home. The authorities had got wind of the plan for joint action, and in compliance with urgent appeals from Sheriff Green Moore across the county line, General John S. Brown, the sheriff of Schoharie County, invaded the backbone. He had heard that the Indians were armed and ready, brimful of wrath and cabbage, and he too was anxious for a fight. Armed to the teeth, and ferocious enough to eat a biled engine, he and under Sheriff Tobias Boke set out with warrants for the arrest of Dr. John Cornell, Benjamin Curtis, Thomas Peasley, John Mayhem, and Thomas Roman, the strong men of the Schoharie County Anti-Rent Association. They were most eager to get Dr. Cornell, a worthy and respected gentleman and a skilled physician, because the old news carrier, as they called him, relayed messages and took the latest word into all the remote farms he visited. All the way up the valley, Sheriff Brown pressed men into service with him. By the time he reached North Blenheim Village under the hill, he had a four-wagon train of armed deputies. He had hoped to sneak his men up the hill through the dangerous rocks under cover of darkness, but as he began the ascent, he found a masked band waiting to seize the arms and ammunition. Horns sounded, and his posse, most of them inexperienced, and many unwillingly enlisted, hugged their guns and looked uneasy. The sheriff prudently ordered a retreat to Fink's Tavern to await the daylight. The next morning, an anti-rent scout was watching from a small clearing along the Schoharie Creek, when the invading force again moved toward the backbone. He sent up a coil of smoke as a warning. A second scout, stationed at John Mayhem's log cabin, caught the signal and relayed it over the mountain top. The posse moved cautiously up the steep narrows and stopped to arrest John Mayhem, one of the best anti-rent speakers in the county. Naturally, Mayhem was gone, but the sheriff's men opened fire on his brother Stephen as he made a dash for the woods where the Indians were gathering. Luckily for him, the bullets fell short. The posse's horses were turned loose to trample Mayhem's sixteen acres of rye, just as they later destroyed Isaac Baker's and Thomas Peasley's fields of oats. At the Peasley farm, they opened fire on Nathan Peasley, who was racing toward the woods with a basket of food. Though the shot caught him in the back, he kept on running. He was not in disguise, but the posse could not make out who he was, they badgered one of the little Peasley boys to tell them, but Mrs. Peasley stepped between them and threatened the men with a stick of wood. Nathan did not stop until he reached the shelter of the Indian camp. Then he fell exhausted, blood trickling from his side. Several men reached for their guns. They've commenced the shooting, they said. We'll give them all they want. But Thomas and Sheldon Peasley restrained them. If they come to attack us here, shoot to kill, said Thomas sagely. Let them alone now. We'll have the state troops here and the devil to pay if we aren't careful. Nathan agreed. Leave the work to me. If I ever find the man who shot me, I'll shoot him like a dog. Unable to find any of his quarry, the sheriff moved into Blenheim Hill, making the Brimstone Church his headquarters. From there, raiding parties were dispatched to the homes of all the anti-rent leaders, at Dr. Cornell's home, they found a small anti-rent flag hanging from the corner of the corn crib, and the commander sent six men to take it down. "'By all means,' mocked Mrs. Cornell, "'send six of your best men. Two of my little children made the flag and put it up themselves.' The deputies tramped through the house until they came to a bedroom where the frightened children were hiding. "'Get those damned brats off the bed,' barked the leader." You've got them there to conceal the old man. Mrs. Cornell faced them down. 
Call off your men and get them sober, she said. The commander repeated that she was hiding the doctor. There's one building down yonder you've missed, she said. Nobody noticed her acid tone. Without thinking, four of the men rushed off in the direction she indicated. They came back swearing, took the older Cornell boys into custody, and marched them off to the Brimstone Church. During this series of raids, at least twenty boys were seized on nearby farms. Sixty years later, in a letter to a descendant of John Mayhem, Mrs. N. K. Hoagland vividly recreated the occupation of the backbone. I was then at my father's house, John J. Warner, a young girl in my teens. A large number of uprent men came to my father's house. Mother talked to them kindly and told them what the war was for and how unjust the rent was. Father was a prisoner in the Brimstone Church on this day. It seems they did not know what they were making war over. One of the men said to my mother, Is that what we were sent here for? I pay rent myself and do not believe it is right to do so. Several others expressed the same sentiment and said they had been warned out to fight and thought that they had to. The Brimstone Church at the time was full of men they had made prisoners. They captured every man they could find who would not say up rent. They captured also my brother John and made him a prisoner. Upon mother learning of this, she started for the church with some bread and a pie. The scene at the church brought tears to her eyes, and it also roiled her Dutch blood. John, she demanded, you come home with me. A man by the name of Jake Allen spoke and said, No, he can't go home with you. Do you think we are going to be affected by the tears of women and children? Taking the boy by the hand, saying, John, you come home with me, she bade her dear husband goodbye and returned home. All of the boys were released the next day, and with about fifteen adult captives, taken without warrants, Sheriff Brown moved to Ira Rose's tavern in Gilboa. When the anti-renters re-entered the Brimstone Church, they found the interior a near shambles. James Van Dusen hammered out new iron bands for the anti-rent pole, and early Saturday morning, August 9th, the men in Calico raised a new standard. The Indians and the farmers gathered at the church to determine on a plan to release the prisoners held in Gilboa, inasmuch as they had been taken without warrant, none had been in disguise, and they had offered no resistance. The young men wanted to shoulder muskets and storm the tavern, but the cautious majority wanted to try legal steps first. In the midst of the discussion, a horseman rode up breathlessly with the news that Osmond Steele had just been shot at the Earl's sale in Delaware County. Under the sobering impact of that report, even the most reckless abandoned any idea of marching to Gilboa. That afternoon, Thomas Vroman went down to Mooresville with his sorrel horses, riding one and leading the other. An hour later he returned with Warren Scudder riding the second horse. Late that night, Amos Loper of the Ridge took Scudder to Lyman Roots, where the fugitive had his boots resold by candlelight, while he gave them the details of the Moses Earl sale and its tragic aftermath. When rumors reached Delhi that Scudder was on Blenheim Hill, Colonel Cook and General Griffin led a posse of 150 armed men on an illegal expedition to the backbone, which was beyond the borders of their county. Sheriff Brown joined them with a posse from Gilboa, and another armed unit came over the hill from Jefferson, making five hundred men in all. "'We have come to fight,' Colonel Cook grimly told the sheriff. "'Shoot the anti-renters. They are all accessories to the death of steel.' Brown reoccupied the Brimstone Church, and Cook preempted one of the Peasley farms. Hay and grain were taken from the farmers' barns to feed the horses, and cellars were raided to feed the five hundred men. This time, Sheriff Brown's men succeeded in capturing Dr. John Cornell and a number of others, but only after creating chaos on Blenheim Hill. Non-offending, peaceable, and unfortunate citizens were fired upon, reported the Albany freeholder. Sally Ann Champlin was fired upon while picking berries. Three bullets were hurled at her for gathering the fruits of the fields. Jeffrey Champlin was driven into the woods, where for two nights he lived on blackberries. Even up-renters went into hiding. 
Handbills offering a large reward for Warren Scudder's arrest were scattered all over Blenheim, but before the posse could locate him, J. Tompkins, who lived up the mountain road toward Cobleskill, helped him across the mountains to Westerlo, Albany County. The prisoners locked up in the tavern at Gilboa refused to become subdued. Bill Roman was infuriated when he found the preacher helping the sheriff's men. "'You blackleg,' he stormed. "'Stand here and load guns to shoot the very men who have put food in your mouth and clothes upon your back. Let the report of what you are doing get back to Blenheim Hill, and the men will hang you from the high box pulpit where you have so often preached to them about the hell you will go to.' Dr. Cornell had a chance for either deliberate or inadvertent revenge when he was asked to treat a large portion of Brown's army, who were sick with a common August ailment. The doctor administered a thorough cleansing, and more than fifty of the posse lived a strenuous life for a few days. Gilbert R. Cumming, an uprent Gilboa lawyer, set up an illegal self-constituted court, and began an inquisition of the prisoners. When the farmers sent a sympathetic lawyer to stop it, he too was arrested. As the anti-renters were reluctant to appear on any of the main roads, they persuaded Alonzo Morehouse, a carpenter who later became a famous clergyman in the Catskills in New York City, to go to J. Tompkins and ask him to get Thomas Smith, one of the ablest lawyers in the county. As I had never been implicated with them, with the exception of warm sympathy, I consented, Morehouse wrote in his autobiography. It was night and dark, and as I was unacquainted with the way to Tompkins's, I was compelled to inquire at every crossroad. No man could be seen until I was known to be a friend of the anti-renters, and then the husband or brother would put his head out of the window, give me directions, and say, God bless you. When Morehouse found the house on the mountain road, J. Tompkins was already on his way to Westerlo with Warren Scudder, and the only other man on the place was his father, who was too old to go and fetch the lawyer. Exchange your horse and take our best one, the old man told Morehouse. Do not spare him. Nothing is too good for this work. The next day Thomas Smith arrived in Gilboa. He went directly to the sheriff and demanded immediate release of the prisoners, reminding him that every civil right had been violated, and that the sheriff had encouraged mob rule by permitting Cummings's self-constituted court to function. Smith threatened to go at once to the courts and swear out warrants against Sheriff Brown, his entire posse, and the invading force from Delaware County. Since Smith was too prominent, both in his profession and in the Whig party, to be given the summary treatment accorded to the tenant's first counsel, the sheriff was thoroughly upset, and Colonel Cook promptly returned to Delaware County. It was deemed advisable by the authorities and the people of Gilboa to make a proposition to the anti-renters, the Schoharie Republican reported. John Mayhem and George Badgley were called in by Sheriff Brown for a peace conference. The sheriff promised to release all prisoners and put an end to the raids, if the influential men among the anti-renters would use that influence to make the farmers surrender all disguises, to prevent any person from appearing in disguise, and to restore peace, order, and proper respect for the law. When the two anti-renters agreed to those terms, Sheriff Brown went at once to the jail, liberated the prisoners, and proclaimed a general amnesty. The up-renters were outraged. It is a hard pill to swallow, the Albany Argus correspondent wrote. The investigation, as far as it had proceeded, had begun to develop important facts, and had it been pursued, it would, it is believed, have unfolded in detail a foul conspiracy against the government. A general resistance and rebellion were calculated on. The murder of Steele was to be the signal for the commencement of operations, Enough has been disclosed, and indeed the resolutions passed at the meeting today are sufficient to show, that the Indian combinations are identified with the general anti-rent associations, however much they deny it. In the next paragraph, the correspondent betrayed the true reason for his alarm. There will be a hard struggle for the political ascendancy. Whether the Whigs will fall in with them or not is not known. Since the tenant's lawyer, Thomas Smith, was a Whig, 
he was accused of becoming an anti-renter for political objects, and of throwing every obstacle in the way of the sheriff. The politicians in Delhi were shocked by the wretched compromise made by the authorities of Schoharie. They demanded the immediate removal of Sheriff Brown. This very act will give the cause of rebellion and insurrection more character than it has ever claimed, wrote the Argus correspondent. It is admitting that these men have a distinct legal or political character equal with the government. End of section 16. Recording by Maria Casper. Section 17 of Tin Horns and Calico by Henry Christman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 17. Packed Court. Another result of the shooting of Osmond Steele was the recall of Dr. Smith A. Boughton for a second trial. The affair in Delaware County caused Governor Wright to declare that I, being the principal leader, must be made an example of, he wrote in his memoirs. The reopening of the case came as a surprise to him, for empty pocketbooks had taught many Columbia County up-renters to say down-rent, and he did not expect the businessmen to risk another boycott. Nevertheless, on September 1, 1845, he found himself back in Hudson and filled with forebodings. He knew a hard fight lay ahead. Money had been unsparingly used by the feudal lords, and he had reason to believe that some of it might reach the bench or the jury, in spite of the vigilance of Ambrose L. Jordan, who was to defend him again. John Van Buren, again sent to Hudson by Silas Wright to supersede local authorities, was already there, insisting on immediate trial. Aside from his partisanship and the political necessity of vindicating the policy which he himself had helped to formulate, the younger Van Buren had a personal stake in the outcome of the Boughton trial. Tall and handsome, a likable hail-fellow well met, Prince John had a strong following among the younger Democrats, but he was still anxious to justify his appointment as Attorney General. Boughton's second trial afforded an ideal opportunity for Prince John to establish himself, especially since Judge John Worth Edmonds had come up from New York City to try the case. Edmonds was an unshakable Democrat and a close personal and political friend of both Silas Wright and Martin Van Buren. He had started his law practice in the Van Buren office, and in the spring of 1845 had been appointed by Wright to the circuit bench in New York. His pretext for leaving his own jurisdiction now was a sentimental wish to return to his old home for a circuit, but political and personal incentives were obviously stronger. Making no pretense of impartiality, Judge Edmonds boasted that he would convict Big Thunder in short order, though it had taken Judge Parker three weeks to try him in the spring without getting a conviction. The landlords had finally succeeded in finding a judge devoted to their interests, and Boughton realized it. When the trial opened on September 3rd, friends of Prince John and Judge Edmonds packed the courtroom. Few of the farmers who thronged the city could find seats, and many milled in the courthouse square, waiting eagerly for news. Their fear that the judge was packed was soon confirmed. Edmonds ruled that no person was competent to serve as a juror who had lived in any infected district or who believed the tenures unwholesome. The tenants observed bitterly that the court had nothing to say about the ferocious hate of those who lived in uprent towns. Alvin Bove, stopping on his way back to New York from his tour of the anti-rent counties, found the judge is all on one side, and there is a crushing official force bearing down to effect conviction. At the beginning of the trial, Judge Edmonds demonstrated how effective a landlord agent he could be. He was paying his political debts by closing his eyes to the evils of the semi-feudal tenures, evils with which he was thoroughly familiar and which he was capable of describing in graphic terms after the trial was over. He knew almost everybody in the county, and used this knowledge freely to help Prince John hand-pick the jury. 
With question after question, John hammered away, trying to break down one talesman's claim to impartiality, and in the end he appeared convinced. But the judge recessed the court and called the young prosecutor into his chambers. I have known that man for a long time, he said. He never saw a dog fight without taking sides. He lives on the border of the manor and within half a mile of the tavern where the anti-renters gather. His story of indifference cannot be true. The man's wife, children, and neighbors were summoned for questioning. And the next day, Prince John elicited testimony that the veneer man was one of the most radical anti-renters, that once when a deputy sheriff had been shot at, he had declared that the fellow should have been killed, that he had worked for anti-rentism at the polls, and had said no man not an anti-renter ought to be allowed to vote, and that although he was penurious, he had contributed toward the cost of defending Dr. Boughton. Drawing of the jury was slow and tedious, and the only excitement was when sharp-tongued Aquafortis tangled with Judge Van Buren. Judge Edmonds called Jordan's deportment offensive and disrespectful, and said the lawyer tried his irascible temper quite severely. But the spectators liked the relief from the tedium. Coming late one morning, Jordan found that the court had convened without him, over the protest of his assistant, James Storms. With eyes flashing, he strode down the courtroom, brusquely interrupted Storms in the midst of examining a juror, and took over the questioning himself. The atmosphere was electric a few moments later when he challenged the admissibility of some of Van Buren's evidence. There was an angry exchange between the two men, and Jordan finally turned on Van Buren. Mr. Attorney General, he snapped, I will not submit to this offensive language any longer. I give you fair notice. You have been trying to provoke me by your insolence. Speaking directly to the jurors already impaneled, he continued angrily, The Attorney General does not care for the condition of these men. He has not contended for right or justice, but to make an exhibition of himself, to pander to the miserable ambition which was the curse of his father. Though the father had brains to temper his wild ambition in some degree, the son has none to temper his, and it breaks out everywhere in puerility and slush. The entire courtroom gasped. John Van Buren addressed the court, his voice cold. The counsel opposed has informed your honor of the cause of my presence here. I shall not stoop to deny his coarse assertions. But allow me to add it is quite out of place for a man who stands here with the contributions of murder and arson in his pockets to criticize me for any cause. You lie, roared Jordan. John Van Buren swung and caught Jordan full on the face. Agile, despite his gray hair and fifty-six years, Jordan lunged back, striking Prince John on the head. His younger opponent tried to ward off the blows, and Dr. Boughton ducked as fists thudded over his body. The courtroom was in a tumult. Officers separated the two men, while Judge Edmonds pounded for order, and then directed that they be confined for twenty-four hours for contempt. Van Buren immediately apologized and asked the court to fine him instead, but Jordan did not. As this offense has happened here in a court of justice, I regret it, Jordan said. I have, however, no whining apology to make, nor any favors to ask except this, that the court will do me the favor to confine us both in the same room. Jordan was sent to the sheriff's parlors and Prince John to the sheriff's office. There the young attorney general, shame vying with anxiety as to the possible effect on his political future, wrote a letter of resignation to Governor Wright. When Judge Edmonds learned of it, he rushed a message urging the governor to ignore that resignation, as he did not see how a man of honor could have done otherwise than resent so gross an insult. Evidence of advancing civilization in America, the British press commented on this altercation. The next morning the crowded courtroom was expectant, but Jordan and Van Buren took their seats without a word. Toward noon, John Van Buren strolled to the bench and spoke quietly to Judge Edmonds. I hope the court slept well last night. 
Yes, the judge answered. The court was not aware of anything to disturb its slumbers. I didn't know that its conscience under the circumstances would permit it. Van Buren then added in a confidential tone, I trust our arrangement to spend Sunday with the old man holds good. Yes, so far as I am concerned, the judge replied. Well, the old man will be right glad to see you now. Judge Edmonds subsequently decided against the weekend junket to Lindenwald. He was afraid that it might be misconstrued. After two vexatious weeks, the jury box was finally filled, and the examination of witnesses brought a new set of spectators. A New York Herald correspondent reported, Judge Edmonds, who is renowned for his courtesy to the fair sex, has generally invited the ladies of this place to attend the trial of the doctor who so terrified them last winter, and we have, in addition to our known bells, the bright-eyed, rosy-cheeked, and languishing Miss W. of Jersey City, the charming and captivating Miss J. of New York, the beautiful and fair-complexioned Miss Mick of Greenport, a few days later, an equally rapturous reporter for the same paper wrote, Our courthouse for the past week has assumed a rather recherché appearance, and the somber walls and cold formality of a criminal court turned into a heaven of sunshine by the smiles and beauty of our pretty women. Oh, for a pen dipped in the golden rays of the setting sun to describe them! It would be wrong to individualize, but to correct the mistake of one of your correspondents, I will state that the bright-eyed, rosy-cheeked, and languishing Miss W. is not from Jersey City, but the interesting and accomplished daughter of General W., and Madame Rumor reports her to be engaged to the Prince of Lindenwald. In this socially festive atmosphere, the trial proceeded. On the whole, the testimony followed that of the first trial. Sheriff Miller, who was the star witness for the state, identified Dr. Boughton as the masked Big Thunder who had taken his papers and burned them at Kopeck. Under cross-examination, he denied uncomfortably that he had boasted of a Livingston offer of $500 for Boughton's arrest. Jordan led him along with reassuringly gentle questions, then suddenly turned on him and roared, "'Didn't you tell the Indians that you were as good an anti-renter as they were?' The sheriff's eyes swept the courtroom and then fell as he denied the accusation. Didn't you promise the Indians that you would never fight them? They were your friends, that they put you in office? Again, Miller denied courting Indian favor. The defense contended that the sheriff had given up his papers willingly, and therefore a charge of highway robbery could not be supported. But Miller swore that he had told Big Thunder that he would not give them up except to prevent violence. While he was telling his story, Sheriff Edmonds interrupted. Were you armed? No, replied the sheriff. You should have been, snapped the judge, and shot the scoundrel dead. Farmers called by Jordan testified that on several occasions Henry Miller had said, I'm as good an anti-renter as you are. Stephen Decker, on whose farm Miller was to have conducted the sale, halted by the Copake Indians, repeated his conversation with the sheriff on the ride to Sweet's Tavern. John Lape, a waiter at the tavern, testified that the sheriff did not pay for his dinner. I told him the natives said they would pay for it, and he said, well. Later the sheriff went upstairs and sent for some brandy. He didn't pay for it. He told me he was a good anti-renter. Elijah Finkel told how the sheriff and Big Thunder had a drink together, and the Calico chief drank to his health. For the prosecution, Colonel Ambrose Root stated positively that Boughton was Big Thunder. Both had the same voice and used the same terms in talking about the manor leases, he said. He added that at the Smoky Hollow meeting he had asked Dr. Boughton why he came armed, the anti-rent leader replied, he said, that he had heard that the sheriff was coming with a posse of Irishmen and ruffians to arrest Big Thunder. In the four months since the first trial, Sheriff Miller had discovered new witnesses. He produced a shoemaker who testified that at Smoky Hollow he had noticed peculiar half-soles on Big Thunder's boots, 
which corresponded to the ones Dr. Boughton wore when arrested. The prosecution put much of its reliance in Abram Carl, a former anti-renter who had fled to Connecticut during the disturbances. Tiring of exile, Carl had returned to give himself up, and also, the anti-renters said, to collect 110 green acres and $500 from the landlord for lying himself out of jail and Dr. Boughton into it. Carl told the jury he had been in the room at Copake when Dr. Boughton put on his big thunder disguise, and he had helped to remove it after the burning of the papers. In fact, said Carl, he had loaned Dr. Boughton his own cap and mask and his brother's calico dress. Ambrose Jordan countered by calling Carl's wife and mother to the stand. His mother explained that, as a child, her boy had been hit in the head with a nine-pin ball and had never been right since. He thinks that one of our horses has an extra joint in all her legs, she testified solemnly, and we can't make him think otherwise. Carl's wife, between sobs, said poor Abe was crazy, and that once he had interrupted the Methodist preacher in the midst of a prayer by jumping up and shouting, Down with the rent! When Abram's wife finished her testimony, the court adjourned for lunch. The anti-rent leaders decided, as they put it with elaborate innocence, that they could not permit Prince John to abuse the women on cross-examination, and so they brought up a team of horses, put Abe's mother and wife in the carriage, and galloped across the Connecticut line, just ahead of the sheriff. Both sides knew that Dr. Boughton was Big Thunder. But to prove it, in a court of law, the prosecution was obliged to perjure witnesses, so the defense countered in kind. They produced a peddler who said he was present at Copake and talking to Dr. Boughton in the tavern at the very moment when Big Thunder was burning the papers, and therefore Dr. Boughton and Big Thunder could not be one and the same. A Negro supported the alibi, testifying that he had helped Big Thunder remove his costume and that the chief was not Dr. Boughton. At this stage, the anti-renters realized that the prosecution had throughout the trial anticipated every move they made. The mystery was later unblushingly clarified by Judge Edmonds in a full report of the trial, a report that was an unparalleled confession of judicial conspiracy. It read, There was at that time in Hudson a journeyman printer, a dissipated chap who had been an orderly sergeant in the uniform company of which I had been captain, and who was warmly attached to me. Early in the trial he came to my lodgings and told me he was determined that I should not be cheated as Judge Parker had been in the former trial, and he had therefore joined the anti-renters and was one of their committee on arrangements for the trial. They met every evening, and about eleven o'clock he would come and tell me all their proceedings. There seems no reason to credit Judge Edmund's statement regarding the printer's concern lest he be cheated. The report suggests rather conclusively that he himself put the espionage proposal to the man. Thanks to his spy, the judge learned many useful facts about the anti-rent witnesses. Why did you say you saw Big Thunder in the tavern? An anti-renter was reported to have asked one of the witnesses. You told me you were going to say you saw him crossing the public square. So I did, but the peddler got him in the house and I couldn't get him out again. Soon after the Negro witness had testified in Boughton's behalf, Judge Edmund issued a warrant for his arrest for perjury. He had been informed, he said, that on the day the Negro claimed he helped Big Thunder unmask, the witness was actually twelve miles from the scene of the riot. The judge dispatched the sheriff with the warrant, but the anti-rent scouts outran him, and by the time the officer reached the Negro's home, yet another witness was out of reach in Connecticut. In his summation on Saturday, September 27th, Ambrose Jordan made one of his ablest speeches. He told the jury that Dr. Boughton was an educated man who was being persecuted because he had thrown his whole heart and feelings into a legitimate crusade. Jordan denied that Boughton had expressed contempt for law and courts, an allegation designed to confuse the issue and prejudice the judge and jury. It was true, he said, that when Boughton was asked why the tenants did not resort to the courts, 
He had used strong language and said that a thousand dollars in this or that lawyer's or judge's pocket would blind justice, but whatever his opinion of the courts, it was not evidence of guilt. Jordan ridiculed Sheriff Miller's pretended terror of big thunder and reminded the jury that the sheriff drank, dined, and jested with the mighty monster of Hydra head and fantastic costume. The sheriff must have been looking for an excuse to yield when he told the Indians, I want you to understand that I will not give up my papers until threatened. This was not the conduct of a man robbed, Jordan said. All the evidence indicated some arrangement between the sheriff and Big Thunder. Miller knew that there would be resistance, yet he went to Copake alone and unarmed, against the advice of his friends. Dr. Boughton had been falsely represented as a foul fiend stirring up innocent men, upon whose head revenge for all the outrages charged to the Indians was to be visited, Jordan said, and the jury was being asked to convict him right or wrong. On this impassioned note, Jordan closed his defense at 6 p.m. Soon after John Van Buren began his summation, the court recessed for the weekend. On Monday, Martin Van Buren arrived to lend his son the prestige of his presence. Older downrent farmers watched with angry suspicion as he entered the courthouse. The poor boy they had helped to the White House, the man who had once deplored landlord domination at the polls. Now the poor man's president had come to smile on a jury in order to help convict the poor man's champion. Radiating charm and brotherly love, the great man took a conspicuous seat in the front of the courtroom. According to the Herald, John Van Buren made an able speech about eight hours long to a house full of the fair and beautiful of our city and neighboring towns, who encouraged the young widower by their smiles and made him brave and eloquent in their presence. All eyes beamed with love and enthusiasm. In his plea to the jury, Van Buren characterized Dr. Boughton as a man without any evidence of good character, and the farmers who took the stand in his defense as utterly worthless and degraded. He described the Negro witness as a monstrous black man, a characterization which some said would make political capital for both Van Buren's in the South. He defended Sheriff Miller's drinking with the Indians by saying, in that situation, surrounded by a band of Negroes and disguised and intoxicated ruffians, I should be very ready to comply with any request they might make. If they wanted me to drink, I would drink. If they wanted me to turn anti-renter, I would do it. He himself had no feeling in the matter, except to see the laws maintained. But anti-rent activity, he said, demands serious attention, because it comes home to your occupation, stains all your relations in life, and is an excitement attended with immense expense, enormous taxes. These very trials alone add heavily to the burdens of taxation and create a necessity for additional courts, judges, all involving great expenditure of money. He had no doubt of Dr. Boughton's guilt, but he felt that the jury had a far deeper interest in that matter. With you, he finally concluded in late afternoon, I will leave the case. Judge Edmonds then charged the jury to be vigilant and firm in bringing the guilty to justice. The tenants, he said, could not look to the legislature to pass laws impairing the obligations of contracts. They should instead rely upon the action of a sound public opinion in bringing about voluntary arrangements between themselves and their landlords. Moreover, no relief of any kind could be expected, he warned, until the base and the guilty were denounced and punished. He wanted the jury to remember that circumstantial evidence was often more reliable than positive evidence. It was eight o'clock that night when he closed and the jury retired to deliberate. Word that the case had gone to the jury brought farm wagons clattering into Hudson, and as the night wore on without a verdict, hope rose among the farmers who clustered about the sputtering whale oil lights in the square. Soon after daybreak, the jury sent a message to Judge Edmonds at his hotel, asking to be discharged. They could not agree. The farmers were jubilant, and Amasa Bailey, Boughton's father-in-law, at once set about arranging bail. 
but Judge Edmonds was determined to convict. He arose, dressed, ate a leisurely breakfast, and then went to the courthouse to tell the jury that he would not discharge them. This case has been twice tried, he said, and the interest of public justice imperatively demands that it should now be finally closed. He did not, however, mean to extort a verdict from their suffering or starve them into agreement. On his way to court he had ordered breakfast for them. You will have your dinner and your supper at the usual hours, he said. Tonight you will have beds. I must insist on your agreeing on a verdict. He soon showed them that he meant what he said. As he reported with some complacency, the jurors looked out the window and saw him mount his horse and ride off, leading another horse with a side saddle on it. I then took a ride of two or three hours, his account continued, accompanied by a lady who was a stranger in those parts. In order to show her the beautiful scenery in the locality, I took her to many by-roads, and thus it happened that when I struck the main road on my return, I met one of the sheriff's officers who told me the jury had agreed upon a verdict more than an hour ago, and the sheriff had sent his officers in all directions to find me. The spectators were silent as the jury filed into the court. We find the defendant guilty as charged, announced the foreman. The news swept over Hudson. Judge Edmonds postponed sentencing until two o'clock in the afternoon, but long before the scheduled hour the courtroom was filled, and a throng of five thousand grim farmers jammed the square. The trial had dragged on for four long weeks, and it was the last day of September. On all sides autumn had hung the day with brilliant colors as though to mock the tenant's defeat. Below Hudson, Mount Merino was a heap of gold. To the west the Catskills rose as bright as the calico dress of Big Thunder. Judge Edmonds went immediately to his hotel and summoned the sentencing court of Columbia County, five judges, the mayor, the recorder, and four aldermen. One of the judges, apparently an anti-rent sympathizer, refused to be a party to the proceedings, but the others were ready to serve. Dr. Boughton had been convicted of robbery, a charge that allowed a wide range of punishments, from a minor sentence to life imprisonment. Judge Edmonds told the court that he favored the maximum, to put an end to the whole disturbance and do away with the necessity of trying any more of the indicted men. Only the mayor of Hudson, a friend of Joseph D. Monell, agreed with the judge, no one of the others was willing to stand for more than a twenty-year imprisonment, and some wanted only a minor sentence. Judge Edmonds reported, After a long discussion, without much appearance of any agreement, the first judge proposed to let me pronounce what judgment I pleased, and to that all agreed. I told them no. The discussion resumed again, and with as little prospect of agreement as ever, when the dinner bell rang. The first judge turned to one of the county judges and said, Come, judge, there's the dinner bell. You go for life and I will. Thus the sentence was fixed. It was the old story, the judge observed, quoting Pope, Wretches must hang that jurymen may dine. When Judge Edmonds returned to the courthouse, he was scarcely able to press through the crowd. He ordered the farmers to let him pass but they would open a passage for only a few feet and then block the way again, damning and abusing him to their heart's content. As Dr. Boughton was led in, Mary Boughton was already in her seat. All eyes were on the man standing before the bench, his blue eyes steady in his white-crowned face. Judge Edmonds began sternly, "'Your offense, in fact, is high treason. Rebellion against your government,' an armed insurrection. Until you came among them, the tenantry of the manor were a quiet, orderly, law-abiding people, yourself suffering none of the evils of tenure of which you complained. A man of education, you well understood your duty to your country. Yet when remonstrated with on the impropriety of your course, you admitted that you knew it to be wrong, yet you avowed your intention to persist in your measures of resistance, because thus alone could you attain your end. 
possessed of a species of popular eloquence, you made your appeals to the interest of the tenants by holding out to them the prospect of exemption from the payment of rent. You thus enlisted in your service several hundred men whom you publicly paraded, armed and disguised. You have been the leader, the active instigator, the principal fomenter of all these disturbances. You have made yourself an example of disorder and violence, and you have caused many erring and misguided men to follow it, to their ruin and to the disturbance of the public peace. The sentence of the court is that you be confined to prison for the term of your natural life. The harshness of the sentence staggered Boughton, and he had to agree with Jordan that it would be useless to appeal, for the governor had the power of appointment over all the judges. As long as Silas Wright occupied the executive chair, the judiciary would reflect his own prejudice. The only course for a man of courage was to try to see in his plight some perspective. By submitting to my fate, Dr. Boughton said resolutely, I will win public opinion to help our cause. The people throughout the state will consider that my trial was an outrage on justice. Once more, word spread up and down the Hudson that thousands of farmers were preparing to sack the jail and carry away their condemned leader. But at midnight, when Dr. Boughton was led up the gangplank of a northbound steamer, heavily ironed and escorted by sixty soldiers, the stars were bright in the clear October sky, and the only sound was the slapping of the restless water against the dock. Mrs. Boughton was allowed to walk as far as the boat with her husband, and there they parted. "'Don't be discouraged,' she whispered, thinking ahead to elections, when the tenants would have their chance to register a torrential protest. "'You will be released in less than two years.' She stood watching as the boat slid into the deep channel and merged like a ghost with the night up the river. There were strength and beauty in Mary Boughton's spirit— which stood her well in this crisis. The hatred of injustice that burned with a white heat in Dr. Boughton had seared her own life. She had adhered to me in all my troubles and vicissitudes of fortune, the doctor summed it up later. It was a hard trial for a woman to see her husband suffer a punishment next to the halter. In the early hours of morning, when the steamer edged into the dock at Albany, Sheriff Miller saw with alarm that the river front was crowded with the stalwart yeomanry of the Helderbergs. He ordered the boat put about in mid-channel, where Dr. Boughton was transferred to a barge and hurried to Troy, seven miles up the river. Troy, too, proved to be full of anti-renters, and the doctor was taken secretly to the jail for a stopover. A few of his Rensselaer County friends were permitted to see him, among them Sheriff Gideon Reynolds, always a tenant partisan. When the time came to lead Dr. Boughton to the train, there were so many farmers outside the jail that Sheriff Miller refused to leave. But Sheriff Reynolds knew his people. Brushing aside all protests, he took Boughton by the arm and walked with him to the street. At the sight of their leader, the crowd was in a ferment of excitement. Their shouts were a welcome, and a threat that seemed to justify Miller's alarms. "'Let's take him!' someone shouted. Hundreds of voices picked up the cry. But when Dr. Boughton raised his hands, in the gesture that had always meant Big Thunder was ready to speak, they all fell silent, waiting. "'I have made up my mind to go peaceably,' he told them. "'It is for the benefit of our cause that I do so.' The farmers were speechless a moment or two, unable to believe him. Then a murmur of assent ran through the crowd, a cheer was raised, and they fell back in good order. Reassured by this demonstration of Dr. Boughton's power over the men, Sheriff Miller joined the prisoner in the street. His appearance was greeted by angry comment that grew to abusive threats and a menacing surge of the crowd. But Dr. Boughton gravely asked his fellow anti-renters not to harm his captor, and Miller was permitted to pass. Some of the doctor's friends were allowed to accompany him as far as Saratoga, but there they took their leave. A reporter for the Whitehall Democrat said Boughton conversed freely on his way through the village, 
insisting that he had acted an honorable part and that he represented 200,000 honorable men. A writer for the Plattsburgh Whig, who rode across Lake Champlain with him, found him a man of good information, possessing talent of the finest order. He passed his jokes and smoked his cigar with as much independence as the greatest gentleman on board, he wrote. Dr. Boughton's courage failed him when he entered the new Clinton prison at Dannemora, and he gave way to tears and deep dejection. He soon learned, however, that he was to be treated more as a political prisoner than as a criminal. He was straightaway placed in charge of the prison hospital, no idle post, since the iron mines and foundries for which the prison had been established earlier in 1845 were full of hazards to the convict laborers, and he was allowed almost as much independence as the prison officials. A measure of the public's interest in the Boughton case is the fact that blackface minstrels, then just coming into popularity, made jokes about it. Why is Judge Edmonds greater than Ben Franklin? Because Franklin bottled lightning, but Judge Edmonds jugged thunder. The press was almost unanimous in its approval of the life term for Dr. Boughton, but the New York Herald correspondent wrote, This is the most extraordinary case I have ever heard of. All whose minds have not been poisoned with prejudice are astonished and angered at the verdict. History furnishes no parallel. Ten witnesses, swearing positively to an alibi, and still the jury convicting the prisoner. What accounts for this strange procedure? Was it evidence? Common sense tells us no. Was it the address of the Attorney General? Those who listened to his remarks cannot attribute it to that. Was it Judge Edmonds's charge? Ah, there's the rub. Did he not tell the jury that circumstantial evidence was more reliable than positive? In Albany, Thomas DeVere reminded the farmers that there never was a great reform but demanded its victim. Let that not deter or appall you, he wrote in the anti-renter. Keep within the bounds of the law, but up and onward. The despotism of the press is complete. Down the river in New York City, the national reformers held a special meeting in Croton Hall to form the Big Thunder Company for the liberation of Dr. Boughton. Alvin Bove, who had been a guest at the doctor's house only a few weeks earlier, was the principal speaker, and Evans's Young America gave a full report of the meeting. Though Boughton was not the father of the anti-rent movement, Bove said, he had been active in promoting the spark. He found an agitation without form and void, and he organized it. He took it up in an enlarged and philanthropic sense. From the first, the landlords determined to make him a victim, and pursued him until at last he wore the chains. The circumstances are more alarming than can be described to those who watch the progress of American tyranny. There was not a doubt but that the whole force of the administration was brought to bear to secure the conviction. Bove commented at considerable length on the trial, the transfer of the judge from New York City to Hudson, the character of the judge, and his extraordinary directions to the triers respecting the qualifications of jurors. He dared not speak all he thought on these points, he said, because he might be prosecuted and persecuted, as Dr. Boughton was. But he felt confident that, taken in connection with recent exposures respecting the corruption of saints in ermine and political intriguers, the sentence of Dr. Boughton would be the means of revolutionizing the state. I am, said he, about to raise a banner which I hope will be carried in daylight and torchlight processions throughout the state by all men of liberty and progress until its object shall be accomplished. Bove then unfolded and suspended in front of the platform a handsome banner on which appeared the words Liberation of Dr. Boughton. It was received by the audience with deafening applause, which continued several minutes. George Evans followed Bove to the platform. No matter what is said of Dr. Boughton, he will rank in history with Lafayette and other great names, he said. Dr. Boughton is a true friend of the people's rights, and whether Big Thunder or not, 
he has committed no sin against morality or the principles of the American Revolution. Evans promised that from that day on, young America would fight for the liberation of Dr. Boughton, and the next issue of the paper carried a line of bold-faced type in its masthead, the slogan raised by Alvin Bove, Liberation of Dr. Boughton. A prophetic political note was struck by John Comerford, a veteran labor leader, first president of the New York City General Trades Union, who told the audience that no stronger evidence than the trial could be adduced to show the need for a new state constitution providing for election of judges. He warned, Under the present circumstances, no poor man is safe who contends for a reform that shall remove the oppressions of the laborer. Officers, even judges, are no longer appointed for their honesty and capability, but to reward political villainy. It is my deliberate opinion that if Dr. Boughton should not be liberated and reform effected, it will be but a short time before there will be anti-rentism in New York. Dr. Boughton has been victimized by the Democratic Party, and no governor can withstand the torrent of public indignation while Dr. Boughton remains in prison. Unmoved by the adverse criticism of the liberal elements and the unmuzzled press, Judge John Worth Edmonds was congratulating himself that he had successfully concluded the Boughton case. Before leaving Hudson, he called up the rest of the anti-rent prisoners and told them he did not propose to try them. I believe enough has been done to answer the ends of justice, he said benevolently, enough to show the mischief and folly of your conduct. With Dr. Boughton out of the way, and the landlord's will faithfully executed, the judge could now salve his own conscience, and perhaps put the released tenants in a better mood for voting the Democratic ticket, and cultivating their land, to pay new rents. He told the prisoners he was as fully aware as they of the injurious effects of the manorial tenures, but that they must look to the law, and the sure will of time, for redress. He continued their bail, and told them that if they showed just appreciation of this forbearance toward them, in a year's time he would advise the Attorney General to discharge them all from further prosecution. End of Section 17 Recording by Maria Casper Section 18 of Tin Horns and Calico by Henry Christman this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 18. Delhi Justice Governor Silas Wright gave his approval to even more flagrant breaches of judicial integrity in Delhi. Word went out from Albany, down with the anti-renters or Cato Falls, and on the slightest pretext tenants were charged with crimes they could not have committed. One Democratic newspaper urged the authorities to let the anti-renters hang. The loss of their lives was of little consequence compared with the public interest at stake. Another suggested that troops proceed in open day and take away anti-rent wives and children to a place of security, drive away their cattle, and destroy their farming implements. It is useless to expect that these men will ever be put down by force of shot and cannonball. One of the grimmest songs of the entire anti-rent movement grew out of the terrorism in Delhi. Written by Forrest Minstrel, and first published in Young America on November 22, 1845, the song gained wide circulation, because it expressed so well the temper of the aroused farmers. Those who wish to seize the store of the injured laboring poor, crush them so they rise no more, haste to Delhi. Ye whose hearts are dark and fell, ye who affidavits sell, Tory lords will pay you well, in old Delhi. Justice, with her blinded sight, might have stumbled on the right, but she's fairly to her flight from old Delhi. Ye who wish to fill your fob, join the law and order mob, you may get a dandy job at old Delhi. It's for this the Delhi folks wear their law and order cloaks, make your courts of law a hoax in old Delhi. You who would your country save, dare to claim what heaven gave, dare the Inquisition brave, fear not Delhi. Nothing fear, your cause is just, 
better days will come, we trust. Tyrants yet will bite the dust in old Delhi. The prisoners who had been seized after the death of Osmond Steele were examined by Justice of the Peace Nathaniel Hathaway, brother of the landlord agent, and then referred to Judge N. K. Wheeler of Delhi, who summoned a grand jury headed by John Edgerton, a near relative of Erastus Edgerton, the incautious deputy who had started the shooting. One of Brisbane's long letters described his hearing, which was held one evening shortly after he and his fellow prisoners had finished singing their evening hymn. I was taken into a room dimly lighted. A number of men were sitting around in it, while in the centre was placed a table. By it sat a man, bald-headed, with one of the most sensual-looking countenances I have ever gazed upon in my life. This man rose slowly from his seat, lifted a little book from the table, and thrust it in my face. I started back and asked where I was, if I was before the grand jury or not. Some of them said I was before the grand jury. I then said that when I took an oath I swore with uplifted hand. During this conversation the bald-headed man had said something and threw the book down again. So whether I was sworn or not I cannot tell you, and whether the book was Robinson Crusoe or the Holy Bible I cannot tell. The principal question that Judge Edgerton asked Brisbane was, Did you hear Steele say he fired or not? The young Scot said that he did. Did he not say, pursued the bald-headed man, that he believed he had fired? No, sir, he said very plainly and distinctly, yes, I fired. You villain, you are the only man out of twenty that has sworn to such an oath. Brisbane said that he had perhaps had the best opportunity of any man there to hear what Steele said, as he had his left arm under the dying man's head at that moment, having just given him a drink. As he turned to leave the room, he remarked, "'Gentlemen, if I have to be punished, it must be for what I have said, not for what I have done.' "'You villain,' the questioner repeated. "'We will let you know what you have said.' Brisbane had spoken more truly than he knew, for he was promptly indicted for the murder of Osmond Steele, on nothing more than the sworn statement of a neighbour, James Glendenning, that Brisbane had declared that Steele would be shot if he went to the Earl Sale. Afterward, Brisbane remembered with some chagrin how friendly he had been with the man one day before the sale. Glendenning had come to him in the hayfield and suggested that he had enough hay down in such bad weather and ought to step over the fence and pick a few berries. Brisbane's account was as follows. I did so. We then rallied each other about our principles, he being uprent and I downrent. As I am naturally pretty free-spoken, and was not dreaming of anything wrong, and likewise being good neighbours, I laughed and jested with him, till one of my girls called to come to dinner. We went and took dinner together, little thinking I was eating with a man who was soon to do his best to bring me to an ignominious death. I never thought seriously of our conversation till he was leaving the house. As he went away, he suddenly turned back as if he had forgotten something. Bill, said he, if you know any Indians that want to buy any lead for balls, I have got a chunk that I melted down from tea chest linings, and I will sell it to them cheaper than they can buy it anywhere else. I told him I did not know of any Indians who wanted to buy any. He then looked disappointed and went away. I then remembered that he had said to me, while sitting on the log, that he had come to cut some broomsticks in my woods but as I had seen no axe, his visit then appeared to me to be rather mysterious. But what I chiefly find fault with Glendenning is that he did not speak the whole truth. Why did he not state that he had offered to sell lead to the Indians, and that I had told him that I knew of no Indians who wanted to buy any? His whole visit, therefore, appears to me to have partaken of the despised character of a spy, and to sit down and eat with an unsuspecting neighbor— how like a Judas! But perhaps the cold and unfeeling character of Glendenning cannot be better depicted than the following little incident portrays it. He one day asked one of my little girls to turn the grindstone for him. The child simply remarked that the stone would not turn for a Tory, upon which he asked her how would she like to see her father hanging by the neck. 
When Dr. Calhoun's turn came, he was subjected to five hours of abusive epithets. Among other things, I was called a liar repeatedly, he reported, and to crown it all, I was honored with the appellation of being a damned little positive paddy. Calhoun at first thought an uncommon share of attention was being showered upon him, but a young lady called as a witness informed him that these epithets and many more were also tendered to her. Others were shamefully abused. Daniel Squires returned to the shelf in his cell and recorded in his diary, I was taken before the grand jury who reported what I swore to being different from what I actually swore to being also untrue. Squires, too, was indicted for the murder of Steele, although he was at that time many miles away from the Moses Earl farm. In all, more than two hundred were indicted, nearly one hundred specifically for murdering Steele. The grand jury was still handing down indictments, and state troops were still bringing in anti-renters when Circuit Judge Amasa J. Parker arrived in Delhi to conduct the trial. Because Judge Parker had favored the tenants' objectives during Silas Wright's 1844 campaign, and had handled Dr. Boughton's first trial with less partiality than Judge Edmonds had shown in the second, the anti-renters were inclined to forget that he was a political friend of Wright, and a nephew of the Colonel Parker who had berated Brisbane for his influence with the tenants, and that he had yielded to pressure in sidestepping the issue of bail for Dr. Boughton. Having previously elected him to the Assembly and to Congress, the farmers still respected him for soundness of mind, purity of intentions, and permanency of opinion. On September 22, 1845, when he addressed the jury, the farmers found their confidence in him had been misplaced. Judge Parker's words were bitter. Conforming to current Democratic policy, he went beyond the immediate issue of the Dingle Hill riot to attack the whole anti-rent organization. Only a year ago, he said, he had found the county flourishing even under the leasehold system, and no county had gone forward more rapidly in the acquisition of wealth and social happiness. He deplored that now, although heaven has contributed the blessings of labor upon the husbandmen, the crops had gone unharvested, and the husbandmen had been led to crime by lecturers from abroad. He praised the promptness with which people had come forward to enforce the law after the death of Steele, he found it gratifying that the press generally had been on the side of government, of law and order. But, said he, since the press was a powerful engine for good or evil, it was the jury's duty to indict any paper in which they discovered any evidence of licentiousness, of publications not true, incendiary and inflammatory in their character, and intended to stir up sedition. Judge Parker reviewed the history of the anti-rent agitation, and concluded that it was as necessary to the tenant as to the landowner that titles which had been held for a long time should not be disturbed. Vested rights could not be infringed on, and the issue could be settled only by compromise, by purchase, or by arrangement. Giving the prisoners no hope of clemency, he addressed the jury as men he had known for years, and told them it could not be expected that the sympathy of an honest community would be extended to those who had violated the laws and arrayed themselves against the very government under which they lived. The first of the Delhi prisoners to face trial was John Van Steenberg of Bryant Hollow, who had been at the Earl Sale in disguise. Only twenty-one, though he already had a rugged growth of whiskers, he was an uneducated product of leasehold privation, but honest and hard-working. In joining the Indians, he had merely followed the lead of his lively neighbor, Edward O'Connor. John Steele, a brother of the slain man and district attorney of Otsego County, was brought on to assist the prosecution. It was well known that he welcomed a chance to avenge his brother's death. Van Steenberg's counsel struggled to get a fair trial, even going so far as to call in Stanley Grimes, a celebrated phrenologist, to help pick the jurors by examining their faces and the bumps on their craniums. But the choice was considerably narrowed by the fact that Judge Parker, like his old teacher Judge Edmonds, ruled out anyone who had any interest in leased land. 
In the end, with the exception of one known uprenter from Delhi, the jurors were all drawn from unaffected towns which had supported law and order meetings and furnished men for Judge Moore's posse. Reporters wrote confidently to their papers that the jury would convict, which, said one, was as it should be. Thomas DeVere sent a bitter message to Governor Wright, protesting that the judge's ruling on jurors' qualifications amounted to a denial of elementary justice, as it was made at a time when it was admitted that there was no neutrality in the county, every man having in the rush of excitement taken sides, strongly, decidedly, if not with the anti-renters, then against them. He charged that two jurors had publicly revealed their prejudice. If those two men had expressed themselves as prepossessed in favor of the prisoners, as they did prejudice against them, think you they would have been suffered to go on the jury? And if this be so, and a knowledge of the fact goes abroad among the people, will it not tend to bring the administration of law into contempt? Silas Wright should reflect, Devere warned, Ask yourself, are you quite sure, are there no misgivings in your mind, but that those unfortunate prisoners will get an impartial trial? If you can answer this question to the satisfaction of your own heart, go to bed and repose in quietness. But if there is a doubt in your mind that intemperance has existed in Delaware County ever since the unhappy death of Steele, if you think it probable that the intemperance should get into the jury box, that wrong may be done to the prisoners, then you ought to take some measure to prevent that wrong. The world will remember, and what is worse, your own conscience will remember, that this wrong was done to citizens in jeopardy of their lives, whilst Silas Wright was governor. If Wright was at all moved by this communication, he gave no sign, and the trial proceeded without interference. The prosecution's chief witnesses were backsliding anti-renters. Daniel Northrup, a torpid, sluggish-looking person, who was also under indictment, testified that on leaving the sale he had remarked to John Van Steenberg that the death of Steele was an awful thing. John made no immediate reply, he said, but put his finger on the mouth of his rifle, tapped it several times, and observed death was just what Steele deserved. Defense counsel attacked Northrup as notorious in all this anti-rent war, an informant, a confessed murderer, swearing to hang others to save himself. But the prosecution produced another turncoat, who said that after the first volley at the riot, he had heard Van Steenberg ask for a small ramrod to reload his rifle. As in Hudson, the trial had an incongruous social aspect. On the final day, reported the Herald correspondent, the courtroom door opened, and a brilliant array of beauty, grace, and loveliness entered the hall where justice sat enthroned in Her Majesty. Old Delaware's fairest daughters, with hearts full of sympathy and affection, had congregated in her courthouse to witness the trial of one of her sons. The hitherto downcast face of the prisoner seemed to brighten with hope, as he gasped in astonishment at this sudden display of loveliness. The handsome features of the presiding judge were wreathed with smiles as each blossoming hebe and simple maid of nature took her seat. Under the eyes of these bells of Delhi, Judge Parker performed a remarkable feat. His charge to the jury presented them with a chain of selective reasoning that doomed Van Steenberg in advance, and left the jurors so dazed as to be practically incapable of an honest decision. He reasoned that any man, armed and disguised at the sale, was liable to a year in prison under Silas Wright's anti-disguise law. The law defined this offense as a misdemeanor, but under existing statutes, any crime punishable by imprisonment in a state prison was a felony, and any death resulting from the commission of a felony was murder. All 250 Indians present at the sale were therefore guilty of murder. The jury had only one task, the judge explained, and that was to decide whether John Van Steenberg had been at the sale armed and disguised. Mercy has nothing to do with the jury box, he said. After being out all night, the jury returned to the courtroom to ask Judge Parker whether a person being at the Earl's sale, disguised and armed, but not having fired, was guilty of a felony. 
That was the law, the judge reiterated. John Van Steenberg was therefore convicted of murder. But even this uprent jury felt that there was some miscarriage of justice, for they immediately appealed to Governor Wright. The undersigned members of the jury of John Van Steenberg, convicted as one of the murderers of Osmond N. Steele, do respectfully recommend him as a fit subject for your clemency. Although this petition was signed by all twelve, the governor did not reply. The prosecutors may have felt some misgivings, for the next case was handled differently. The defendant was William Brisbane. I was taken from my cell, he wrote, and brought before the American Jeffreys, Judge Parker. This was at 9 a.m., and the judge ordered him to be ready to go on trial at 2 p.m. Thus, observed Brisbane, five hours was allowed me to subpoena my witnesses and prepare for trial. The Herald reporter noted Brisbane's appearance as he received the order. This is the noblest Roman of them all. He looked indeed the hero, erect, proud, and undaunted, his eyes flashed with indignation like an imprisoned eagle's. When the court asked if he had counsel, he drew himself up proudly to his full height, looked the judge boldly and sternly in the face, and with firm tone and a broad Scotch accent inquired, how am I to obtain counsel or anything else while cooped up in yonder jail? Before afternoon, however, Brisbane succeeded in retaining Samuel Gordon and Colonel Parker, the judge's uncle. In the meantime, Judge Parker had called together the counsel for both sides and reminded them that nearly one hundred men were under indictment for murder. If they were convicted, all would be hanged. He did not wish to hang so many men, he said. All the sympathies of our nature revolt at the idea of wholesale slaughter. Inasmuch as the law did not require a full example to be made of all indicted for murder, he was ready to receive pleas of guilty to manslaughter. He asked the authorities to put an end to further arrests, and urged the counsel for the prisoners to plead them guilty. Such a compromise would save the farmers from death, he explained, and save the state from extended time and expense. So it happened that when Brisbane was summoned at two o'clock, his attorneys took him not to the courtroom for trial, but into one of the jury rooms, where they told him they had had a conversation with the judge, who would accept a plea of guilty for manslaughter. Otherwise he would be tried for murder and surely be hanged. Gentlemen, said Brisbane, I am guilty of neither. We believe that, said his lawyers. But, Samuel Gordon added, the state could prove that you addressed the Indians and that you helped to disguise them. These things are false, the Scot insisted, and I can prove them false. Brisbane, said Gordon, it is no use what you can prove. It will not be believed. What is the punishment for manslaughter? Four years the least, seven the most. Brisbane wrote of a moment's indecision. I then began to calculate what age I would be at the end of my imprisonment. I thought I might still be of some benefit to my family, but to describe my thoughts and feelings as they rushed through my mind and heart is impossible. Be quick, said Gordon, the court's awaiting you, you may lose the favorable moment. Gentlemen, I am in your hands, Brisbane said, so do what seems best to you. They entered his plea of guilty to manslaughter, and a trial was averted. At this stage, triumphant from his conviction of Dr. Boughton in Hudson, John Van Buren arrived in Delhi. He insisted on trying old Moses Earl himself, and at once. He had tasted blood, commented the freeholder, and his appetite was whetted for more. He was eager to pounce upon the victims whom the Delhi hunters had caught and caged for him. Perhaps, too, he remembered that it was a murder trial in Delhi in 1819 that had raised his father to political eminence. Wrath against Earl had not abated. Van Buren was sure he could convict him of murder. But Judge Parker agreed with Mitchell Sanford, chief of the anti-rent council, that at most the aged farmer's only guilt was that he had fed the Indians in the woods, refused to pay rent, and told the landlord's agent he would have to fight for it. The most that Judge Parker could make out of it was a misdemeanor. But Van Buren would not give in. 
his insistence that conviction was assured, persuaded Sanford to enter a hasty plea of guilty to manslaughter. When the lawyer was criticized by many anti-renters, he told them he was forced to do it to save Earl's life. To the court, however, he expressed himself with courage and vigor. I warn the landlords, he said, that unless they yield to these men their just and equal rights in the spirit of conciliation, kindness, and forbearance, there will come down upon them from these hardy men who have cultivated and subdued these harder hills a storm of indignation that will sweep them away forever. If they will sow dragon's teeth, let them expect to reap a harvest of armed men. Must we forego the sympathies of our nature and forget that we are men? I must confess that my sympathies have been strongly excited by the scenes I have witnessed since I came to this place, and I would despise myself if I could go to yonder pens and see two hundred wretched men whose lives are sought by an excited population, the voice of pity I have not heard, but only the language of denunciation and vengeance. Yes, I would despise myself if I did not sympathize with and pity the aged and widowed mothers of some of these prisoners, who have come twenty miles on foot, without a shilling to pay their expenses, to see their sons in jail awaiting their trial. In a public statement, he went even further in his bitter denunciation of the Delhi court. I begin to distrust the justice of my country. Fearful indeed are the doings of a mob, but more fearful the administration of criminal justice in the midst of passion, prejudice, and excitement. I had rather risk the mob. The next day the Albany Argus reported, Moses Earl has made his will, does not expect to receive much leniency, and ought not to. As Edward O'Connor awaited his turn, he watched his friends, one after another, buckle before the ruthless legalized injustice. Hot Irish blood coursed through his veins, and he could not be induced to make a confession of convenience, although he realized the court and the prosecution were united in political intrigue to break the ranks of the anti-renters. He was told that if he did not plead guilty, he was fit to die, and officials would gladly wade in his blood. Nevertheless, O'Connor insisted upon a trial. The court kept him waiting until the last, probably hoping he would change his mind, but he stood firm. At length, early in October, he got his chance, and the trial was a farce. Judge Parker repeated the legalistic jingo that had convicted John Van Steenburg. Again the jury convicted, and again they appealed to Governor Wright in a petition which read in part, The proof was clear and positive that he was not one of those who shot. The court charged the jury that all the disguised and armed persons, numbering some 240, who were on the grounds, were engaged in a felony, and were therefore guilty of murder, and upon that charge we found the prisoner guilty. There was nothing in the evidence to warrant the belief that he had anticipated, encouraged, or approbated the firing on or killing of Steele or anyone else. His character from his youth up was proven to have been good. The evidence that he was among the disguised persons was not positive. Again, there was no immediate reply from the governor. Edward O'Connor's conviction cleared the court calendar. The American Jeffreys had set a record. Nearly 250 cases had been disposed of in three weeks. On Saturday, October 11, 1845, he called them up for sentence, one by one. It was a dismal day. All nature seemed to be in mourning, wrote Brisbane. The wind sighed mournfully as it swept the trees, the yellow leaves trembled and fell to the ground, the rain fell in torrents, yes, the very heavens seemed to weep over our misfortunes. Judge Parker proved as inclement as the weather. Young John Van Steenberg came first, and the judge did nothing to temper the shock. The court entertains no doubt of your guilt, he said. You have but a short time to live. It is not necessary now to admonish you of your relation to your awful situation. There are others who will see that you have every opportunity to prepare for your final end. It is the judgment of the court that you be taken hence to the place from whence you came, 
and that on the twenty-ninth day of November you be taken to a place of execution and hung until you are dead. The next was Edward O'Connor, who stood tall and proud before the bench. I have known your family for many years, the judge told him. You are a young man of more intelligence than Van Steenberg. You are young and possessed of abilities, and you have respectable connections. You are therefore less excusable. You are to be cut off in early life, from friends, from kindred, from the world. You have but a few days to live. It is your duty to improve the time and prepare for your death. An awful change awaits you, and we trust you will take advantage of the means in your power to prepare for that change. O'Connor heard the sentence without flinching. Then he turned and looked out over the packed courtroom. Remember, my friends, he said quietly and proudly, I die an innocent man. His eyes were clear and his voice firm, but tears stood in the eyes of the spectators. Then it was Moses Earle's turn. He looked more than his sixty-four years, and was near the end of endurance as he appealed to Judge Parker for mercy. "'I hope your judge will consider me, and do me all the good you can,' he said in a quiet, tired voice, "'and I hope that God in heaven will reward you for it. I hope you will try to get me a pardon that I may return to my companion. I am an old man.' Judge Parker was unmoved. He knew Moses Earle was not guilty of murder, he had said as much to John Van Buren, but there was still the charge of manslaughter, for which the maximum sentence could be invoked. "'It was the course taken by you that led to the death of Steele,' he sternly told the weary old man. "'We must sentence you to state prison for life. You will therefore be cut off from your family and from society, and the public will hereafter be secured from the presence of one who is guilty of so high a crime. William Brisbane came in for a full share of censure because he was a foreigner. Your whole life could not atone for the injury and injustice you have done to society, Judge Parker declared. Though he gave the young Scot the comparatively mild sentence of seven years in prison, tears rolled down Brisbane's cheeks. He had come to America in search of freedom, but had found it a crime to attack great political power and the wealth that fed it. "'Not that I feel shame for the country that gave me birth,' he said in a letter to Joseph Hogue. "'No, while the pages of history are adorned with the names of a Wallace, a Burns, and a Scott, I will ever feel proud of my Scottish birth. But it is hard that my foreign birth should militate against me.' Political motives were at no time clearer than when the judge sentenced Daniel W. Squires. The young Roxbury farmer had not been at the Earl sale, and the previous June the sheriff had not been able to get a grand jury to indict him for being an Indian. Now he stood indicted for the murder of Osmond Steele, in spite of the fact that his lawyers had entered a plea of guilty against my will. There is little doubt that your exertions have contributed in a great degree to the murder of Steele, Judge Parker told him. You were a mover and originator of the rebellion, and though not legally guilty, you are morally so, and the violated laws require that you should be punished with severity. Society will be no more disturbed by your machinations. Life imprisonment was his sentence. The American Jeffrey's record stood... O'Connor and Van Steenberg sentenced to be hanged, Moses Earl, Daniel W. Squires, Daniel Northrup, and Zara Preston sentenced to life imprisonment, Calvin Madison, ten years, William Brisbane, John Phoenix, Isaac Burhans, John Birch, William Reside, John Latham, and Charles McCumber, seven years each, William K. Jocelyn, two years, Fifty-one others paid fines ranging from twenty-five to five hundred dollars, or received suspended sentences. The remaining prisoners were released with an admonition to cease their illegal resistance. Moses Earle's neighbor, Justice of the Peace Richard Morse, was never tried on the conspiracy indictment. At the time of his arrest, the New York Herald reporter had commented, Nothing is more clear than his connection with the whole escapades of the Indians, and yet I would not hesitate to say that he is so acute, so cunning, and so cool that he will baffle the whole of his prosecutors and get off with flying colors. 
On Morse's own motion, his trial was put off to another term, and then the case was dropped. The New York Herald, with extraordinary obtuseness, spoke of Judge Parker's merciful and manly course in urging Moses Earle and the others to plead guilty. He has done more by this one act to restore peace, quiet, and order to the county than all the bayonets this side of Texas. These signs of mercy will have good effect, and are the best evidence to the anti-renters that the administration of law has no desire to oppress or wrong them. The anti-rent press attacked Judge Parker's conduct of the trials furiously, and condemned the political press for its support of him. There is nothing to equal it in this country since the hanging of witches in New England, declared George Evans in Young America. Never, he said, should the wage-earner forget that the newspapers, especially the Herald and the Sun, had the bloodthirsty audacity to approve of the sentences. These base panderers to the money-god have pretended that the sentences would have the effect to quell the anti-rent excitement. Inordinate stupidity. Working men, behold the tender mercies of patroon law and landlord judges, and say how long you will groan under despotism before you will use the bloodless but effectual weapon of the ballot to redeem yourself. Horace Greeley, who had never before asked a governor to commute a sentence, now appealed to Silas Wright to save Edward O'Connor and John Van Steenburg. It was not until O'Connor returned to his cell to await death that his bold spirit faltered. Through a small hole in the partition between their cells, William Brisbane watched the young man. He paced his cell with a slow and measured step, his eyes fixed steadily upon the floor, his lips compressed, and every little while a sort of quiver or tremulous motion would play over them. His whole soul seemed to be torn with intense agony. At length Brisbane spoke to him. "'Aren't you in your heart cursing the principles for which you're about to die?' "'No,' said O'Connor thoughtfully. "'Brisbane, I will die true to my principles. It is not for myself that I mourn, but for her who is dearer to me than life.' As the young man thought of his dear Janet Scott, his bosom seemed to heave and swell almost to the bursting with extreme emotion. At length he gave vent to his feelings in a flood of tears. After this he talked with firmness about his approaching fate. Nay, he even jested with some of the other prisoners with regard to their sentences, and with Northrop in particular. Northrop was mourning sadly about his hard fate, being sentenced for life. O'Connor playfully asked him if he would trade, and even went so far as to offer to trade even. Northrop gave such a hilarious shake of the head that we all burst out laughing. Brisbane had a heartening visit from his counsel, Colonel Parker, who came to his cell and said, "'Brisbane, the way you were represented to us when you came here, we took you to be an incarnate devil, but since we have become acquainted we find you to be a man of very different stamp.' I did my best to get you home with the bill upon your head, but said they, Parker, if you attempt anything like that, by God we will lynch you. The reply I made was lynch and be damned. Needless to say, however, Brisbane was not released on bail, and the colonel ran no risk. When Daniel Squires returned to his cell after the sentencing, he wrote a farewell letter to his wife. I have been out and heard my sentence from the earthly judge, who, after talking to me about my crimes, said that I must remain in prison all the days of my natural life, which deprives me of all my friends and connections forever. But as long as there is life, there is hope. I expected that when I heard my sentence it would affect me, but it did not. Although some people and the law have called me guilty, still I feel a clear conscience. Therefore I bear my burden with as much fortitude as possible." I wish you to make yourself as comfortable as you can under your circumstances. I am in good spirits, although it looks like a great thing for a man as young as I am to be sentenced off for life. But yet I cannot but think, if I behave myself, I shall see my family. Mr. Gould of Roxbury, J. Gould's father, told me today, if I acted well, he thought I would see my family again. You must keep up good courage, and not give way to natural affections too much. 
"'Be careful, and do not mourn for me. I am better off than you are, for I have got someone to take care of me, but you have to take care of yourself and the children. And remember that you are not forgotten by me. I remain your affectionate husband, my mother's dutiful son, and my children's fond father until death. With this letter, Squires sent a brief journal of his days in Delhi jail, and a poem for his wife to keep as a memorial. Farewell, we part to meet no more, our fates will have it so. The dream of fondest bliss is o'er, to distant lands I go. I go to solitude and thought, a slave to landlord's power. But faith and hope is my support, each passing solemn hour. Ah, cruel fate, it wounds my heart. Ah, cruel tyranny. I grieve from cherished friends to part, but mostly love for thee. Alas, alas, when hopes depart and all our prospects die, all that can cheer the mournful heart consists in memory. And you, perchance, may think upon affection's passioned spell, and sometimes, too, of him who now murmurs his last farewell. The next day was Sunday, a melancholy day, and trying to our feelings, for many friends came for farewells. So touching and trying were the scenes, wrote Brisbane, that I was glad when the shades of evening proclaimed the day at an end. On the following morning the thirteen prisoners started for Clinton Prison in the Adirondacks, leaving O'Connor and Van Steenberg behind to await the gallows. William Brisbane described the trip in two letters, one to a friend in Andes and the other to the schoolmaster Joseph Hoag. A confused noise of hurried footsteps mingled with the clanking of chains or shackles burst upon our ears. Clank went the bolts and in came Sheriff Moore, accompanied by a body of men with evident disappointment in their looks. They had expected ropes instead of shackles. In a few moments we were all shackled, two and two. I took an affecting leave of O'Connor, struggled into our wagon, and off we started for Clinton Prison. As we passed the crowd, Peter Wright stepped forward and shook hands with me, and told me he did not think I was very guilty. I was struck with the warmth and generous sympathy that the people manifested towards us as we passed along. As the party wound slowly down the east wall of the mountain to Catskill in Greene County, Brisbane's mind was filled with tender and trying memories. Six years ago I was left in this little place by the rest of the Scottish families that came over with me, a stranger in a foreign land, a penniless and homeless wanderer. My heart began to swell as the recollections of those days crowded upon my memory. At last my eyes fell upon a little sheltered spot upon the creek side, where my wife and I used to visit on a Sunday to talk about our misfortunes. I thought I should see my wife, my children, there, but I looked in vain. The scene was a blank, and I was a shackled prisoner. I buried my face in the folds of my coat and wept as I remembered the past. I thought upon the present and trembled for the future. Streets and windows in Catskill were crowded. Many women wept. One of them, seized with a kind of frenzy, clapped her hands and cried, "'Down with the rent! Down with the rent!' Brisbane confessed that her words affected him very much like the sound of a musical instrument sadly out of tune. These were the fatal words, and the words fell heavily and dull upon my ears. They were my funeral dirge to a living tomb. Yet, he observed, the scene was as strangely ridiculous as it was solemn. The posse formed into a hollow square with us terrible anti-renters in the centre, while one solitary trumpeter rode at our head, playing that beautiful and patriotic air, old Dan Tucker. If ever there was a burlesque upon a Roman triumph, this was one. They spent the night in Catskill, and the next morning boarded a steamer for Albany. As we moved from the shore, I observed a young Scotchman among the crowd, who had visited me the night before, waving a handkerchief as a token of farewell. When we came into Albany, the steamboat was literally covered with people, all striving to get a sight of the anti-renters. It was curious to hear the remarks of the people as they turned away after getting a sight of us. Why, they're pretty decent-looking farmers. They ain't much like Indians. 
I don't see any hard-looking colts among them. A boy screamed out, I say, what is an anti-renter? Here they docked, and the sheriff went away to return presently with a man whom Brisbane described as one of the most Judas Iscariot-looking customers I ever saw. Sheriff Moore singled out Moses Earl as the victim, and the newcomer showered him with abuse. During the harangue, wrote Brisbane, he said he had some sympathy for the rest of us. Good God, I thought, I am come low indeed when my situation demands such a ruffian's sympathy. If there had been a Billingsgate College in Albany, I could almost have sworn he was its professor. Old Mr. Earle sat and stared into his professor's face like one bewildered. The prisoners were finally taken to the Albany jail, where there was another rush of visitors. Brisbane and his comrade in shackles sat down upon their cell floor and sang My Native Caledonia, upon which a fellow at the door growled, You're a happy soul. And you must be a miserable soul, retorted Brisbane, to make yourself miserable because you see your fellow man happy. By this time they were getting hungry, having breakfasted early that morning before they left Catskill. A man who was brought up and introduced as the sheriff told them they would get something to eat presently. About an hour afterwards a colored man came along with a basin in each hand. He opened the door a little, apparently with a kind of tremulous fear, and pitched two pieces of something out of each basin into the cell. I picked up two pieces of my share, one of them I made out to be some affinity of bread. The other baffled my skill to find out its nature. I handed it to my companion and asked if it was beef or Honduras mahogany. I tried it with my teeth, but could make no impression upon it. I then tried it upon my knife, but it was still no go, so I gave it up in despair, and called it rather hard feed. Our waiter came at length with our water, but such water! It was as red and muddy as our brooks in a spring freshet. Would to God it had been as sweet! To our palate it tasted like Epsom salts mixed with wormwood. All the furniture in our cell was a couple of coarse blankets, two bricks, and a basin. I could see use for everything except the bricks. Whether they were left for the purpose of some life-sick prisoner to knock out his brains I cannot tell, but seeing that they were there I thought I would turn them to some useful purpose. So I gave one to my comrade and kept one myself, and we used them as pillows. Sometime in the night we were waked up by some persons at our cell door with a lantern. They asked, tauntingly, what we were guilty of, then finally gave us some abusive language and left. They were respectably dressed men. How it comes I cannot tell you, but my mind was strongly impressed with the idea that Governor Wright was one of them. I mentioned this to Sheriff Moore the next day, but he gave me no answer. The night, but such a night, passed, and the anti-renters were given their breakfast coffee in their wash-basins. The coffee was so execrable we could not drink it, Brisbane commented. That morning the prisoners were smuggled through the back streets toward Troy. Some time later they arrived at Whitehall, Washington County, where they were permitted to write letters, to be delivered by Sheriff Moore, who virtually dictated the contents by warning the men that their only hope for freedom lay in using their influence to stop anti-rent activity. People universally tell us that if the anti-renters keep within the law, Brisbane wrote in one of his letters, and show an honest determination to maintain the law, that a pardon may ultimately be obtained. Now I hope you will exercise both your judgment and your influence with the people. He urged that the terms up-rent and down-rent be forever buried, and the old and united name of the people applied instead of the factious name of up-and-down-renter. Daniel Squires wrote a similar letter. I think the better way will be for you to hold meetings and dissolve all your associations that have had any connections with the Indians, he said. People think generally that if such should take place there will be something done for us. Weary and jaded after wearing chains for a week, the anti-renters reached Clinton Prison on Saturday. The shackles were struck from their limbs, rather in an unceremonious manner, Brisbane remarked, 
the head keeper never stopped to inquire whether our legs or shackles were iron, for he hammered away as if both were of the same material. We then put on our striped dress of degradation. We were shown to our bedroom. It was a long, narrow building with a row of beds, rather like kennels, on each side of it, with an alley up the center. On each side of the alley ran an immense chain which extended the whole length of the hall. To these chains were attached smaller ones with a shackle at the end of them. These shackles were most ardently attached to the legs. I thought it one of the hardest sights I had yet seen to see about two hundred human beings chained to their beds. They soon found that life in Clinton prison was scarcely the solitude and thought that Daniel Squires had expected. It consisted of hard, unending labor, laying walls, digging excavations, and mining iron. The rugged mountains surrounding the prison reminded Brisbane of his native Scotland, so beautiful indeed that even my scathed and burning heart would sometimes bound with joy as I listened to the eloquent voice of nature. He described one autumn morning in Danamora as follows. The sun was scarcely risen, and the teams had not yet arrived to begin the labors of the day. I turned my eyes toward the south, and that I often did, for there lay the magnet that drew my heart. Lake Champlain lay stretched out before me. I thought that I could discern the faint flicker of a sail skimmering on its peaceful bosom in the grayness of the morning. It resembled one of Ossian's ghosts, which he described as floating on the gray mists of the hills. Yes, there lay that beautiful lake, and as the rosy fingers of morn began to play over its glassy surface, in my moment of rapture I compared her to a beautiful and blushing bride locked in the arms of her husband. The lazy clouds hung heavy upon the mountain tops, while toward the east the land sunk toward a hollow, while the clouds above it were tinged with a gorgeous drapery that I cannot describe. The gap in the mountain seemed as if Aurora had burst through the clouds, and gracefully folded up the drapery of night, and thus made a triumphal gateway for the glorious god of day to pass. The vision of Mirza that I used to read with so much pleasure at school came vividly to my recollections, and like Mirza I felt my heart chastened and my mind elevated by the enchanting scene before me. But I was soon roused from this moralizing. Brisbane, your carts are awaiting you. The curtain fell on this fancy panorama. As I turned away from it, my eye fell on the grated windows of my prison, and finally rested on my striped dress of degradation. Prison work had its dangers. Daniel Northrup was caught in a slide and seriously injured, and had it not been for Dr. Boughton's skill, he would hardly have recovered. Even in prison, the anti-renters looked to the doctor as their leader, and he was always ready to stand by them. Once Brisbane was ordered to work on one of the high walls of a new building. He told the guard it would be unsafe, because he was subject to dizziness even at small heights. But the officer drove him off in the most insulting tones. Brisbane protested angrily at such tyranny. When I cooled down a little, he wrote of the incident, I saw my danger, but I was not coolly to submit to be flogged. That was an indignity I was determined not to submit to. So I went down to the hospital, told Dr. Boughton what I had said and my fears. Well, said Boughton, if they punish one, they will have us all to punish. But on the whole, they were model prisoners. Early in November, the newspapers reported that the anti-renters at Clinton Prison deport themselves with great propriety and are very orderly and quiet. In Delhi jail, Edward O'Connor and John Van Steenberg nursed their courage as the day of execution crowded upon them. John was bewildered and introspective, but Edward was somewhat bolstered by the sense of being part of a heroic struggle, and by his resolution to go to the gallows true to his principles. Still mourning for Janet Scott, who is dearer to me than life, he wrote some verses, which commenced in an apostrophe to freedom, still my chief delight, and ended as a love-song with the following verse. In midnight dreams and morning's prayers, she's always present, always there, first earthly great desire. 
her beauteous form and humble mien so rarely found so rarely seen lights all my soul with fire when edward's twenty-sixth birthday arrived on october seventeenth he celebrated it by writing what he planned as his farewell to the world sore sore is my heart when i think of the night so dark and so lonely so gloomy the sight but little i thought i should never see more my fond my sweet janet the girl i adore so fondly i pressed her soft bosom to mine i loved her so dearly she was almost divine but when we parted what prophet could tell I was bidding my fair one for ever farewell? What tongue or what pen can my feelings express to think of my loved one in keenest distress? My blood rushes through me and makes my heart swell to write my fond one farewell, O oh farewell. O oh well I remember the simple fond strain. When we parted, she asked, When shall we meet again? Our tears intermingled, and swiftly they fell. But, oh, we were taking our final farewell. O oh, Father in heaven, it is my desire, and ever shall be my humblest prayer, that thou mayst protect her, our parents as well. I send her my fondest, my lasting farewell. At the end of the verses, Edward made an advance notation, presented to my friends to preserve as a memorial for him who died in his country's cause november twenty ninth eighteen forty five aged twenty six on seventeenth october eighteen forty five freedom's willing son bleeds free though scourged and slain for liberty edward o'connor end of section eighteen recording by maria casper Section 19 of Tin Horns and Calico by Henry Christman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 19. November Ides. The letters from Brisbane and Squires, which had been delivered by Sheriff Moore, did have some effect on the rest of the anti-renters. Throughout the manor counties, Indian disguises became a thing of the past. Bright calico costumes were hemmed into dresses, window curtains, and bed quilts, and masks were burned or buried. On the slope of Old Clump above Roxbury, where young John Burroughs was to uncover it two years later, someone buried under a stone pile a hideous mask of stained leather with horns on the forehead and coarse animal hair glued on for a scalp lock. The most revolutionary anti-renter had always realized that feudalism could not be defeated on the field of battle. Only the ballot could destroy that unholy alliance of wealth and government. Nevertheless, in the tenant's darkest hour, the Calico army had proved its worth. The Indians had kept the landlord's agents and the sheriff at bay until the movement could grow into a political force until it could stand the loss of its leaders without the slightest thought of retreat. Had not the Indians protected the livestock and the tools of the anti-renters from forced sales, anti-rentism would have been choked off in infancy in the ravines of the Helderbergs where it was cradled. Deprived of their means of livelihood, a few farmers would have been cuffed into submission, and dissuasion of the rest would have followed. The Indian riots also had focused national and even international attention on the existence of semi-feudal leases in the New World. Although the first impulsive resentment over the riots cost anti-rentism half of all the popular sympathy it might have gained from the public, the unjust enemy reprisals, vigilantism, wholesale arrests, corruption of the courts, and subversion of the state constitution to party interests brought about a popular revulsion. Silas Wright had sent the sheriffs to unmask the Indians, and in the end had himself been unmasked. The real issues emerged from the fabric of lies. Elements long critical of anti-rentism began to reevaluate the principles at stake. A missionary sent by the Presbyterian Church of Delaware County to work among the anti-rent barbarians made the following report after a thorough study. 
I have found, to my very agreeable surprise, among the anti-renters, much the most intelligence, the most piety, and by far the most hospitality, and since I have become acquainted with the merits of their cause, I believe it to be just, and they have my sympathy. The Lutheran Herald, organ of another conservative group, deplored that in this boasted republic an extensive system of land ownership should be tolerated at war with the genius of our government, the character of our institutions, and the best interests of our society. The Fourierists, who had been alienated by the tenants' lawless invasion of the rights of property, now asked in the editorial columns of the Harbinger, what shall we say of the growing dissatisfaction with these, so to say, feudal tenures? Is no account to be taken of it? Is it to be smothered by the strong hand as coming solely from the great enemy? This is impossible. Our agrarian friends have too true a principle beneath their errors to be thus summarily disposed of. As proof that their strength did not lie solely in the leadership of such men as Dr. Boughton and William Brisbane, the farmers did not relax their efforts to achieve reform through legislation. If anything, their viewpoint was broadened by the experiences of that summer of 1845. Their newspapers began to talk the same language as Evans and De Vere, who in the Williamsburg shop that Sunday in February 1844 had discussed a new political alignment that would result in a Republican Party of Progress, one of the anti-rent papers declared, There never can be either national glory or wealth until a party shall arise that is, in truth and deed, anti-rent, nor until the doctrine of an equality of compensation for labor and of time and equal chances is established upon the broad basis of equal rights, equal chances to all and privilege to none. The anti-rent party now forming may become the nucleus. The farmers' songs of emancipation dropped their stress on force and expressed a determination to work and vote. November Ides shall put to flight the imps of tyranny. No partisan of aristocracy saw the menace in the broadening crusade more vividly than James Fenimore Cooper, the squire of Otsego Hall. The danger from anti-rent doctrines was most to be apprehended, he felt, not from misguided and impotent beings who have taken the field in the literal sense, but from the educated classes who had taken it in the moral sense. Provincial notions that the tenures were opposed to the spirit of free institutions, notions spreading to the urban centers of culture far too swiftly for comfort, those were the real danger. On the anti-rent side, Ira Harris agreed with him. There lies the chief danger to this venerable and long-cherished relation between landlord and tenant, he said, employing a typical Cooper euphemism. Public opinion is brought to bear upon it. The educated classes are beginning to think and talk and act upon the subject. And this is the element of reform beyond the reach of sheriff's posses or military force or governor's proclamations. Landlords who had entrusted their fortunes to politicians now moved to salvage what they could. A dozen landholders in Delaware, Ulster, Sullivan, Schoharie, Columbia, Green, and Otsego counties made a general offer to sell all their lands on fair and equitable terms, and invited tenants to discuss purchase with them. Among the signatories were the Livingstons, the Verplanks, the Overings, and the Armstrongs. Earlier in 1845, Stephen Van Rensselaer IV had offered to waive the quarter sale for $30, and several credulous farmers had paid. But the redrawn deeds were returned to them with a new clause inserted, calling for a double rent payment at every transfer of the land. When Lawrence Van Dusen called this to the attention of a legislative committee, he was brusquely interrupted by a landlord spokesman. That's a lie. Van Dusen did not have to answer, for he was upheld by a committee member who said, I have one of the deeds in my hand, and I have just read the very clause referred to. Now Stephen IV made his third peace offer. 
the 6% formula, evolved by his own tenants in May of 1839, and later advocated by William H. Seward, was resurrected and proposed as something new. He was willing to sell for a sum which at 6% would yield annual interest equal to the rent, or about half the $5 an acre he had previously demanded. The freeholder commented that the present proposal might convince an unsuspicious public that Mr. Van Rensselaer was willing to make a reasonable compromise. But again, the patroon's offer actually applied only to the Helderberg farms, which did not have enough topsoil to fill an ox cart. The richest and most fertile portions of Albany County were excluded. Even the Albany Argus admitted that the excluded tenants might have reason to complain. And, added the freeholder, the day is gone when the tenants will be content with anything but justice. In both major parties, the internal conflict between reaction and progress was sharpened. Reformers like Seward and Greeley had done much to cut the Whig party adrift from its aristocratic element, and new blood was beginning to appear in the inner councils. The same forces were working in the Democratic ranks, driving the hunkers and the barn burners farther and farther apart. The once dependable anti-monopoly appeal of the Democratic Party and its old cry of popular rights had become meaningless dogma, belied by the practice of friendship for land monopoly and landed aristocracy. Every signpost pointed to a political reshuffling just over the horizon. Again, the anti-renters waited for the two parties to make their selections, and then endorsed only the candidates who had consistently advocated adjustment of the feudal leases. The Whigs began a second courtship of anti-rentism. The tenants were right, wrote Thurlow Weed. Men who labored for their landlord with teams for a given number of days were neither substantial freeholders nor independent farmers. These were feudal exactions and villain services. Not to be outdone, the Democrats made hasty pilgrimages to the farmers, and the Atlas, Wright's Albany mouthpiece, spoke approvingly of anti-rent objectives. In Delaware County, Sheriff Moore and his political friends tried to win tenant votes by means of the letters he had delivered for Brisbane and Squires. Every effort was made to employ the sorrow, the loneliness, and the destitution of the frightened families of the prisoners to break anti-rentism as a political force for all time. The politicians all but offered freedom for the prisoners if the anti-renters would abandon politics. Many, including Thomas DeVere, were actually convinced that Governor Wright was planning to intercede to save Edward O'Connor and John Van Steenberg before the election. DeVere went to see the governor, and in a two-hour conference cited Judge Parker's prejudicial handling of the trials. Even in England, famed for its oppression of political enemies of the ruling class, he said, such a miscarriage of justice has never been permitted. Silas Wright was moved, not so much by DeVere's appeal as by the realization that public opinion against the political aspects of the trials had crystallized. Even Timothy Corbin, who had helped round up anti-renters for persecution, was urging him to commute O'Connor's sentence or extend a final pardon. Corbin wrote that there was no proof that Edward had fired his gun, but much proof to nullify that charge, and he did not think that misguided Caprice should select O'Connor as the victim to suffer the death penalty when two hundred others who had been at the Earl sale were equally guilty. No one ever knew whether this was genuine conviction on Corbin's part or another effort to break the political resolve of the anti-renters. Petitions came from all over the state demanding that the prisoners' lives be saved. Even the Delaware Express lost its bloodthirstiness. If the governor should see fit to commute their punishment, far be it from us to oppose this act of mercy. Of this left-handed plea, Joseph Hoag remarked, a wolf when caught in a trap can be as tame as a lamb. Another factor was the astute legal opinions written for Horace Greeley's Tribune by George Clinton, Jr. Clinton held that the warrant under which the sheriff had acted was totally void, and that Steele had been a trespasser on the Earl property. 
He had been the wrongdoer, Clinton said, warning Wright not to dispose of O'Connor and Van Steenberg in prejudice, passion, and excitement. They had been wrongfully indicted and convicted. Despite any possibilities of executive clemency, the farmers did not relent. Throughout the fall campaign, they aimed such fury at the governor that the Atlas remarked on their spirit of intense hostility. We do not deny it, admitted the freeholder, reminding its readers that Wright had called the tenants insurgents, rebels, and outlaws. Whether he had been basely deceived by his political advisers or basely dishonest did not matter. He had been responsible for these past six months of strife. Even the women joined in with a warning to Silas Wright and the opponents of anti-rentism, published in one of their papers. You may fix your cannon in exultation now, but you will hear it answered at the polls with the voice of Niagara. You who have fattened upon office and power which we gave you, your days are numbered, your political heyday is over. You are now in the sear and yellow leaf. The people are about to take these matters in their own hands. Although Silas Wright's term had another year to go, he could not help being worried about the effect of this agitation on the Democratic majority in the legislature. He finally called in John Van Buren, Michael Hoffman, Peter Kegger, and other party leaders whose advice had brought him to such a pass. The result was that a series of resolutions were adopted by Democrats throughout the state, viewing with unmitigated abhorrence those political demagogues who, for personal or party purpose, had fanned the flame and encouraged the deluded anti-renters, and declaring that the governor's course relating to the unhappy difficulties between landlord and tenant met with their entire approval. Schenectady Democrats disapproved of all political anti-rentism and called upon every supporter of democratic principle to withhold support and countenance from it. Party stalwarts elsewhere held that any man seeking election by pledging himself to stand by their cause may be a candidate for modern Whiggery, but will receive, we trust, the signal rebuke which his demagogism and hypocrisy so richly deserve. Buffalo found Cato's swift action worthy of the highest commendation. Similar endorsements came from virtually every county in the state. The farmers singled out the resolutions urging dissolution of their political organization as new evidence of Wright's aims. If we dissolve, said one leader, our enemies would pick us off in detail. We are not to be wheedled out of our objective by political jugglery. No man can be at one and the same time a friend of law and order and an anti-renter, was the slogan endlessly repeated by the Silas Wright press. Finally, in desperation, the friends of the governor adopted Indian tactics. Thugs were sent from Albany to break up anti-rent political rallies. Speakers were threatened with tar and feathers and pelted with rotten eggs. But this time the sheriff did not come with a posse, and Wright did not drum for law and order. On election day, the farmers were up before daylight. By noon, the horses and wagons crowded the roads, bringing in the voters. The results exceeded their most sanguine expectations. Democratic Party strategists had considered it political wisdom to destroy anti-rentism, assuming that the votes gained outside the feudal counties would more than make up for the loss of the tenants' support. But they were disappointed. The farmers piled up an anti-rent Whig majority of more than 7,000 in the traditionally Democratic manor districts, thus, as Ira Harris remarked, by one blow annihilating the entire majority by which Silas Wright had risen to power the year before. The call for a constitutional convention was carried by more than 200,000 votes, and the tenants elected 14 out of a total of 128 members of the legislature. Great fires burned in the towns, and horns threw the news from valley to valley, Despite the presence of the state militia, anti-rentism carried up-rent Delhi. Let the log jails be now chopped into firewood and distributed to the poor, advised the freeholder. It will be the first instance in which the poor ever found comfort from the walls of a prison. 
Joseph Hogue, the schoolmaster, sent a jubilant letter to the anti-rent press. Truth, as she always does and is ever destined to, triumphed over oppression, monopoly, and the combined hosts of her enemies, he wrote. And indeed, those who sought to palsy those whose aim was to restore to all equal rights are indeed crestfallen. The conservative press could only deplore the sordid interests of the tenantry, and fear that politicians would go on truckling to anti-rentism until the rights of property were overthrown, and everybody was reduced to the sad condition of the Van Rensselaers. After the election was over, and the fate of O'Connor and Van Steenberg could no longer affect votes, the politicians and uprenters who had been the loudest in favor of clemency now called upon Governor Wright to hang them, on the ground that the people of Delaware County had shown by their large anti-rent vote that they were not subdued. The Methodist chaplain of the Delhi jail admitted candidly to Joseph Hogue, Both of them have confessed to me all that they have done, and I am firmly convinced of their innocence. Though they were there, armed and disguised, I am certain that they had no more to do directly with the death of Steele than the others. But he could not sign a petition for reprieve, he said, because he had been told that some of the anti-renters had threatened to avenge their death. If that is so, he added, I only wish there were more to be hung. On November 22nd, one week before the scheduled hanging, Governor Wright commuted the death sentences to life imprisonment. Defending the trials as regular and in conformity to the law, he explained that he was saving the prisoners' lives in answer to appeals, even though he could find no evidence that they had surrendered all disposition to resist the law. He was influenced principally, he said, by petitions describing O'Connor as far from mediocrity, of irreproachable character, loved and esteemed by all who had the honor of being acquainted with him. When the governor's commutation order reached the prisoners, the Delaware Express reported, Edward and John leaped about like madmen. Two hours later they were on their way to Sing Sing, guarded by forty soldiers. After boarding a boat at Catskill, Edward wrote to Reverend John Graham, giving the letter to Sheriff Moore for delivery. Six weeks I was under the sentence of death, which was more punishment than I thought I ought to have had, but still I am now to commence a new era. Could my countrymen have but known what clearness of conscience I have in this matter, they would never have sent me down the river. But the law holds me in this case, and I feel thankful that my countrymen sympathize with me. Much of the long letter which the preacher received was, surprisingly enough, devoted to Sheriff Moore and his friends. I must speak of them in the highest praise for their kindness to me. I am surprised to hear it said that I have been in irons in a room that I could not stand up in, also that I was not well fed. I deny it in toto. If you believe yourself and say, Peace, 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 and do what you can to make peace, it will be better for all the prisoners. Oh, beware, my friends, I have been in an awful school already, and God knows what still awaits me. If you ever have any more opposition to the law, Lord only knows what will be the consequence or where will be the end. If you take my advice, you will turn right. Right wrongs no man, and only return me to my friends, to society, and to God. The letter even praised Silas Wright. Later, O'Connor charged that Sheriff Moore had copied his original draft and distorted the contents. Needless to say, he said, he was much abused in Delhi. True, he had written a letter on the boat, yet never had he written such encomiums nor such lavish praise of the officials of Delhi. At all events, he said flatly, I deny the tenor that it breathes as not being a production of mine. Winter came to the Catskills and the Helderbergs, the Blenheim and Grafton Hills, burying them in snow. Columbia County became a rolling blanket of white. It had been a hard, bitter year for the farmers, but they had gained votes in the legislature and won the struggle for a constitutional convention. They could turn to winter work with energy and confidence. There were kegs to be made, bark to be cut for the tanneries, and saplings to be gathered for barrel hoops. 
On Dingle Hill the fields that Moses Earl had made productive were cold and white. Sparrows rustled in the weed stalks above the fence where Osmond Steele had fallen. Sarah Earl carried on as Moses had asked her to. She was sensible for her age, reported Joseph Hoag, after talking to her before the roaring fire in the Earl farmhouse. But she wept when she told him her troubles. She was oppressed by debt, and now with her husband in prison, it would take the annual proceeds of the farm to pay for hire. Three days before Christmas, Governor Wright recalled the troops that were still occupying Delhi. If evil influences shall hereafter be carefully avoided, and bad counsel firmly resisted by those who once yielded to dangerous delusions, his message read, insurrection will not again make its appearance, and time, forbearance, and good conduct will soon wear out the deforming traces of that which has terminated. In January 1846, Silas Wright suddenly found feudal tenures proper subjects for legislative inquiry and discussion. There was no embarrassment in his blue-gray eyes and round, florid face when he told the legislature so in his annual message. He had no difficulty in rationalizing his reversal of policy. A year before, he had refused relief on the grounds that the tenants came with unclean hands, and that the issue was not the justice of their cause, but the preservation of peace and the suppression of armed rebellion. Now the situation had changed. True, the spirit of defiance continued to be manifested in individual cases, but it was no longer general. He charged the legislature to act promptly to rid the state of the awful ghost of feudalism. Observed the freeholder, the trick of pretending to be precluded from discussing the real merits, not having succeeded according to expectation, the governor now finds it convenient to assume, what was just as true last year as this, that there is no real excuse for not entering upon discussion. The editorial went on to say that Silas Wright had magnified, distorted, and warped the riots to his own use, only to discover in the end that the people were with the farmers, in fancying it was as patriotic to prevent a poverty-stricken tenant from being turned out of his house and home as it was to empty a cargo of tea in Boston Harbor. The Democrats climbed aboard the bandwagon of reform with such celerity that only the calico dresses, the sound of the tin horn, and the rattle of sabers was missing. Benjamin Bailey, one of Wright's most talented friends, who had felt in 1845 that there was no authority upon which the legislature could act, now called upon the lawmakers to remove the evil, unrepublican, and degrading tenures, which he suddenly found to be a fungus upon the body politic. "'Imagine my surprise,' said Henry Z. Hayner, the Whig anti-renter who had been one of Dr. Boughton's attorneys, when I found not a gentleman but was ready and willing, nay anxious, to do them ample and speedy justice, to search diligently to find a remedy for their grievances. Ira Harris listened sardonically, as paraphrases of his own words came from the lips of the very men who had accused him of sedition, but he was willing to accept them into the ranks. I know that eleventh-hour conversions are always suspect, he said on the floor of the legislature, Still, I am not disposed to scrutinize too closely the motives of the gentlemen placed in circumstances so embarrassing, nor to inquire too carefully into the reasons which have induced them to change ground. I am willing that their deeds shall speak for them. The Democrats did their best to shut out the Whigs from any participation in the reform action to which they had been forced. Those who have borne the heat and burden of the day need repose, said Benjamin Bailey, suggesting that Ira Harris should be spared the ordeal of serving on the committee to draft the relief for the tenants. When Harris declined to be relieved, Bailey turned on him for attempting to monopolize anti-rentism. The hue and cry was immediately raised that the party of the responsible majority was in danger, and that Silas Wright would not have a fair chance. During the bitter debate that followed, the Democrats blamed former Governor Seward for the whole anti-rent crisis. Ira Harris retorted that, far from provoking disturbances, Seward had exerted influence toward quieting the resistance. 
even after the legislature had refused to act on Seward's 1840 recommendations, the tenants had continued to petition legally. Harris pointed out that in 1844 the legislature had answered the tenants' complaints with that infamous Judiciary Committee report. I charge upon the author of that report all the disorder and violence, he said. There the germ was planted which has produced all these evils. Until then a disposition had been manifested at least to listen to the complaints of these tenants. But in that report, exhibiting much sophistry, all hope was extinguished. They were told that there was no relief for them, that they must submit to their condition, that the degradation and hardships existed but in their imagination. The acrimony finally subsided with the appointment of a select committee headed by Samuel J. Tilden of New Lebanon, Columbia County, a tested friend of Martin Van Buren. Tilden's task was to save the party from its anti-rent blunder, and the choice was ideal. East of the Hudson, farmers knew and liked young Tilden. He had spoken strongly against the powerful financial interests which introduced into legislation influences the most subtle, founded on interests the most selfish, and the avaricious few who controlled legislation in order to concentrate and perpetuate their wealth. The appointment of the committee heralded a distinct advance for the tenants, but de Vere was quick to see that they could not afford to sit back and wait for results. Seeking to make doubly sure that the farmers had a voice in the legislative session and the approaching constitutional convention, de Vere urged a state anti-rent meeting to draft a program. Ira Harris strenuously opposed it, fearing that the farmers might demand sweeping changes that would upset his strategy of giving them moderate reforms while appeasing the conservatives. Through the freeholder, still edited by his Whig friend Alexander Johnson, he said there was no need for a convention since the farmers' cause was in able hands. De Vere promptly urged the farmers to repudiate the freeholder and keep the anti-rent party from falling into the hands of a central clique, who would control even the calling of conventions. Ira Harris had sidestepped this head-on clash with de Vere as long as he could, but in the face of increasing objection from the conservatives, he could no longer uphold the free-soil policy or risk de Vere's influence with the anti-renters. Accordingly, the freeholder did not try to defend its opposition to the meeting, but opened a barrage against the instigator, characterizing de Vere's farmer supporters as the mistaken adherents of a false-hearted and double-tongued man. If they actually knew de Vere, the freeholder declared, they would kick him out of their presence as unceremoniously as they would an ill-natured and unmannerly cur. His vanity, his assumption of infallible judgment upon all things, his dictatorial conduct, his acts of petty tyranny— his ungovernable temper and unregulated tongue are wholly unbearable. Wherever this man has been, he has been an instrument of evil and an agent of mischief. Too vain and presumptuous to act a subordinate part, he is too rash and indiscreet to be a leader. Nevertheless, Thomas de Vere won the first round, for on February 27, 1846, despite the snow blocking the roads, the anti-rent delegates gathered at J. H. Lockwood's across the street from the state capitol. Thurlow Weed and other top-ranking Whigs rushed to the meeting to protect party interests, but de Vere was elected secretary, and the most strenuous Whig efforts failed to head off the farmers' demand for the right to contest the landlord's titles. Even de Vere was surprised at his strength. A comprehensive program of legislative needs was drawn up and taken across the street to the Tilden Committee by a delegation which included Dr. Frederick Crowns, Amos Loper, Lawrence Van Dusen, John Slingerland, John Mayhem, and the Reverend Hezekiah Pettit. Five weeks later, on April 2nd, at the Albany County Convention to nominate delegates to the coming Constitutional Convention, De Vere was still in the ascendancy. He was named secretary of the meeting and chairman of the resolutions committee. Although he did not wish to expose himself to the charge that he was seeking office, he was nominated as a delegate, 
and received five votes on the first ballot in spite of having withdrawn his name. He then called upon the convention to nominate Horace Greeley, or someone else who would embody the principle of the free soil movement. His enemies were able to block this move, but the final program for constitutional reform was anything but Whig-inspired. The tenants passed a resolution that the landlord's titles required more substantial proof than the mere word of the patroon. It read, we hold it to be the first and most sacred duty to take such measures as will tend to establish in this republic the principle of freehold soil. Having once put our hand to the plough, we will never look back until we have reached our just and noble object, in the entire enfranchisement of those fields which the swords of our fathers redeemed from the English kings, and the axe of our fathers redeemed from the primeval forest." Meanwhile, the Tilden Committee had finished its investigation, and on March 28th submitted to the legislature a report embodying all the suggestions made at the February 27th meeting, except those referring to pardons and the right to test the landlord's titles. With what Ira Harris called great force and ability, Tilden had analyzed the evils of the leases, and had recommended uncompromising destruction of the feudalistic manners which had been perpetuated by the old Federalists. William H. Seward's criticisms in 1840 had not been more conclusive. The Tilden Report declared that the tenants had not exaggerated the evils of the tenures. Experience and observation had proved their charges to be true. Successful husbandry demanded a sense of complete ownership, which the leasehold system prohibited. Moreover, the leases were impediments to a free exchange of the lands, and tended to restrain labor from seeking, through shifting employments, the habit and opportunities of enterprise, and they made an invidious distinction in favor of a particular class of creditors. As a remedy, Tilden favored such taxation of the landlord's reservations as would discourage these investments, which have been found contrary to just public policy. Further, and this was his most daring proposal, he would not only limit all future agricultural leases to ten years, but would break up the estates upon the death of their present owners, by the exercise of the unquestionable power of the legislature over the statutes of devise and dissent. He would then transfer the landlord's rights and interests to the tenants on equitable terms. The landlords were shocked into new and desperate political activity. They beset members of the legislature in all places. Stephen Van Rensselaer invited a large number to dine with him. Perhaps, the freeholder commented, he thinks good dinners, good wines, and good horses will be weighty arguments in his favor. Joshua Spencer, a patroon-petted legislator, did his best to stem the tide of reform in the Senate, the last stronghold of conservatism. As a member of the Senate Select Committee, he filed a minority report opposing all relief for the farmers. The tenants could get any necessary redress, he explained, by availing themselves of the landlord's disposition to voluntarily sell out their interests. Mr. Spencer, observed the freeholder, has rooms in the house of the patroon's pastor. He is himself a member of the church. This report was surely ushered into the world with due religious ceremony, drawn up, read, and approved by the committee on Sunday, in the house of the minister of the gospel, the pastor of the patroon, it must be the offspring of holy thoughts, and may be truly denominated a sanctified report. Pamphlets flowed from the presses of the landlord aristocracy, crying out against the injustice, Landlords would be robbed because they had so few votes compared with those who were to benefit by the robbery. The taxing of landlords was a violation of the spirit of the state constitution, if not the letter. The purpose was not to raise revenue, but to coerce them into selling or abandoning their property. Daniel D. Barnard's defense of the manor system, originally published in the American Review, was reissued in pamphlet form and distributed throughout the state. All the trouble, said Barnard, sprang from the agrarian spirit of the times, but he was confident that there were too many men of property and too many creditors, as well as too much principle, 
to allow debts in any form to be repudiated. He appealed to the farmers to give up their political activity. God help the poor if they must needs add hatred and envy and malice and strife to the necessary evils of poverty. He defended the quarter-sale reservation as the patroon's far-sighted effort to exclude dangerous or improper and unprofitable intruders from the property. As for the farmers, they should consider it a privilege to have been permitted by their labors to have made worthless land worth ten dollars an acre. A beehive is not the only community in which drones live on honey gathered by another's labor and industry, answered the freeholder. James Fenimore Cooper was more vituperative than usual. The hope of civilization had never been darker. Anti-rentism was tyranny in its worst form. Tilden's proposals were thimble-rigged, designed to conciliate three or four thousand voters who were on the market at the expense of those who, it was well known, were not to be bought. The tax, to choke off the landlords, was a disgrace to civilization, an outrage on liberty. Tilden's proposal to break up the estates had put a premium on murder, at which, said Cooper, the farmers had proved themselves expert. Squire Cooper's concept of democracy was outraged. Democracy was a lofty and noble sentiment, and such injustice and roguery had no place in it. The most civilized countries on earth were under the leasehold system, and the relation of landlord and tenant was entirely natural and salutary. Editors of the anti-rent press turned literary critic with zeal. It would be unfair to call Cooper a demagogue, the freeholder commented. He hates and despises the people too much to flatter them, but we give him no credit for honesty in his course. A man so filled with vanity and ill-nature could not please if he tried. If he should attempt to smile, he would frown, and if he meant to laugh, he would snarl and growl. Mr. Cooper is a cynic, a sneering philosopher. Cooper had by artful contrasts and skilled array of falsehood made rogues of the tenants in his novel The Redskins. His landlords are well-educated, elegant, accomplished, and liberal gentlemen, and his tenants are coarse, ignorant, selfish, and hypocritical boors. The freeholder read Cooper's own opinion of universal suffrage into a speech by one of his characters. I suppose quite three-fourths of the whole population are opposed to it in their hearts. Hugh Littlepage's remark in The Redskins was pointed out as revealingly autobiographical. For a moment, as I gazed on the broad view, I felt all my earlier interest in it revive, and am not ashamed to own that a profound feeling of gratitude to God came over me, when I recollected it was by His providence I was born the heir to such a scene, instead of having my lot cast among the serfs and dependents. We presume, said the freeholder, he would restore the old property qualification, and apply it to the whites as well as the blacks. The man is no Democrat at all who would make any distinction between man and man in political rights and privileges, on account of his color, property, or employment. The man who does so has still to learn the first lesson in democracy. Owing to Cooper's admiration for French and English society, the freeholder went on, he wanted to introduce the same social distinctions in this country, and pretended to think them compatible with democracy. He would persuade us all the land should first be given to a few favored families in order to raise up and perpetuate a class of liberal and cultivated gentlemen who shall be supported in ease and affluence by the labor of their tenants, and who are to repay the toil of their humble servitors by setting them examples of intelligence, polished manners, and high moral training. All the clamor of the wealthy landowners was unavailing. The time had come. Tilden's proposals to limit the term of agricultural leases and to break up the feudal estates on the death of the present owners passed the assembly and were defeated in the conservative Senate. But on May 13, 1846, both houses of the New York State Legislature voted to tax the landlord's income from the long-term leases and to outlaw the seizure and forced sale of tenant property for non-payment of rent. At the tenant's insistence, Ira Harris sponsored two independent measures covering the points neglected by the Tilden Report. 
one calling upon Governor Wright to pardon the anti-rent prisoners, the other creating a commission to investigate the landlord's titles to their estates. Both measures were defeated, but the strength of the farmers' united political action could no longer be denied. Democracy was emerging from theory into practice, and the legislature was at last forced to accept the will of the people. On June 1st, the Constitutional Convention opened in Albany to remain in session till October 9th. For the first time in the history of the state, no great names dominated these meetings. Fifty-three of the delegates were farmers or mechanics who were determined to get rid of federalism as well as feudalism. While the Democrats cited the Bible to prove that the Negro was destined to occupy an inferior social position, the anti-renters demanded equal rights without regard to race, and asserted that there should be no qualifications for any right, trust, or profession, except merit, integrity, and ability. One of the farmers' major goals was the extension of local self-government to provide for the election of judges and top-ranking state officers formerly appointed by the governor. This was their reply to Silas Wright's removal of Commissioner Russell Dorr in 1845, and his use of Attorney General John Van Buren as his personal agent against anti-rentism. In the case of the elective judiciary, the farmers had more in mind than ridding the courts of political dependency. New blood was needed to make the administration of justice a living process. Old lawyers seldom make good judges, declared the freeholder. They have so long been accustomed to enlist on one side of every case that it is hard to weigh both sides impartially. They are apt upon the start to get bias one way or the other. Similar criticisms of the courts were made from the convention floor. The judiciary had worked well for an unprincipled portion of a privileged order of men, one of the delegates said. The courts had deeply humbled and disgraced the state, another charged, and were guilty of log-rolling and lobbying. Though he, too, argued in favor of an elected judiciary, Ira Harris reassured the conservative delegates by making a spirited defense of Judge Amasa J. Parker for his handling of the anti-rent trials at Delhi. Judge Parker had sentenced more than a score of unfortunate men, and yet, said Harris, I would scarcely venture to accept a nomination for judge in opposition to that distinguished judge. So ably and faithfully has he discharged his delicate and responsible duties. Later events suggested that Harris had made a deal with the American Jeffreys, whereby he would deliver an anti-rent endorsement to Parker in return for hunker votes for himself when the judiciary became elective, the anti-renter fairly sizzled with de Vere's reply. Now, men, are ye men at all? Are ye citizens of the North America Republic? Do you live in the present enlightened age? And will you permit this man to tie down your intellectual faculties, to lead captive your common sense, to chain you to that car of his ambition from which he spits down upon ye the very filth of his insults and contempt? Oh, men and brethren, rouse, rouse! and do not give yourself up to bondage so detestable. Prove to the political office dealers that their standing axiom, the people can be humbugged, in your case at least, is not true. Alexander Johnson hastened to uphold Harris's defense of Judge Parker in the freeholder. He avowed his complete confidence in Parker's integrity, honesty, and uprightness. If the judge lost his equanimity and impartiality at Delhi, it was simply because he was caught in a tide of hate and revenge. But if God spared him, he would be a light to his profession, an ornament to the bench, and an honor to his state. Johnson pitied de Vere's infirmity by reason of which he cannot differ from a man without quarreling with him, and cannot disapprove and censure a man's conduct without hating him and vilifying his public and private character. De Vere charged that the tenants had cheated themselves of real constitutional reform by electing knaves and fools as delegates. The freeholder passed off the attack, explaining that De Vere was revengeful because neither Horace Greeley nor George H. Evans nor Alvin Bovey 
to whom besides himself he condescends to concede a modicum of brains and a small measure of wisdom, were elected delegates. In spite of the clash of interests and ambitions, the convention approved of an elective judiciary. It was a real victory for the farmers, but they achieved their most important triumph when the leasehold system came up for debate. Feudal landlordism, said George Clyde, whom the tenants called on to handle their side, originated in power and craft, if not by fraud. He described the land barons as a small class of men living idly and sumptuously on the toil of others, through leases skillfully and cunningly devised to keep the farmers inferior, mere serfs and vassals, hewers of wood and drawers of water. After the discussion, substantial relief was voted for the tenants. Under the new state constitution, no more feudal leases could be issued, and some of the worst features of the existing leases were eased. In order to prevent a recurrence of anti-rent difficulties, the revised statutes prohibited the lease of agricultural lands for a longer period than twelve years, and outlawed all fines, quarter sales, and similar restraints upon the transfer of title. But the victory was not complete. The existing leases still stood. There was satisfaction in knowing that, as George Clyde said, the reforms would eventually wear out and destroy the existing evils. Still, there was an untried battlefield. Now that justice could be anticipated from an elected judiciary, the farmers could and would test the legality of the reservations in the leases. End of section 19. Recording by Maria Casper. Section 20 of Tin Horns and Calico by Henry Christman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 20. The Goose is Plucked. It is 1846, and the morning of the 4th of July, Thomas Ange de Vere wrote in his journal, the politicians have entire control, and I am not invited to speak at the celebration twelve miles from Albany, hard driven to get the paper out. He was at work in the anti-renter office early that morning, when two or three young men entered. Are you going to the celebration? one of them asked. Yes, I'll start by nine o'clock, he said. Don't trouble about a conveyance. We have a carriage, and will call for you if you say so. De Vere agreed and worked on, but waited in vain, until he came to the conclusion that they were trying to deceive him and keep him away from the meeting. At that thought he closed his shop and set out for New Scotland on foot, walking across lots, through fields that rose and fell with the wavy hills and shadowed glens, toward the hazy outline of the Helderbergs. As he swung along, he stopped to eat wild strawberries showing red in the grass. He was in no hurry, and he had much to ponder over. He was at a new crisis, and glad to feel earth under his feet, for the love of nature was still the strongest force in his life. He knew why he had not been invited to join the Albany County Anti-Renters' Observance of Independence Day, the first time since 1842. The politicians were trying to get rid of him. When the anti-renters had become strong enough to swing the balance of political power in the state, orders had gone out to local politicians to take over, and Whigs and hunker Democrats had wormed themselves into the movement. Seeing De Vere in their way, they had taken away his newspaper and told him to get out of Albany. But he had started his own paper, and stood his ground for a year, in the belief that there could be no glory except in an emancipated working class. To the sordid politicians, as he called them, he knew that he seemed a stubborn, bull-headed, disorganizing evil. De Vere turned aside to a path that led into the woods. The shade was cool, and the damp forest air was sweet, cleansed by a shower the day before. A partridge thundered from the underbrush as he passed. Thinking back, he now saw Ira Harris as a treacherous opportunist, willing to sacrifice a man's basic rights for his own political profit. In a sense, the man seemed more vicious than the feudal barons, De Vere felt, for they had always frankly exploited the people. 
but Harris tried by doling out half-measures to keep their faith and at the same time satisfy their masters. Harris could not forget the dazzling prospect of political power. Although he favored free soil and progressive labor legislation, he dared not advocate them for fear of frightening away his industrial, commercial, and financial support. Devere raged at the duplicity of Harris's repeated warnings to the anti-renters. The work of reform in which you are engaged involves a question too broad for any platform of party politics, interests too sacred to be committed to any political organization, but which address themselves to the whole people, to every patriot. Harris simply wanted to keep the fat goose of anti-rent votes to pluck at will, if opposition to this conspiracy against the farmers made Devere a disorganizing evil, he was proud of it. The old parties were based on sand, in Devere's opinion, and their lack of realism was a threat to social stability and progress. The Whig protection of industry would bring monopolies, speculation, and showy prosperity, an end in overproduction, depression, and national and individual bankruptcy. On the other hand, the free trade offered by the Democrats was a doctrine fraught with ruin, placing no restriction upon ambition and cupidity. Devere was convinced that equal rights could be secured only through a new party that would create a landed democracy, elevate labor and laboring classes, subordinate capital to industry, and equalize the compensation for time and labor in the varied departments of life. He bitterly resented Ira Harris's efforts to undermine his prestige with the farmers and to brand him as an interloper and intruder in the anti-rent movement. Devere had come to the farmers when anti-rentism was weak, and many of Harris's latter-day supporters were doing their best to choke it off before its voice could be heard beyond the Helderbergs. Then, with Dr. Boughton and a few idealists, he had done more than any other man to strengthen the movement. He had kept his pledge with the farmers, helping them in their local war, in exchange for their support of free soil. He had never asked any return for himself as an individual. Now Harris, in trying to remove the stain from his own hands, was attempting to brand him a charlatan. With such thoughts as these running through his mind, Devere arrived at the celebration grounds under the brow of the Helderbergs in New Scotland. The speeches were not yet finished, and his four years of work among the farmers had been too important, generous, and self-sacrificing for Lawrence Van Dusen to let him go unrecognized. Van Dusen called upon him to speak, and if the Helderbergs did not tremble that afternoon, it was not Thomas Devere's fault. Men of the mountain towns, let us perform the mission to which we are appointed. Let us this day renew the pledge that you war not only for the freedom of your own fields, but for the freedom of the wide field of the whole republic. Tell the world that at the bottom of the local struggle lies a principle as deep as the foundations of the earth, broad as the earth's surface, enduring in its application as the earth itself. On a day like this will our sympathies not go forth to the oppressed, the houseless, and the degraded. Shall the cry of their distress go up from the cellar and the garret? Shall the poverty of our brothers, the rags of their wives, the hunger of their children, find no answering sympathy from the men who first flung to the breeze the standard of man's earthly redemption? Shall our watch-light go forth a beacon and a hope to all nations on earth? or shall it smoke and flicker and perish where it arose among the Helderberg mountains? Let us bind together the men of the East and the West, of the city and the country. If the Boston men had struggled for themselves only, if their whole energies had been confined to a repeal of the Boston Harbor Bill, if they had been desirous of making their own peace regardless of the welfare of the country, who would have helped them, and what could they have effected? Nothing. But when the voice of patriotism went forth, when it echoed over the middle states and into the Carolinas, when the struggle ceased to be a local one and became national, the fate of despotism was decided. Devere continued his impassioned address for an hour, pressing the farmers to choose between a long-range crusade for reform and the short-range program urged upon them by spineless politicians— he left the platform more than ever determined to see the fight through. 
He went up on the mountain at once, and accompanied part of the time by Alvin Bove, journeyed from town to town, stressing the need for a meeting of national reformers and anti-renters to explore the possibilities of a national free soil party, into which the abolitionists too could be drawn, to merge the strength of all the progressive forces. Horace Greeley gave his strong private approval, but refused to support the move publicly until the actual merger had been achieved. He was too cautious to sacrifice his link to Whiggery until a third party was strong enough to ensure his political survival. Patroonery is dead, Devere kept telling the farmers, dead as a doornail. Not all the quack doctors in the country could blow life into it again if they were puffing at it till their sides grew sore. The only consolation we have is to know that it will not long remain above ground. In fact, the only fear is now that patroonery will be buried, out of sight, forgotten, before that great national measure is carried out which will free the entire republic, and preserve it free in all future time from the curse which we are now getting rid of in New York State. Politicians envied him the ability to mingle with backcountry farmers as one of them, after speaking at a meeting, he would go home with a farmer for the night, making himself one of the family, amusing the children with tall tales about the bad boys of Donegal. An entry in his journal tells how one morning he went to the woods with his host, with a gun over one shoulder and an axe over the other. Finding no game, they took to axe and wedge. And let nobody hereafter tell us a willing man cannot hew down a hemlock tree and split it up into stakes and firewood, he wrote. Each night he spoke at a new meeting, and the next day, if there was time, he worked in another farmer's field. At several meetings, De Vere's overzealous friends, as he modestly called them, voted to consider anti-rent and national reform identical. At one meeting, Abraham Onderdonk, annoyed by Harris's treatment of De Vere, introduced a resolution calling De Vere's removal from the freeholder a gross usurpation of the farmer's rights, contrary to the wish of the vast majority. It was unanimously approved. Meeting after meeting cheered De Vere. When he returned to Albany, he had gained not only widespread support for free soil, but at least one personal endorsement— resolved that the anti-renters of Rensselaerville, in public meeting assembled, do present to our brethren throughout the county of Albany, Thomas A. De Vere, as a proper and deserving man to receive their support and ours for member of Congress at the approaching election. Has any man labored in our cause? He has labored more. Has any man sacrificed? He has sacrificed more. Has any man produced results? He has produced greater. For this, therefore, and in consideration of his eminent ability to discharge the duties of the station, we make this presentment of our first choice. Ira Harris, meanwhile, had been grooming John Slingerland, a Whig, who as a Van Rensselaer tenant had known what it was to pay wheat rent and stand hat in hand awaiting orders for his day's labor as a manor serf, and had not hesitated to share the platform with De Vere and Beauvais, Harris was so upset by De Vere's activities that he had Alexander Johnson issue a warning. If the anti-renters court defeat and disgrace, let them nominate Thomas A. De Vere. The freeholder would publish none of the resolutions. De Vere had organized a National Reform Association in Albany, with Hugh Scott as president. Scott's willingness to serve was a singular triumph for De Vere as he was a Jeffersonian Democrat in excellent standing, and had been organizer and secretary of the first anti-rent meeting in 1839, and president of the first state convention in 1845. To offset De Vere's advantage, the Whig anti-renters, with Harris as their spokesman, moved with the skill of old political generals to disorganize the tenants, more evil than good would come of anti-rent association with agrarians, they predicted darkly. There is a violent prejudice against the national reformers in many parts of the state. We shall incur less odium, we shall meet less opposition, we shall accomplish more, if we act singly and apart. When Alvin Bove explained, frankly, that the chief object of De Vere's proposed free soil meeting was to test the anti-rent leaders, and induce them to speak out one way or the other, 
the freeholder demanded angrily, "'What right have they to question our leaders? What right have they to try them by any test? We advise all anti-renters to stay away.' True, the national reformers had given support to anti-rentism when it was most needed, but is that reason why we should amalgamate with them? They were masters of mere claptrap phrases, and their program was a half-formed, disjointed Caliban of a moonstruck doctor. The proposed free soil meeting was a trick to entrap the anti-renters. Thomas de Vere had spread the net, aided by his co-worker in mischief, Alvin Bove, Free soil resolutions had been thrust upon the people and allowed to pass without any opposition. Not a line about these meetings addressed by De Vere and Bove would appear in the freeholder. When the abolitionist patriot, defending the free soil proposal, charged that land reform was being betrayed by lying, deceptive Whiggery, the freeholder leaped to the defense of the Whigs, attributing to the patriot vulgar taste and hateful, envious passions. De Vere fought gallantly and tirelessly, but more than energy and determination was needed to unite the anti-renters with the other reform forces. Ira Harris offered immediate success and political power. De Vere could promise only struggle, a clear conscience, and a chance of ultimate victory. The free soil meeting fizzled out. Afterward, by offering political endorsement to a few carefully picked anti-renters, Good friends of Thomas de Vere, like old Lawrence Van Dusen, loved as the George Washington of anti-rent, Ira Harris gained control of the Albany County Anti-Rent Nominating Convention, and unseated de Vere and Hugh Scott by refusing to admit contending delegations from the city of Albany. Harris had carefully measured his strength, and although he had a majority, his margin was slim. John Slingerland, with his good anti-rent record, gained the congressional nomination by only four votes out of a total of forty-four. Lawrence Van Dusen fared a little better, winning the nomination for county clerk by seven votes. The hardest blow to De Vere's hopes was still to come. Traditionally, the county meeting was followed by local meetings at which delegates to the state anti-rent convention were named. Harris knew that if these town nominations were permitted, De Vere would be assured of many sympathetic delegates from Albany County. At the end of the county meeting, after many farmers had started back to their farms for the evening chores, Harris's friends pushed through a resolution designating delegates to the state convention. Thus Ira Harris triumphantly gained control of the powerful Albany County block. Now his only problem was to keep the tenants in line until election. The freeholder warned them unceasingly against De Vere's influence. We are aware that exertions will be made to get up split tickets. We know enthusiastic meetings can be got up, but beware of traitors. An evil was abroad among the farmers, which real friends of anti-rentism, the Ira Harris Whigs, were in a position to eradicate. This evil is disunion and its persevering progenitor we believe to be the restless spirit who conducts the anti-renter. And then, directly to Thomas de Vere, subordination is a feature in the tactics of anti-rentism which deserves the careful attention of all volunteers. You were carefully reminded of the importance of this during your brief sojourn with the freeholder. You have been told by the people of the county that they would much rather dispense with your services, the citizens of Albany told you the same thing respecting that scurvy illegitimate the Albany workman. Your retreat from the old world was a mere accidental escape. Your next expedition may be a good deal less fortunate. It was at this juncture that bands began to blare whenever De Vere attempted to speak. At every meeting and convention, and I attended all within reach, I was met by a storm of sordid politicians, he wrote in his autobiography. They went to the extreme of ordering their band to strike up to drown out my voice. That voice so broke that for days after I could not speak louder than a whisper. At a large protest meeting on the Helderbergs, he was compelled to give up after fifteen minutes of desperate effort to make himself heard. Though the editor must have known that the band had been dispatched for that very purpose, the freeholder rebuked De Vere unctuously. 
you petulantly told the veterans of the mountain towns that if that was the highest tribute of respect that they could pay you would not address them you have time after time obtruded yourself into the meetings of the farmers you have continued to persist in your obsequious course until you have entirely exhausted their indulgent patience they have said that it would be expedient for them if you would go away for if you go not away the comforter will not come de vere described those days as an incredible and painful dream and the behavior of his foes as treason paralleled only by that of their great prototype benedict arnold but he was not a man to give up easily party bigwigs across the nation were watching silas wright's political star when the new york state democratic convention in syracuse renominated him on october first eighteen forty six the prestige of a second term as governor of new york added to the nationwide reputation he had gained in the united states senate would make him a powerful presidential contender in eighteen forty eight already some newspapers had raised the right for president banner on the whole the democrats were optimistic as in spite of wrangling by the hunkers and the barn burners the convention ended in good spirits and a feeling of cordiality knowing that the biggest obstacle to his re-election was anti-rentism wright appealed to martin van buren for men sufficiently anti-renter and of sufficient intelligence and discretion to stump the tenant towns for support soon a democratic drive was in full swing to capitalize on the farmers resentment of ira harris's attempt to turn them into whigs at the whig new york state convention in utica on september twenty third harris had taken over whig leadership by dictating the gubernatorial nomination of john young over millard fillmore with his fat anti-rent goose as de vere always called it added to his own party strength harris held the controlling votes and when he released them to young on the third ballot he automatically inherited thurlow weed's mantle as party boss weed walked out of the convention old line whigs were glum over harris's coup even the choice of hamilton fish for lieutenant governor failed to mollify the conservatives a considerable portion of the party cannot swallow young even with his fish sauce bennett punned in the new york herald they were afraid that young was too much a man of the people actually their alarm was unwarranted for he stood halfway between the conservative and the radical elements of the party his warmth for labor was genuine but by no means a dominating force he was ready to adjust his politics to events both young and wright had been asked to clarify their position on pardon for the anti-renters for months the farmers had sung lustily our next chief magistrate shall be him who sets the prisoners free silas wright would promise nothing save that his duty should be discharged to the best of his ability this non-committal statement was hailed by the democrats as worthy of the man worthy of the governor but it was hardly calculated to deflect the artillery ira harris had trained against him if wright had held privately to his public repudiation of the vile means which demagogues employ to win public favor he might have commanded respect for consistency at least or had he publicly reversed himself and admitted his earlier error his record would have been clear in the final crisis however he lacked the courage either to be consistent or to confess without retreating an inch from his moral rejection of anti-rentism he bartered behind closed doors offering off-the-record pledges as a bribe for tenant votes he pardoned young anson burrell silas tompkins and charles knapp who had been sent to sing sing by delhi justice in may eighteen forty five hoping no doubt that this would be taken as an indication of the consideration which the rest of the anti-rent prisoners might expect from him if re-elected having extended this left-handed sop to the tenants he rushed to alps to offer mary boughton his secret pledge of a pardon for her husband if she would persuade big thunder to support his re-election mary boughton remembered sitting day after day years it seemed to her in the columbia county courthouse her heart torn with helpless agony 
while Silas Wright marshaled his power to destroy her husband. He could deny responsibility now, but his own party newspapers had ruthlessly assured the public that in the prosecution of Dr. Boughton, Wright had used the full extent of his authority. The doctor himself had warned her that Silas Wright was his most bitter enemy. Unimpressed by the governor's promises, she told him that if he wanted her husband's support, he would have to ask him for it himself. She would not intercede for him. Wright then turned to Mary Boughton's father, Amasa Bailey, one of the leading citizens of Alps. Bailey was so bitter over Harris's tactics that he was glad of an opportunity to work against Harris's candidate, chin-whiskered John Young. Wright convinced Bailey that he did not wish the anti-rent nomination, but only wanted to keep John Young from getting it. Governor Wright became sufficiently worried to swallow his pride and carry his candidacy directly to Clinton prison. In early October he wrote to the keeper, It is at length agreed that the comptroller and myself will make the promised visit to your prison. He explained that he would not be able to wait until after election, when John Van Buren could join him, as it will be too late in the season. It was the political season, not the early Adirondack winter, that accounted for the governor's haste, and the anti-rent prisoners at once saw through the move. In what Brisbane called chaste and elegant language, Wright told them that they were a class apart from the mass of convicts, that he did not look upon them as felons, but as political prisoners who had risen up against civil government. Among other things, he said that in all civil commotions the innocent generally suffered the most. If I had heard this doctrine in Europe, I would have thought it nothing strange, Brisbane wrote dryly, but to hear the American Cato defending it, I thought it strange indeed. He told us he deeply sympathized with us, and that as soon as public opinion would justify him in liberating us, he would gladly do it. But Wright got no endorsement from the skeptical prisoners. The anti-renters met in their second state convention at William Beardsley's in Albany on October 6, 1846. The meeting was small, only 34 delegates, as compared with the 150 of the Great Burn Convention of 1845. But the once depraved and degraded anti-renters balanced the fortunes of the major parties in their hands. The tables had been turned. In other years they had had to beg for support. The only answer they got in those days was, Go home, you are a deluded people. Now the ablest Whigs and Democrats were in their lobby ready to bargain for a nod of their approval. When the meeting opened, Ira Harris was able to deny seats to Thomas DeVere and his friends by forcing the convention to recognize his own block of delegates. Thus Harris not only controlled the vote of the large Albany County delegation, but he also had a letter from Dr. Smith A. Boughton, written from Clinton Prison, urging the endorsement of John Young, our warm advocate, and a letter from Young himself. Geneseo, 29th September, 46. My dear sir, the convictions for offenses growing out of the manner difficulties have been generally, if not all of them, convictions for offenses quasi-political, it has been the practice, I believe, of all wise governments, when harmony has been restored in cases of rebellion or popular outbreak, to pardon the convicted, and by some general act of the government to protect offenders that had not been convicted. This seems to me to be a wise principle in the administration of government, and applicable, I think, to the offenses growing out of the manner difficulties. John Young the letter was carefully worded, but it confirmed Harris's pledge to the tenants that his candidate would open the prison doors to all who have been convicted of any offense against the laws, no matter of what character, growing out of anti-rentism. Nevertheless, in the face of Silas Wright's behind-the-scenes activity and the tenants' natural suspicion of Whig maneuvering, Ira Harris had hard work selling John Young to the 34 men at Beardsley's. After four bitter hours, they gave the candidate the endorsement, but a third of the delegates walked out when they learned the result of the vote. Men like Russell Dorr, Burton Thomas, John Evans, editor of the Equal Rights Advocate, the Columbia County anti-rent paper, and, of course, Amasa Bailey. 
De Vere's anti-renter hastened to protest the endorsement. Please God, he wrote, as his friends in the convention fought for an independent nomination, I will put some of them in possession of the facts before I leave, brief as will be my stay. He exposed the high-handed ruse by which Harris had captured the Albany County block. The Albany delegates were mere sheer drummed-up party men, he said, and the true, the tried, the sterling men of the movement refused to consummate this regular swallow, and rebelled against this wholesale transfer of anti-renters into the capacious maw of John Young. For a year, De Vere told his readers, he had done little but grapple and tug and wrestle with the impostors who had seized on anti-rentism for the purpose of hugging it to death and laying its carcass as a sea-store to feed them on their political voyage. He confessed he had been no match for these wary and practiced old swordsmen, backed by a perfect organization, made up of venal office beggars. He had always considered the duel an inglorious one against a hundred snakes of every hue and color, and unless the tenants redeem their political independence in this election, he was ready to quit and permit the political knaves to swarm over the field of anti-rent as thick and pestilential as the frogs of Egypt. His high-flown editorial had some effect— a general meeting was called on the Helderbergs to demand the reopening of nominations. Ira Harris was too close to victory to permit this defiance, however, and when the meeting assembled, all efforts of the anti-Harris farmers to speak were drowned by the blaring of a band. On October 22nd, the rebellious nucleus held an uninterrupted meeting in Albany City Hall and organized all the progressive forces for a free soil ticket, which was unwittingly to pioneer for Martin Van Buren's third and unsuccessful campaign for the presidency in 1848. The Free Soil Convention was hopelessly late for the 1846 campaign, but its resolutions bespoke the rising anger of an independent yeomanry. The new party aimed to draw all honest patriots from the humbuggery, conservatism, and demagogism of the old parties, it called for abrogation of the feudal leases, freedom of the public domain, and laws equalizing the rewards of labor. Hugh Scott, who was elected president of the convention, traced the history of anti-rentism, which he said had not only vindicated its right to be heard, but combined within it a power capable of changing the political destiny of the state. This had no sooner been realized than men who traffic in votes set on foot a conspiracy by which they hoped to turn anti-rentism into the dry channel that leads to their own political mill. The plotters, he asserted, never came among the farmers, never assisted them, never spoke or wrote a word in their favor, until they were tempted by the advantage to themselves and their party. For governor, the Free Soilers nominated the pamphleteer, socialist, and utopian Louis Mascarier, and for his running mate, William Chaplin, an abolitionist. Thomas Schaefer was nominated to oppose Ira Harris for state senator. A dirt farmer, Schaefer had done able work as an anti-rent assemblyman in the last session of the legislature, but Harris had pushed him aside because he would not turn Whig. John J. Gallup, who two years earlier had urged a joint program of national reform and anti-rentism, was nominated for the Assembly. De Vere received a token Assembly nomination, but he spent his time campaigning for Gallup and Schaefer, who, with their Democratic support, had some chance of success. Harris launched the campaign by reaching down into Columbia County to have John Evans removed as editor of the Equal Rights Advocate, this drives the last nail in Devereism and disorganization, wrote Evans's successor, a Whig. Fears once entertained are banished now. The anti-rent party is safe. Yes, answered Devere in the anti-renter, safe to be used as a lever for their own destruction. Ira Harris unblushingly played a dual role in the campaign. In the up-rent districts, he assured the voters that inside and out he was nothing but a Whig but in down-rent towns he was a thorough anti-renter. The freeholder, finding it harder and harder to defend the nomination of John Young, finally admitted that he was no anti-renter, but only less objectionable than Silas Wright. 
Quite aware that the free soil ticket could make only the weakest showing, and trying desperately to head off a Harris victory, Thomas DeVere made the error which has tripped up many a reformer. He allowed his wish to best the enemy within the anti-rent party to become stronger than his determination to defeat its outright opponent. For some time he held to his stand that a vote for Silas Wright and company would be as damaging to the tenant cause as a vote for John Young. But later he began to fill the columns of the anti-renter with letters supporting Wright. Many, published without an identifying signature, bore the unmistakable imprint of his own phraseology. One such letter assured his readers that Young would not be any more likely to free the prisoners than Wright, not at all so likely. Mr. Young can only exist by the backing and support of a very aristocratic body of men in New York. If these men say no, as they will say, Mr. Young would not dare to set one of them free. Mr. Wright, on the contrary, is a man of such influence as to be able in some degree to lead his party, and if he determines to act in this matter, there will exist no power behind the throne greater than the throne itself." Toward the end of the bitter fight, De Vere frankly asked for votes for Silas Wright. If John Young and the Slate are successful, this journal goes down, he wrote. If John Young and the Slate are beaten, down goes that skulking, knavish freeholder. Horace Greeley observed in the Tribune that Thomas De Vere, aided by extreme radicals, was doing his utmost to re-elect Silas Wright, by holding anti-rent meetings to denounce and execrate John Young. Greeley, who roamed the fields of radicalism at will during the off months, but regularly returned to the Whig fold at election time, described De Vere as a well-known and thorough agrarian, and the freeholder as moderate. He neglected to say, as he once had, that De Vere's was the only reliable anti-rent paper, or that he himself was an agrarian, and had told De Vere and Beauvais informally that he favored the Free Soil Party. Ira Harris, who alone stood in the way of such a party, was at the moment, in Greeley's estimation, one of the purest and ablest men in the state, and one of the truest and wisest of our statesmen. De Vere answered Greeley by denying that he was campaigning to secure the triumph of right, unless spelt R-I-G-H-T, he was doing it for the purpose of effecting all I may under the circumstances to avert the consequences of the vile treachery and corruption that has been practiced. As he ranged the manor towns, battling against Whiggery, everywhere he found resentment against John Young and Ira Harris. But Young's promise of pardon for the prisoners was too strong an argument. From Delhi, the classic ground of log-pen prisons and pitchfork guards, De Vere sent his last appeal to the Helderberg farmers. Men of the mountain towns, I feel lonely and almost sad when I reflect that I am among strangers, that I am not where I can grasp the hand of an old fellow soldier in every man I meet, as I could do when I was among you. But we will meet again, meet before long, meet as brothers, once, certainly. But remember that whether we continue to meet and commune together and labor together, will depend upon your action at the ballot-box. Things may so shape themselves in this county that I will not be able to meet with you before the election. Lest they should, I will write down what I think the honor of yourself and the good of the cause demand. Mr. Lawrence Van Dusen, Mr. Valentine Treadwell, and Mr. Robert Watson have each of them done things which they should not have done, but after all their faults are of a venal nature compared to the deep plottings that stole the freeholder, that tried to dress us all up in a dish to be swallowed by John Young. But the issues were hopelessly confused for the average tenant. Readers of the political press found them none too clear either. In New York City the Whig papers damned Silas Wright as an anti-renter, with equal disregard for fact, the Democratic press laid the identical lash to John Young. As defeat loomed, the Democratic journals found themselves in the ridiculous position of castigating the Harris faction as radicals who had encouraged tenant rioting in the face of opposition from Thomas Ainge de Vere, 
who the Democrats now found, had zealously urged the mitigation of the evils of the leasehold system without violence, bloodshed, or anarchy. An editor of the strongly Democratic Brooklyn Eagle, Walt Whitman, though himself the son of hardy farmers, called the anti-renters the most violent faction which has disgraced the state since laws were heard of in this hemisphere. It was the duty of true patriots to vote for Silas Wright, uphold the dignity of the law, and defeat the Whigs, who were openly in the field with a candidate whose hope and success mainly depends upon his supposed sympathy with a spirit of social disorganization and rebellion. John Young had been chosen to win the votes of this mammon of unrighteousness. Let the people of the state themselves judge, Whitman urged, whether the Indians shall again rise with their fiendish cries, their fires blaze forth anew, and the blood of legal functionaries again be shed. The future good gray poet was not yet ready to say, as he did later, that the true American freeman holds in reserve forever a stern power, which, though it lie asleep for scores and fifties of years, because no occasion compels it, must never be given up altogether. If you want to know what it is, I will tell you in plain terms, it is the iron arm of rebellion." With his wife by his side, Governor Wright received the election reports at the home of a friend in Albany. As the returns swelled against him, his companions could detect in his round, florid face not the least appearance of mortification or disappointment. It was a complete rout for Silas Wright. The Tower of Strength of 1844 fell before John Young's majority of more than 11,000. The defeat was even more humiliating to Wright, because Addison Gardiner, his running mate, who was endorsed by the anti-renters, won by 13,000 votes, polling 9,000 more than Young, who headed the winning Whig ticket. It was not the Whig party that won the election, but the anti-renters, and with the exception of John J. Gallup, a Devere man, Harris picked anti-renters at that. Harris himself was elected to the state Senate, and John Slingerland to Congress, but there was no real Whig majority in the state. In Albany, after the election, former Governor Seward wrote in his journal, "'Today I have been at St. Peter's, and heard one of those excellent discourses of Dr. Potter. There was such a jumble of wrecks of party in the church that I forgot the sermon, and fell to moralizing on the vanity of political life.' Well halfway down the west aisle sat Silas Wright, wrapped in a coat so tightly buttoned to the chin, looking all philosophy, which is hard to affect and harder to attain. On the east side sat Daniel D. Barnard, upon whom anti-rent had piled Ossa, while Pelion only has rolled upon Wright. In the middle of the church was Croswell, hunker editor of the Argus, who seemed to say to Wright, You are welcome to the gallows you erected for me. On the opposite side sat John Young, the saved among the lost politicians. He seemed complacent and satisfied. Silas Wright may have looked all philosophy, but his experience had been bitter. He wrote to Martin Van Buren that he could say with perfect truth that he felt no shock of disappointment, but when he was asked to explain his defeat, his reply was revealingly tart. I have neither time nor disposition to speak of the causes of our overthrow, he said. The time will come when they must be spoken of. It will be a painful duty, and one which I do not want to perform. The freeholder explained it simply, in its parody, Cato's speech to Prince John. Had I but served the state with half the zeal I served thee, it would not in mine age have left me naked to mine enemies." On November 6th, Wright wrote to a political friend, I have no time to write a letter. You see we are overthrown. The papers will in due time give the public the influences which have produced this result. You will understand them when I say they were the same which defeated Mr. Van Buren in 1840. Anti-rentism became an instrument, but the conservatism of 1837-38 was the agent. I tremble for the consequences to the Union of this universal triumph of the Whigs in the state. I go to my quiet home in January, and it really seems to me that I can enjoy private life, 
freed as I shall be from the perplexities and responsibilities of public office. Amasa Bailey had kept his bargain by campaigning for Silas Wright, but when he called upon the governor at the executive chamber for his promised pardon of Dr. Boughton, Wright refused it. John Young can pardon your son-in-law, he said. Thomas DeVere was, at last, discouraged and beaten. As he had warned, he was ready to quit. It is November, and I am without resources, he wrote in his journal. I am driven to an extremity that I will not write down here. He had spent his money, his energy, his time, in a hopeless struggle to convince the farmers that they were appointed to save the Republic from oppressors. A friend in Williamsburg sent him money to carry him through, and when it was gone he wrote for more. Send me six hundred dollars or five hundred, which you please, and take the deed of that house now held in joint stock between us in Williamsburg. Not a cent came the answer. Utterly ruin yourself in the service of men who will not furnish you even with rations and ammunition to keep in the field? Strike tents. Come down here. You have worked for the public long enough. Now do something for your family. De Vere obeyed this friendly and wise summons, but not without regret. A mirage of great usefulness rose before me. If I could hold out for another year— but I had already held out so long that while it was difficult to go, it was impossible to stay. He went to Edward Lawson, a former schoolmaster from England who had been in the Chartist movement. With forty dollars from Lawson, he was off down the river just before the ice closed in, taking with him most of his printing materials. After his return to his wife and children in Williamsburg, the hardest task of his life awaited him. He had to report to the National Reform Association, those brave-hearted men struggling against the forces of conservatism and reaction. I believe I have not done the best for the national cause, in casting in my lot with the anti-renters, he told them, and it took all his courage to admit it. My expectations have not been fulfilled, and I believe I should therefore leave them. Within the next few months he was busy once more. He started the Williamsburg Morning Post, and at night lectured on land reform. Often his lectures continued from one night to another, for his opinions and his own wide experience gave him so much to say. He had not changed, and he would never swerve from his conviction that all the evils in society stemmed from land monopoly. Blind aristocrats, shallow, stupid, ignoble men— actually not knowing how base it is to riot in the excess that is extracted from a fellow creature's work, the great primal criminals of the earth, and yet not even know that you are criminals. End of chapter 20. Recording by Maria Casper. Section 21 of Tin Horns and Calico by Henry Christman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 21. The Prisoners, They Come. On New Year's Day of 1847, John Young took Silas Wright's place on Capitol Hill. The anti-renters had put the winded nag to rest, and they had a new song. "'Tis easy told, and thus tis done, they all did go for Johnny Young— Silas Wright, get out of the chair, sir, make room for honest men, sir. Get out of the way, you Silas Wright, sir, make room for Johnny Young, sir. On leaving the executive chamber, Wright revealed to his political friends his deep fear for the country now that John Young was elected. He saw little likelihood of anything but ruin ahead, a prediction in which the landed aristocracy fully agreed. The two Van Rensselaer brothers went promptly to the legislature to petition for repeal of the taxes on their leaseholds. Stephen IV protested bitterly that he had spent $135,000 to maintain and restore order since the first revolt of his tenants. The widow Mary Livingston, mistress of the estate called The Hill in Columbia County, joined the Van Rensselaers in their appeal for relief from unjust, unequal, and oppressive taxes. The lawmakers, more sensitive now to the temper of the farmers, and bolstered, perhaps, by the presence of more anti-renters among them, 
were not so moved by special pleadings as they might once have been. In desperation, Stephen Van Rensselaer slashed his selling price to a dollar an acre, but there was little response to his offer. The Albany County tenants still hoped for a complete victory. In Schoharie County, William H. Seward's friend, John A. King, bowed to progress and set free one of the anti-rent strongholds. On January 6, 1847, he accepted a joint proposal whereby the farmers on Blenheim Hill became the owners of 15,000 acres for a cash settlement of $25,000. In sharp contrast, the Livingstons stubbornly refused to accept defeat. Downriver from Albany, they renewed their efforts to rekindle violence. Charles Livingston sent deputies from Hudson to Taconic to sell Calvin Finkel's cattle for unpaid rent. When the cautious farmers refused to resist the sale, the deputy sheriff dressed six of his own party as Indians so that he could go to press with reports that the farmers were again resisting the law in disguise. When this device failed, Charles Livingston imported four strong-arm men from New York City to lick the Finkels, Calvin, Peter, and John. With his attorney, Edward P. Cowles, who in 1844 had served the landlords in Hudson as captain of the Light Guards, Livingston rode out to Taconic to see that his mercenaries did a thorough job for the $200 he was paying them. Calvin Finkel was at dinner when Livingston's four ruffians stormed into his house, guns drawn. If you make a move, we'll blow you through. Muscles hardened in Calvin's broad shoulders as he pushed back his chair and rose to his feet, ignoring the gun muzzles. Get out of here, you, he roared. As he started toward them, Livingston's men fired wildly. Finkel was wounded slightly in the arm, but he charged them, and, joined by his brothers, made a sorry sight of the invaders. Mr. Livingston and company retreated at full speed, wrote one newspaper reporter, and Calvin was just behind, alone, in pursuit, on a horse without saddle or bridle, and he himself bareheaded, with a club in his hand. Livingston escaped with only a few bruises, but the press predicted that Ed Cowles, a big broad-shouldered man, would have business mending his bruises and repairing his eyes that will last a month. When the hired bullies got back to Hudson, they demanded more than the two hundred dollars Livingston had promised them. They said that Livingston had misled them by describing the Finkels as cowards, whereas actually pistols pointed at their breasts did not scare them. Calvin Finkel went down to Hudson and swore out a warrant for the arrest of Charles Livingston for assault. Instead, he and his brothers were arrested, convicted of assault by a jury on which no anti-renter could serve, and sentenced to three years in Sing Sing prison. The tenants were outraged at such a penalty for fighting in self-defense. Lords, pomp, wealth, and politics were arraigned against them, and everything common or humble and justice and even decency were lost sight of, reported the freeholder. Charles Livingston departed hastily for New York City, beyond the reach of Finkel's warrant. Weeks later, when he returned to his manor, a constable who was sympathetic to the farmers made a vain attempt to take him prisoner as he was out walking with Joseph D. Monell, the lawyer. "'God damn you!' shouted Monell, his hand on his gun. "'If you put your hands on him again, I'll kill you on the spot.' Up in Albany, an anti-renter sat down and wrote for the freeholder. We had hoped that the Hudson clique had been dispersed, but if one half we hear is true— no wonder Hudson decreases in population and respectability. Think of this, ye Millers and Monells. Monell was described as a leech who had sucked all the substance out of the tenants. He looks upon labor with contempt, and would be glad to go south where he could abuse, whip, sell, and trade in human cattle. He could not bear that a human laborer should be his equal." For months the politicians had been warning the anti-renters to suspend publication of their newspapers. Up-renters in Delaware County even tried to force the courts to suppress the aggressive voice of the people, 
which had been published in Delhi since 1845. Now, pushed by their defeat at the polls, the politicians raided the newspaper office and scattered the type on the floor in the vain hope of destroying its influence. The farmers suspected that these new provocations were designed to divert John Young from his pre-election promise to free the anti-rent prisoners, and when the new governor's first message to the legislature ignored anti-rentism, they began to fear that Thomas DeVere was right, and they had been blindly led into the great maw of Whiggery. Their concern mounted as Thurlow Weed's evening journal tried to show that Young could have been elected without anti-rent support. Other Whig papers adopted the Weed line and attacked the anti-renters' malignity of feeling toward those who are invested with certain rights, appealing to its own masses by the fraudulent hope of obtaining without consideration the property of another and offering its vote in solid column to the highest bidder. To prove that anti-rentism was still militant, the farmers deluged Governor Young with petitions demanding freedom for the prisoners. Although drawn up on a few days' notice, they bore 11,000 signatures. Jolted from his political timidity, Young sat down and wrote a message ordering the pardons. Every enlightened government meets out punishment solely upon the principle that it shall be sufficient to remove the danger, he wrote pointing out that the anti-renters had already been more severely punished than anyone in any American state for offenses of a similar nature and degree. Amnesties for political offenses are so frequent and harmonize so well with the sentiments of actual justice and the principles of enlightened policy that they are always approved by mankind and there is no measure of censure for governments which refuse them when the danger which threatened has passed. The governor did not have to defend his action, for the public rose in almost unanimous approval. Horace Greeley called it a great liberal move, and in Washington the Democrats were frankly annoyed that Silas Wright had left an act so wise, humane, and politic to a Whig. Few sympathized with Martin Van Buren's alarm over the debauchery of the public mind that permitted them to bear without apparent shock the pardon of people convicted of the darkest crimes. The time has, I hope, never been, wrote the former president, when my mind would not have revolted at the mere contemplation of such dealings with such subjects. This was Martin Van Buren writing for the record, for posterity, and not Martin Van Buren, the ambitious politician, who had sent discreet men into the manor towns to pledge that the Democrats would free the prisoners if the tenants would help re-elect Silas Wright. The fourteen men in Clinton prison on the northern rim of the Adirondacks had been exuberant when their friends smuggled in newspapers reporting the election of John Young. They had waited expectantly for him to take office, and then for his message to the legislature— when the message failed to mention the pardons, the prisoners gave way to despair. One day, toward the end of January, a friendly guard spoke to William Brisbane. "'Brisbane, why do you look so sad?' he asked. "'Because there's no word yet? Keep up your heart. Two weeks from today you are a free man.' Word sped through the prison, but the men were afraid to let themselves hope again. The next Sunday, as Brisbane lay in bed reading a lecture on agriculture— word reached them that the pardons had arrived, and also a four-horse sleigh to take them home. I thought I was philosopher enough to listen to such intelligence without feeling any extraordinary emotion, Brisbane wrote, so I lay down again to read, but to lie was impossible, so I got up still trying to read, but the thought of freedom, of meeting again with my wife, my children, my friends, all crowded upon my mind in such rapid succession that my feelings fairly overpowered me, and I burst into tears. On the first day of February, the anti-renters were called to the prison office to receive their pardons. I blush to write the word, wrote Brisbane. As a pardon, I could have trampled it beneath my feet, for a pardon implies previous guilt. But as an act of justice, I respected it. John Young had kept his promise, in part. 
but his pardon failed to restore citizenship to Smith Boughton, Moses Earl, Edward O'Connor, and John Van Steenburg, who had all been disenfranchised because they had received a life sentence. And now even Ira Harris could not calm the farmer's anger. His own mouthpiece, the freeholder, was forced to admit that the governor's motives were suspect. We do not like this halfway work. It looks as if the governor was not quite sure he was right, and shrunk from the anticipated censure and clamor. When you are doing a good thing, you lose credit by doing it partially and grudgingly. When the prison gates opened after the long confinement, the prisoners were turned out, without hat, cap, or handkerchief, and without mittens. It was the dead of winter, and without the caps and cotton handkerchiefs furnished by a friend, Jack Frost would have sent us home minus our ears. Four dancing greys started the happy men on their way. By way of variety after our incarceration, reported Brisbane, the driver upset us in a snowbank. We all got up in good humor, shook the snow from our locks, and started off again more jovial than ever. As the horses trotted across the ice of Lake Champlain, the moon rose and threw her mellow light around them. Brisbane remembered it as one of the finest scenes he had ever witnessed. All the way through Vermont, the anti-renters were warmly and kindly received. Dr. Boughton, who left the party at Troy to be driven to his home at Alps, was touched as the people greeted him with ovations and rejoicing. He was soon reunited with his young wife and little son, and then triumphantly welcomed by the farmers east of the Hudson. At a meeting in Churchtown on the Livingston Manor, the farmer's spokesman hailed with gladness the return of our friend and brother, the advocate of the tenants, a benefactor of equal rights, and a redeemed martyr to the anti-rent cause. Boughton responded with what the secretary described as more than his usual eloquence. I have endured mental agony and physical pain, he told them. My limbs have been shackled. My body has been confined to the cold and narrow cell. I have been exhibited to the gaze of others as a monster in human form. My body has been debilitated. Yet my feelings are the same, my sympathies the same. My mind is unshaken in the belief that the cause is founded on the immutable principle of justice. Speedy and sure retribution not only awaits my persecutors, but the enemies of the cause those who have robbed the masses of their natural inheritance by monopolizing the earth. The rest of the returning prisoners crossed the Hudson to Albany, where they were greeted jubilantly by the farmers who swarmed down from the Helderbergs. The next morning anti-renters brought teams to carry the freed men to Young's Hotel in Clarksville, where a public dinner had been arranged. Although the morning was bitterly cold, crowds from the hill farms assembled in the road three miles below Clarksville. When the prisoners drove up at eleven, the farmers gave a tremendous outburst of hearty congratulation in three times three, as never before made the welkin ring or the vault of heaven resound. In Clarksville, under the brow of the Helderbergs, the main street was so densely thronged that the crowd had to be pushed back to make a path for the horses. The prisoners climbed out amid deafening shouts and soul-stirring music from the Burn Brass Band. Young's Hotel was gay with color, and a festive table spanned the long room. Dr. William Holmes greeted the returned men. We bid you welcome. Ah, how poor is language to express the joy, the proud exultation we feel at again meeting you, hearing your voices and grasping your hands. You are returning after a long incarceration to your families, your firesides, and your friends, not as in ordinary cases of liberated convicts covered with infamy, objects to be pointed at and shunned, but as innocent sufferers in the sacred cause of human rights. Your fellow citizens rush to embrace you, and shouts of joy proclaim your passage. The almighty voice of public opinion hath proclaimed aloud, Set them free! and you are free. What more triumphant vindication of your honor, or condemnation of the injustice of your sentence, can you require? The people have prevailed, and today, while we are rejoicing, our oppressors are sitting in sackcloth and ashes. 
deem not yourselves unfortunate that you have suffered. The car of reform, in its onward progress, has drawn many a victim. You hath it prostrated, but thank God not crushed. You survive, and your names shall live and go down to posterity, and be remembered and cherished as household words, when land barons shall long have been extinct and forgotten. May your return be as joyous as your departure was sad, and may your future years be crowned with every success and with every blessing, and may we soon see the final consummation of all our labors and sufferings in the complete expulsion of the last relic of feudal tyranny from the soil. Cheers rose from the crowd that pressed into the dining hall and spilled out into the street, and the prisoners enjoyed the festive dinner amid good cheer, conversation, sentiment, jokes, and music. "'Twill be a long time ere we see its like again," the secretary noted in his report. The sun moved toward the snowy domes of the Catskills. Sleighs were brought to the hotel door, and the procession escorted the former prisoners four miles up the Helderbergs to Reedsville, over the same road that Sheriff Archer and his citizen army had traveled in 1839. At the spot where Archer was turned back by the anti-renters, leave was taken with full heart on the part of the prisoners and benisons on that of the multitude. At Prattsville, in the upper Schoharie Valley, Colonel Zadok Pratt, who as congressman and neighbor had befriended the tenants, came to greet them. He ordered dinner for all, paid the bill, and when the party was ready to leave, sent a four-horse team to take them down the valley. It was late evening when they reached Roxbury. William Brisbane was anxious to go on over the mountain to Dingle Hill that night, but the townspeople insisted on his staying over till morning, refusing to let him steal home in the night like a thief or a robber. The next morning, when a four-horse team started for Andes, others fell in behind all along the road. Oh, how my heart beat, wrote Brisbane, as I listened to the wild music of the mountain streams of Delaware. About four miles from Andes, the horse train was met by two men on horseback, who had been sent out as heralds to tell the returning men that their friends were on the way to meet them. As they were speaking, the flags came into sight, Brisbane reported, while we heard the shout both loud and long, The prisoners, they come! Our meeting can be more easily imagined than described. Dozens of hands were held out to shake at once, and dozens of voices all inquiring at once after our welfare. Hats waved in the air, the very horses pranced and snorted with joy, the sun shone bright and clear, and woodpeckers with their gay plumage decked the withered trees like so many blossoms lent by the hand of nature to make the scene around us harmonize with our feelings. The procession formed, or rather continued forming all the way to the village, for we came upon them entirely unexpected. That day when we drove up to Hilton's hotel, a perfect forest of arms were held out to receive us. I threw myself into the midst of them, and if I came very near being choked by prejudice in Delhi, I came very near being suffocated by caresses in Andes. The first burst of joy being over, we went up into the large room of the tavern, where I, in my homely way, delivered a short address to my townsmen. After this welcome, William Brisbane left the party for the four-mile trip up Dingle Hill, in gallant style, with a four-horse team accompanied by horsemen with banners. I hope you will spare me the delicate task of describing my meeting with my family, otherwise than by saying that I found them all well, with the exception of my wife, Brisbane wrote to Hoag. Her troubles had borne hard upon her, and the excitement of the moment had thrown her into a high fever. But thank God she is now enjoying good health. Thus I was restored to my family after eighteen months' imprisonment. The story of the reunion of Edward O'Connor and Janet Scott may be apocryphal, but people in Bovina Valley, including their daughter-in-law, tell it as fact. They relate that in the first week of March, Janet reluctantly went down to Bovina to celebrate the homecoming of the anti-renters from Clinton Prison. The men in Sing Sing had not returned, and there was no news from Edward. Janet, disconsolate, struggled to keep back the tears as she watched the joy of her neighbors. 
as the festivity reached its height, a rich voice sounded loud over the laughter. Her beauteous form and humble mien, so rarely found, so rarely seen, lights all my soul with fire. When Janet recognized the song as Edward's farewell, her tears of sorrow turned to tears of joy. She pressed forward to the door as he came in singing. The party had already been arranged when the anti-renters of Bovina got word that Edward O'Connor and John Van Steenberg were on their way home, but they had kept the news a secret to surprise Janet. John was unable to join the festivities, for his health and mind were in a much impaired state, and the mention of the Delhi jail would set him in tremors. When the first tints of green lightened the drab winter brown of the Catskills, Warren Scudder, who had led the Indians at the Earl Riot, could no longer stay away from his family and the Roxbury Hills. On an early April day, two men sighted him walking toward his home, and remembering the reward offered for his capture, demanded his surrender. "'I am on my way to see my family,' Scudder said. "'I will report to you on Monday.' The men became insistent, and so Scudder drew a gun. "'I will never be taken alive now,' he said grimly. "'But if you permit me to go and see my family, I give you my word of honor I will surrender.' They had to let him go. Scudder sent word to the district attorney and the sheriff that he was home and ready to stand trial. They ignored him then, but the following fall, when he attended the anti-rent political convention in Bloomville, he was promptly arrested on the old charge of murder and lodged in jail. However, as soon as his friends insisted on an immediate trial and a complete airing of the case, the charge was dropped, and he was released for good. Former Governor Silas Wright left Albany and went back to his little farm in Canton, where he enjoyed the returning spring, the quiet beauty, and sweet fragrance of the flowers, for him, flowers were strikingly emblematic of human life. All bloom and fade and die. In June, he worked in his garden, leaning on his hoe to talk with the neighbors. Every day and every hour, he was glad to be relieved of public cares, perplexities, and responsibilities. In midsummer, he completed a speech for the New York State Agricultural Society. He saw the future of agriculture as full of cheering promise and the safest repository of freedom and free institutions, he declared, was a well-educated, industrious, and independent yeomanry. He never delivered this message, for he died suddenly in late August, 1847. Walt Whitman wrote in the Brooklyn Eagle, We confess that we loved Silas Wright, as a true democratic friend of the people, with a love which was not exceeded by any man who ever adorned our party, not even our love and respect for Jackson. Silas Wright was a man. Alas, we fear we shall indeed never look upon his like again. He loved truth, right, and justice. Theodore Miller, one of Dr. Boughton's prosecutors, charged that the anti-renters were responsible for retiring from life a statesman of highest order because he had refused to destroy the sacredness of contracts. It is a sad commentary on the fortune of public servants that one of his high attainments and purity should be thus stricken down and the country deprived of his service by the action of a mere faction because of a strict adherence to his sense of duty. Philip Hone wrote in his now celebrated diary that he was inclined to think that the most sensible thing Silas Wright ever did was to die. As a United States senator, Hone wrote, Wright maintained a high rank, a strong debater, a bold party leader of respectable talents and tolerably honest. But as governor, he proved to the dearly beloved people that their idol was not what he was cracked up to be. End of chapter 21. Recording by Maria Casper. Section 22 of Tin Horns and Calico by Henry Christman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 22 The End of Manor Aristocracy. Despite the opposition of Dr. Boughton and other prominent anti renters, 
who had learned to suspect Harris and would never have sponsored the American Jeffreys, both Ira Harris and Amasa J. Parker were elected justices of the Supreme Court in the first judiciary election of New York State, held in June 1847. Harris had found it necessary to plead that it was vitally important to anti-renters to stand by their nominations and not let party bias or any other cause prevent their voting the whole anti-rent ticket, and in the end he had succeeded in swinging the election. By driving the last nail into Deverism, Harris had destroyed the anti-rent party as a unified political force, even though he could not eradicate Thomas Devere's influence toward national reform. Dr. Boughton was still disenfranchised, but he continued his political activities, taking the stump to tell the farmers that their war would never be won until freedom of the public lands had been guaranteed. On November 27, 1847, just as the farmers were about to go into convention, Governor John Young restored full political rights to the anti-rent leaders, for again he needed anti-rent votes. Dr. Boughton was immediately elected a delegate from Rensselaer County, but he walked out of the convention when he found that by foul play and the most damnable hypocrisy and pipe-laying, Harris's friends had wrecked the union of anti-rentism and national reform. Boughton was soon followed by most of the radical anti-renters, leaving in the Harris camp a group of farmers of stubborn will but little effective leadership. At this stage, many of the younger farmers and some of the ablest of the older anti-renters left the manor counties, feeling, like De Vere, that the cause had been betrayed by men of narrow vision and selfish interests. Smith A. Boughton was one of the few radical leaders to remain in New York State. Most of them were no longer interested in anti-rentism specifically, but only as part of a larger struggle. As Harris became more occupied with his duties as Supreme Court Justice than with the tenant's cause, the freeholder found new independence. Its editor demanded an immediate end to land speculation, which made the rich richer and the poor poorer. From local issues, the paper jumped into national politics and spoke strongly against slavery. Let us thwart the South in their darling and damnable scheme— let us humble the proud spirit of this intolerant and imperious slaveocracy. Let us, as we love liberty and hate slavery, proclaim every northern man who shall directly or indirectly promote the extension of slavery, the betrayer of his constituents and a traitor to his country and to freedom. Radical farm leaders talked equal rights and drew up a new manifesto setting forth broad objectives winnowed from many reform philosophies. We believe that all men are equal, sovereign, and independent. We believe that every man has a right to live, and consequently a right to use and enjoy the means to produce that result. We are in favor of an inalienable homestead and the freedom of the public lands to actual settlers in limited quantities. We believe that all power reposes in and emanates from the people, not the few, but all. We denounce legal and self-constituted monopolies as destructive of natural rights and at war with the true principles of social happiness. We believe it is the first duty of the people and their agencies in authority to provide for the education of all, their moral and social improvement, their happiness and prosperity not a few or a particular class, but the mass, without let or hindrance. In religion, we would be silent, enjoying our own, and permitting others to do so undisturbed. In Delhi, from the very bench where Judge Parker had demanded the heads of anti-renters, Dr. Boughton called for a combination which should be as impregnable as the rocks of Gibraltar, and which would defy the clandestine attacks of the enemies of the working class. When he finished, Edward O'Connor, now married to his Janet, rose from his seat, and from the same spot where his death sentence had been pronounced, pledged Delaware County farmers to boldly and fearlessly advocate the freedom of the public lands. 
The meeting further agreed that the Democratic and Whig parties had failed to meet the expectations of the people, and now the people were ready to form a political combination that would excel the old parties in numerical strength. Efforts to crush the last vestiges of the anti-rent party before it merged with the growing national free soil movement finally trapped the politicians. The Whigs intended to deny John Young the renomination because of his party irregularity and his anti-rent connections. Knowing this, the governor saw that his best hope of heading off political annihilation was to build a solid progressive front. He discarded his opposition to a test of title and suddenly appeared before the 1848 legislature to ask authority for the attorney general to begin legal action to recover the manors for the state unless the landlords could prove ownership. While the bill was pending, the landlords first tried ordinary lobbying methods, then reverted to old and tested tactics. Rent-collecting agents scurried over the hills, creating riot and rebellion, and then filled the press with accounts of new anti-rent outrages. Tenant violence was resumed, deputy sheriffs were shot at, tarred and feathered, and a deputy was booted out of a church on the Helderbergs when he interrupted a religious service to serve writs under orders from Stephen Van Rensselaer. George Clark, a newcomer among the landlords, who had succeeded to large tracts in Delaware, Schoharie, Herkimer, Montgomery, and Otsego counties, where he was a neighbor and good friend of James Fenimore Cooper, stated that he was willing to spend $25,000 to defeat the bill. He paid men $2 a day to solicit petitions against it. A man calls at a groggery, hands the barkeeper a dollar, tells him to treat the company all around, and then asks the boys to sign, reported the freeholder. In spite of the flurry of opposition, however, John Young again appeared to have executed a masterful coup. Politicians anxious to destroy him and anti-rentism were backed to the wall. If they refused to grant the test of title, they would provide the anti-rent leaders with the one issue which would reunite the organization, Believing the test of title was far less dangerous than the re-election of Young and a resurgent anti-rent party, they passed the bill with amazing speed, by a vote of more than two to one, and no one was more surprised than the anti-renters themselves. Most of the landlords sent forth doves of peace, offering to sell their equity in the leases at ridiculously low prices, but there was no great rush to buy. Several actions were brought by the state, and shortly after the passage of the bill, in response to pressure from the farmers, Governor Young advocated the disposal of public lands in limited quantities to actual settlers. In a report which might well have been written by DeVere or Evans, Dr. Jonathan Alaben, the Delaware County anti-renter, induced a New York State Legislative Committee to recommend the limitation of land holdings homestead exemption from debt, and freedom of the public lands. In August of that year, reformers, abolitionists, and dissident Democrats and Whigs gathered in Buffalo to unite in a national free soil party behind the candidacy of Martin Van Buren. The radical elements wrote the party platform. Van Buren was to swing the barn burners into line. Although Van Buren was cautious in his commitments, he ran on a platform calling for free land grants to settlers. But owing to his fundamental lack of conviction on the issue, the free soil ticket was foredoomed to defeat, and Thomas DeVere accused those impostors at Buffalo of stealing the very name that his party had used in 1846 in opposing Wright and Young. Knowing that they could not lose with the Democrats' split, the Whigs hastened to proclaim the time propitious to deal with the foul spirit of anti-rentism. John Young was dropped, and reaction climbed swiftly back into the saddle of Whiggery. Hamilton Fish was put up for governor, and a Whig spokesman predicted, This fall's election will annihilate the anti-rent party. We shall have no more trouble from them. John Slingerland, too, paid dearly for supporting anti-rentism and free farms. The Whigs discarded him, and he suffered a political eclipse for some years. 
On the advice of Samuel J. Tilden, the tenants brought an independent suit to test the legality of the quarter sale reservation in the leases, and it reached the Supreme Court. In 1850, Justice Amasa J. Parker held the quarter sales unconstitutional. On the heels of that decision, Justice Ira Harris ruled the Van Rensselaer title invalid, with the full session of the Supreme Court concurring. Manor aristocracy was tottering. The landlords proposed, without success, that the state appropriate $250,000 a year for two years to pay them for their rights in the leases. In 1852, they tried to appeal from Judge Parker's decision, but the Court of Appeals upheld it in a unanimous opinion written by Justice Charles Ruggles, who, like Parker, had long been a bitter critic of anti-rentism. Judge Ruggles's opinion found the quarter sales still legal in leases drawn up before the Revolution, but illegal in any lease after 1787, the year when the state had outlawed restraints on the transfer of title. In the belief of many, this decision established the tenants as the owners of their land, for if the quarter sale was invalid, then the transfer of a lease was legally a sale, and subsequent rents were invalid. William P. Van Rensselaer's counsel for the East Manor admitted that the contest was ended. The anti-renters are proved to have been right in their hostility to the system. I do not regret their success, for it is, after all, another step in human progress. Josiah Sutherland, long a lawyer for the Livingstons, considered the decision a legitimate close to the anti-rent controversy. But the last bolts of the landlords had not been shot. There were still legal loopholes. A Court of Appeals decision reversed the Harris invalidation of the Van Rensselaer title, pointing to a landlord-sponsored statute of 1830, which specified that land titles had to be questioned within 40 years. The Court also ruled that, conceived in fraud or not, the ownership of the feudal estates was safe from question, so long as that 1830 statute remained in effect. This decision threw the whole issue of title into the field of controversy again. In the minds of many lawyers, however, it did not help the landlord's position, because the decision of 1852 confirming the tenants as the owners of the soil stood unchallenged. Stephen Van Rensselaer IV was ready to surrender. When he offered the West Manor to speculators, Many of the leases were bought by Walter Church, son of a wealthy landowner of western New York, who was related to the Schuylers. Church paid an estimated $210,000, gambling on a substantial profit before the grave of feudalism was finally dug. At forty, hard, tall, with the dark skin and the rugged features of an Indian, Church began to move in the best political circles, as the new owner of a great estate, he was carefully devising means of turning his speculative investment to vast profits, on the assumption that legislators, judges, and even governors could be bought. Church's handbills flooded the West Manor, where he owned many leases, and the East Manor, where he acted as agent, declaring that all who did not arrange to settle back rents and all who contested payment would be charged a sum which at 6% interest would produce the rent, making a difference of one-fourth in the cost of a release. The handbill informed the tenants that he was going to sue immediately and indiscriminately for all rents in arrears, having waited until every question of title raised by honest doubts or dishonest demagogues had been settled. Now decide whether you will settle your rents without cost or purchase your releases at an honest rate, or be fooled by politicians, pay heavy bills of cost, and 25% additional for your soil. Many farmers compromised, discouraged by the long and confusing struggle, but some hard-willed men who had talked over their dinner tables with Thomas DeVere ten years earlier would never be browbeaten into submission. After Lawrence Van Dusen's death in 1852, the mantle of leadership of the Helderberg farmers fell on Peter Ball of Bern, a small man, quick of action and speech, who wore his snow-white hair in long flowing locks. 
Ball was stubbornly determined to see justice done, even if he lost the harvest of his life's toil, and many a farmer was seared by his contempt for anyone who let himself be intimidated. He flatly refused to pay rent, informing Church that under the decision of 1852, Stephen Van Rensselaer IV had sold him the land, not leased it. I have no obligation to pay rent, he insisted. I am not a tenant. Church brought court action against him, and the weeks preceding election found his agents working feverishly with well-lined pockets for Judge So-and-so. I don't care who else is elected, Church said. In the meantime, his home in Albany became the meeting place of judges and politicians. He spent lavishly, and his efforts were well rewarded in 1858, when the Supreme Court, including Justice Ira Harris, ruled against Peter Ball, and the decision was sustained by the Court of Appeals. Both courts reaffirmed the 1852 decision, which outlawed the quarter sales, reiterating that the land was not leased but sold, and that Ball was not a tenant. However, they argued, in 1805, the legislature had realized the imposition of rents as a condition in a contract of sale. The rents were therefore legal. This reasoning, said Andrew Colvin, a tenant lawyer, shocked the public conscience. But if the tenants were bewildered and the public shocked, Walter Church was neither. Evidence adduced at a later investigation indicated that he knew what the decision was going to be, and on the strength of advance information he had bought the East Manor leases from William Van Rensselaer to add to his previous holdings. The highest price paid, Alexander Johnson revealed in a pamphlet, had not exceeded twenty-five cents on the dollar, and the lowest had been down to five. Our courts, he went on, have been not merely ignorant, inconsistent, they have been guilty of injustice and judicial robbery. He pointed out that in 1850, Ira Harris had written an opinion denying that rent could be due without privity of contract or estate, but after resuming amicable relations with Van Rensselaer, he decided that a rent might hang upon a single vendition. Johnson had had his own day at playing politics with anti-rentism between 1845 and 1848, when he was editing the Freeholder as Harris's agent, but now, as he turned on his old political ally, he was not alone. His position on the Supreme Court decision was supported by many able lawyers in books, pamphlets, and newspaper articles. Some newspapers charged that there had been political and financial manipulation of the decision. The tenants might have expected such a decision from some of the Supreme Court justices. One was notoriously a friend of speculators and landlords, elected by no-nothing effervescence. But Ira Harris's stand needed some explanation. A likely clue was disclosed by Alexander Johnson. Not long after the decision, Justice Harris sailed to Europe on the same boat with Stephen Van Rensselaer. Perhaps it was also significant that Harris never returned to the bench, but after a year abroad turned to national politics. The decisions of the Supreme Court and the Court of Appeals, however arrived at, proved of little help to Walter Church. The farmers still refused to pay, and vigorously petitioned the legislature to repeal the 1805 Act, legalizing rents as a condition in a contract of sale. Church, pressed for money and aiming at political results, took on three partners, Peter Kagger, James Kidd, and Dean Richmond, Richmond was chairman and Kagger was secretary of the New York State Democratic Committee. In 1845, Kagger had been one of the political strategists who, with John Van Buren and Michael Hoffman, had helped map Wright's suicidal program against anti-rentism. Alexander Johnson charged that all three belonged to a class of men whose business it was to hang around the Capitol and manipulate legislators, they bought under belief that courts and judges can be influenced by the arts and appliances that influence legislators. We do know that the sale of the Van Rensselaers has brought around our courts and in close companionship with our judges men who have boasted of owning senators and buying legislators. 
Church's lobbying efforts failed to check the rising sentiment for the repeal of the Act of 1805, however, and finally he reverted to the old method of violence. He tried to get up another anti-rent commotion and panic the public with bold-faced type. Another anti-rent outrage. On February 17, 1860, while the legislature was still discussing the repeal, he rode to the home of Peter Ball at the head of a large posse. The day was cold and blustery, and snow swept across the Helderbergs. Church led the posse into the house and drove Ball and his family out into the storm, a wife, a son, a sick daughter, and an old colored woman known as Sook. The household effects, the winter's supply of fuel, and the cattle feed were thrown into the highway to be sifted and raked by the wind and the snow. Although nearly five hundred farmers were looking on, they uttered no complaint and made no resistance, for they knew that Church wanted a riot so that he could carry a few anti-renters to the Capitol in chains to convince the legislature. The farmers exhibited great forbearance under this great provocation, and when Church left, they quickly set to work to re-establish Ball in his home. In the legislature, John Slingerland, again in politics after a period of oblivion, took the floor and told how Walter Church's demands on Ball had risen from one hundred and fifty to nine hundred dollars. The sum would have been paid, he said, had it been just. On the most inclement day that has been experienced during this past winter, the sheriff and his posse proceeded to the residence of Mr. Ball. Some idea may be formed of the state of the weather and of the propriety and humanity of executing process at such a time when it is stated that the sheriff and some of his party returned with frost-bitten cheeks. The Ball family was left exposed upon the highway to the tender mercies of a driving snowstorm. I ask you, in the name of freedom, in the name of humanity, Will you permit a similar scene to be enacted? The Act of 1805 was promptly repealed, and Church began his legal struggle all over again. Walter Church did not allow the outbreak of the Civil War in the spring of 1861 to turn him aside from the pursuit of profit. He was a leader in the strong Copperhead faction in Albany, which included many prominent Democrats, and since most of the younger farmers and sons of the old anti-renters were away fighting for the Union, his best course was to dispose of anti-rentism before the war ended. In this phase of his efforts, Church relied on his partner, the state Democratic boss Dean Richmond, who had advanced him money and expected to be repaid out of the profits from the manor properties. In 1863, tenant leaders told the farmers that Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation liberates you just as certainly from your servitude as it liberated the slaves of the South from theirs. But Judge Henry R. Selden of the Court of Appeals, an old and intimate friend of Richmond, upheld the landlord's right to collect rent. He ruled that the Act of 1805 was not relevant— and relied instead on the Tenant One Act of 1846, taxing leaseholds and abolishing distress sales for unpaid rent. Although Stephen IV was no longer legally a landlord, Selden ruled the 1846 Act entitled him to collect rents. As in many cases in our courts between parties similarly situated, he wrote, they have been spoken of and treated as landlords and tenants, and the decisions in the cases can be sustained on no other ground, as they depend entirely upon a statute applicable only to parties holding that relationship. In other words, countered a legal analyst, the parties in the case were not landlord and tenant, and cannot be landlord and tenant, but the court speaks of them and calls them such, and the court of appeals must so speak of them, or it cannot affirm the judgments, and for the purpose of affirming the judgments, it does and will call them landlord and tenant. Alexander Johnson wrote, We are free to say that we think judges and courts need watching as closely as legislators. Judges and senators have been bribed for gold. What chance has the poor and isolated farmer in litigation against the combination of speculators who can draw on Dean Richmond for money, 
and who can employ in their cause the plausible and winning approaches of Kidd, the pertinacious manipulations of Cagger, and the unblushing impudence of Church. Selden's support launched Church on a ruthless military campaign to crush anti-rent opposition. He elected his friend Henry Fitch as sheriff, had Peter Cagger named legal adviser to the sheriff, and secured his control of law enforcement by obtaining for himself the colonelcy of the National Guard. In 1865, without authority from the governor, Colonel Church ordered the troops to the Helderbergs, traveling in a caravan of wagons, some loaded with pork, beef, hams, bread, crackers, cheese to eat, and beers and liquors generally to drink. Peter Ball was again ejected, and his family and furniture piled into the road. This time old Sook, the negro servant, refused to budge, but sat transfixed in a Boston rocker. Four soldiers had to carry her into the road, chair and all. Taking over the house as his headquarters, Church directed raids against other farmers, forcing the tenants to sign and pay at the point of a gun. When the guardsmen were not raiding, they were drinking, carousing, and singing. We hated Church like poison, said the wife of an anti-renter. It finally got so he was scared to come up here, because they shot through his plug hat and another time through his buggy seat. Although Church was omnipotent in Albany, on the return of the troops, the Albany Express remarked that the people were shocked that the Democratic Party leaders in the state, whatever they might do to the black, would use the militia to make serfs of the white race for the mere love of gain. As the months passed, more and more farmers gave in, but old anti-renters like Peter Ball, William H. Gallup, and Robert Hayes still held grimly to their principles, calling their weaker neighbors copperheads and secessionists from anti-rentism. Friends were pitted against friends. Anti-renters rode in the dark, intimidating their neighbors. Men who paid rent were in constant danger. One night, five barns were burned on property from which Church had ejected the tenants. Many a horse on the road had a clipped stub for a tail, as a symbol that its owner was a secessionist. After the war ended, on April 9, 1865, the farmers drifted back home to take up the anti-rent fight where they had left off. But this time, men who had fought side by side in the rebellion were lined up against each other. In July of the next year, Colonel Church led his army again to the Helderbergs. They are all veterans, having seen service during the war, the Albany Evening Journal reported, and understand guerrilla warfare to perfection. The progress of the army up the Helderbergs was marked by demonstrations of bitter feeling, particularly on the part of the women. Pump handles were removed, and the troops were refused drinking water. The men, however, kept comparatively calm, according to the journal, until Church himself arrived, when the sight of this object of their hatred rendered their wrath almost uncontrollable. Between seventy and eighty farmers had assembled at Peter Warner's in the town of Knox, where the first ejectment was to take place. The farmers scattered as the army approached, but Church's skirmishers worked well, and eight prisoners were taken. Shots were fired at the fleeing farmers, and at least one was wounded. Peter Warner and his family maintained the most stoical indifference in the face of the disturbance, even when Colonel Church and his soldiers broke into the house. Church told Warner that if the process were executed against them, they would lose all their crops, the produce of three hundred acres in the highest state of cultivation. He said they could prevent the loss by a settlement, but the Warners received the proposition with contempt and made no effort to stop the men from moving out all their furniture. Dominie Daniels, the pastor of the Lutheran Church, who occupied one side of the house, was also ejected, and his furniture and library dumped into the highway. It was a sultry July afternoon, and storm clouds began to gather swiftly. The officers volunteered to carry the furniture to any place of safety the Warners might desire, but the offer was refused with stern resolution. The thunderstorm swept over the mountain, drenching all their household goods and ruining the books. 
Ruin and desolation were never more calmly received, reported the evening journal. The most malevolent hatred seems to inspire them against Colonel Church. On the way to Albany that night, the eight prisoners and their guard made a stop for food. If it is to be paid for by Colonel Church, snarled one prisoner, a blacksmith, we will not eat a mouthful, we will starve first. All were freed the next day. The army moved into the Warner House, and for a week made thrusts against belligerent farmers in the neighborhood. When the holiday was over, the conquerors of the Helderbergs returned to Albany, looking gay and gallant as ever, but the populace did not hail them as heroes. The evening journal remarked that Colonel Church and Sheriff Fitch had spent five hundred dollars a day to intimidate the anti-renters into an acceptance of terms, rather than because it was necessary to ensure the public peace. Church made one or two additional raids during the remainder of the summer. In the fall, when the bill of more than six thousand dollars for the purpose of subduing the late unholy anti-rent war was submitted to the Albany County Board of Supervisors, including an item of one hundred and fifteen dollars for Church's personal services as colonel, the day when Church could have a militia at his call was over. After that he had to pay his own army. Walter Church could manage without the militia, however. There was an anti-renter on the East Manor named Martinus Lansing, who had a large farm worth $25,000 close to the Hudson. In 1866 he owed $800 in back rent, which Church had increased to $6,000 by tacking on legal and other expenses. Lansing paid 4000 but did not settle for the rest promptly enough to suit Church. Although he subsequently offered to pay it, the payment was refused, and Lansing and his family were ejected by a posse led by Willard Griggs, a deputy sheriff. Griggs had been an anti-renter twenty years before, but was now serving principally as an agent for church, more than ten thousand miles below contempt. The great farm, with all its buildings and other improvements put on it by Lansing's forefathers, with extensive additions and betterments by Mr. Lansing himself, wrote Andrew Colvin, anti-rent spokesman, was immediately taken possession of by the chief speculator, and he is today occupying the fine dwellings and fine barns, and planting and reaping the broad acres, and pocketing the fruits, rejoicing in the great acquisition, and making exhibitions of it to admiring friends. Martinez Lansing died of heartbreak a few years later, poor and penniless. Lansing's downfall was the final sad end of anti-rentism, observed the Troy News, who warned that the same fate awaited any farmer who resisted church. Anti-rent put itself above the law. It went into politics and was ruined, it elected governors, judges, congressmen, senators, legislators, and town and county officers, ruined the Van Rensselaers, and worried them out of their handsome estate, was petted and patronized as long as it had votes to give, and now, after long years of struggle, the law finally put its broad hand upon anti-rentism and hopelessly squelches it. But it was still not the end. There were more farmers like Martinez Lansing who would rather lose all and die than surrender their hard-earned rights. William Whitbeck, who lived near the Lansing farm east of the Hudson, was one of these. An old man, Whitbeck had been an anti-renter for nearly thirty years. He had been one of Thomas DeVere's best friends and had sided with him in the lost struggle against the political conspirators. In 1869, Church set out to acquire Whitbeck's big farm, which was valued at $15,000. After the adverse court decision, Whitbeck paid all claims, but Church found a supplementary item and presented a bill for $150, the cost of an early suit. He made no effort to collect, but explaining that Whitbeck had been contumacious and forfeited his right to the farm, he secured an ejectment order and sent Deputy Sheriff Willard Griggs to drive the farmer out. When Griggs appeared, Whitbeck offered him the $150. I can't take it, said Griggs. I have no right to take it. Whitbeck thereupon drove the deputy away. 
Still determined to get possession of the farm, Church rounded up a posse in Albany. He insisted the posse had been voluntary, but several of the seven deputies later testified that they had been forced into service and illegally taken across the river into Rensselaer County. Church trailed about a half hour behind the posse, so that he could take possession as soon as his roughs had ejected the farmer. Whitbeck met the posse at his gate, with his sons John and Benjamin at his side. He had a pistol in his hand. Whitbeck said, Griggs, I have come to take possession. I am ready to pay, replied the farmer. Before I give up the farm, you'll have to carry my dead body from the field. One of the deputy sheriffs pulled a gun, and the shooting started. William Whitbeck fell with a wound in his head. His sons opened fire, and the deputy went down with a wound in his side. A dozen farmers rushed out of hiding in the barn and sprang into action, their guns blazing. Griggs fell with five bullet wounds, another deputy was clubbed to the ground, a third dropped, and a fourth screamed as blood gushed from a bullet hole through his hand. The rest of the posse leaped the fence and fled. When church arrived, the field was clear. The wounded men had already been helped into a wagon by the tenants and hauled away. Deputy Sheriff Griggs died soon afterward. The newspapers criticized Church's illegal use of the posse, but he had his way. With the Whitbecks in jail, charged with the murder of Willard Griggs, he took possession of the farm. He did his best to shift the moral guilt from his own shoulders, but the Whitbecks were tried in Saratoga County, beyond his reach, and they were acquitted. The Whitbeck battle, bloodiest of the whole Thirty-Year War, was Church's last successful action. No more large posses moved against the farmers. He sent a few men to dispossess Palmer Gallup on the Helderbergs, but Indians came, hitched the posse to a wagon, and forced them to haul Gallup up and down to amuse the farmers, the last blood flowed in the early 1880s, during a brief but violent episode remembered today by old men of the Helderbergs. Deputy Sheriff Leonard Chamberlain was sent to East Burn to dispossess John Frederick for church. As Chamberlain jumped from his wagon, shotgun fire from Frederick's window caught him full in the body and killed him. According to farmers who saw the body, it looked like a pepper box. In Walter Church's most active period, between 1855 and 1870, he had doggedly pursued the farmers, clogging the courts with as many as 2,000 suits, without the loss of a major case. The bitter struggle, which was the longest and hardest in Rensselaerwick where it started, cost Albany County an estimated million dollars in lost trade, and men like Ball, Whitbeck, and Lansing were pauperized, but feudalism as a living institution was destroyed. Fewer and fewer names were called each year on rent day. Most landlords had settled immediately after the adverse decision of 1852, when the Van Rensselaers turned their estates over to hungry speculators. By 1880, the majority of the leases had passed into the hands of the farmers. In three of the principal anti-rent counties, 40 years after the first revolt, only 2,113 out of 12,344 farms remained under lease, including normal short-term leases made by individual owners. Despite his long success in the courts, Walter Church died in 1890 in virtual bankruptcy. The few reservations he still held were saddled with mortgages held by the banks, and individuals who had financed his gamble to turn a dying social system into a gold mine. Today, some upstate farmers still pay in cash the equivalent of the old reservations of wheat, fowls, and days' service. Many a landholder wishing to sell or take out a loan has been shocked to find that the old leases which originally bound his farm were never adjusted, and that unpaid feudal tributes amount to more than the farm is worth. But these are usually adjusted for a small fee. John Burroughs paid the de Brosses heirs $25 a year in tribute on the Burroughs homestead above Roxbury until his death in 1921, after which the farm was bought by Henry Ford. 
As early as 1860, the glories of the manor of Rensselaerwick had departed, and the family that had once assumed to be lords and hoped to perpetuate their wealth and social position had sunk in the general mass into all obscurity. William P. Van Rensselaer had spent few comfortable hours in luxurious Beaverwick on the east bank of the Hudson. In the early 1850s he had put all pretensions to lordship behind and moved to Rye, New York, where he died in 1872. When his older brother Stephen died in the manor house in Albany in 1868, the minister who attended him in his last days observed that he had never known a Christian who felt more deeply his own unworthiness. A writer in the New York World, noting the death, spoke romantically of the end of the landed aristocracy and the miserable subterfuges of the farmers who had destroyed the manor to escape from obligations of contract. End of section 22. Recording by Maria Casper. Section 23 of Tin Horns and Calico by Henry Christman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 23 Deep in the Land. Anti rent blood flows down the years and through the land. Mixing with the blood of landlords, it has helped build great American fortunes. Sons have sat upon the United States Supreme Court bench and in paneled Wall Street law offices. Some have turned the rich land of the New West to man's use, and played important parts in the politics and culture of the country. In Michigan, Illinois, Wisconsin, Minnesota, Kansas, Iowa, California, anti-rent blood is deep in the land. During their lifetime, the anti-renters did more than arrest the spread of despotic medieval landlordism. They helped, too, to save the frontier from speculators and unscrupulous capitalists. It was John Slingerland, the anti-rent congressman, who introduced the first Federal Homestead Act early in 1848, pointing out the basic interdependence of all the reform movements. An effectual bar to the progress of slavery, he said, will be found in the creation of small homesteads sufficient for the maintenance of single families and requiring not a host of slaves or laborers to cultivate. Slave labor is profitable only when it is extensively employed. Slingerland's homestead bill failed, but the issue kept national politics in turmoil for another 14 years. The fight to end land speculation and dispose of the public lands to citizens who intended to settle on them was taken up by Horace Greeley, who was elected to the House of Representatives in the fall of 1848, and William H. Seward, who went to the Senate in 1849. The two old friends also spoke frequently from the floor of Congress on the larger aspects of land reform, and kept in mind the possibilities of a new party. In 1850, the Democratic Review of New York observed, It is idle to disguise the fact that anti-rentism is but another of the isms which Mr. Senator Seward and his associates are endeavoring to engraft as an element into the constitution of a new northern and sectional party embracing all isms. The entire anti-rent vote is literally at the command of the free soil interests, how long is a lawless political organization in a few counties to be used by corrupt politicians as a tool and instrument of forwarding the fell design of abolitionism? Greeley's newspaper had gone far toward overcoming the opposition of northern industrialists, who, fearing that free soil would give labor a lever for higher wages, instinctively joined forces with southern Democrats, who realized that small independent homesteads would undermine the institution of slavery. The West, Greeley told his readers, was the predestined market. The faster the West can be settled and cultivated, the more independent and thrifty its settlers, the greater must be the demand for the products and merchandise of the seaboard states. A new state in the West implies new warehouses in and near Lower Broadway, new streets and blocks uptown, new furnaces in Pennsylvania, new factories in New England. 
A new cabin on the prairies predicts and ensures more work for carmen and stevedores in New York. Eager industrial expansionists found his words a convincing argument for homesteads. The new democratic spirit generated in the anti-rent struggle was bound to be felt far from the manor towns of New York State, as more and more of the discouraged radicals moved to the Midwest, hoping to find the newer social structure less fettered by tradition and conservatism. Albany, Rensselaer, Schoharie, Delaware, and Otsego County names began to dot the West, though few of the emigrants found the heavenly destiny of which they had dreamed. Capitalists, politicians, congressmen, judges, and cabinet members had been there before them, like hawks preying on the land, and speculators were demanding six dollars an acre for farms that had cost them next to nothing. Among those who found themselves stepping from one inequity to another were such anti-rent leaders as Alvin Bove, Edward O'Connor, William Brisbane, and Amos Loper. Not long after Bove and De Vere made their last speaking tour of the Helderbergs in 1846, Bove abandoned teaching for the bar and married Caroline Elizabeth, the daughter of his old friend and fellow reformer Ransom Smith. In his frequent visits to Greeley's Tribune office, Bove had been enthralled by the perfect western paradise described in letters from Warren Chase, leader of the Fourierist phalanx established in 1844 at Ripon, Wisconsin. On October 5, 1850, Bove arrived at Ripon to look for a home, after tramping 75 miles from Milwaukee, where he had left his family. He found Amos Loper, an anti-renter from Blenheim Hill, already settled on a fertile farm three miles north of the little settlement, having left the starved soil of Schoharie County in 1847. William Brisbane and his family had been farming for a year at Alto, 12 miles to the south. Other families from anti-rent counties were clearing new farms in the Fond du Lac region. Bove liked the vigorous, idealistic frontier spirit of Ripon. He became the settlement's first lawyer, and within a year was laying out Bove's addition to the city of Ripon, on property purchased from the phalanx, which was being dissolved. Here in this young community he satisfied ambitions that never could have been fulfilled by anti-rent barnstorming or agrarian agitation at Croton Hall and on street corners. He became a social and political force, and later helped found Ripon College to meet the educational needs of the frontier. Meanwhile, anti-rent, free soil, and anti-slavery agitation had done much to prepare the way for political realignment under a new party banner. The only spark lacking to light the fire was an issue upon which all the reform factions could unite. This issue was provided by the Kansas-Nebraska Bill, which would give the two territories the right to establish slavery at the time of organizing local government. The bill was offered in Congress by Stephen A. Douglas on January 23, 1854, and little opposition was expected. Before the end of the month, while the bill was still in the Senate, Alvin Bove took the first definite step toward establishing that new political party, which he and Devere and Evans had discussed in Williamsburg in 1844, the one which was to bear the name first used by Thomas Jefferson. First he called on his Ripon neighbor, Jedediah Bowen, who had been a lifelong Democrat, but hated slavery and was ready to forsake the party that had become its apologist. A few evenings later, in early February, Bove and Bowen rode out to Amos Loper's place and got his pledge of full support, in crystallizing the anti-slavery sentiment in Ripon. Together the three men signed a call for a meeting of all liberty-loving people of whatever party on March 1, 1854. Two days before the meeting, Bove wrote urgently to Greeley, "'Advocate calling together in every church and schoolhouse in the free states all the opponents of the Kansas-Nebraska bill, no matter what their party affiliations.' urge them to forget previous political names and organizations, and to band together under the name I suggested to you in 1852, Republican. That first day of March in 1854, 
the little congregational church of Ripon was filled with persons of both sexes from the town and surrounding country. William Brisbane was probably unable to make the twelve-mile trip in the dead of winter, for his name does not appear in the records, and he remained a Democrat. As Alvin Bove walked into the church, his thoughts must have gone back to those turbulent summers ten years before, when cheers echoed through the Helderbergs as he assured the anti-rent farmers that they would yet redeem the condition of labor, and a new progressive party would rise to power on a great fundamental truth, man's right to the soil. Now he told his Wisconsin neighbors that the time had come. The sentiment of the meeting was polled, and it was agreed that if the Kansas-Nebraska bill passed, a second meeting would be called to cut old affiliations and bring forth the new party. On March 20th, 17 days after the Senate had approved the bill, eager citizens of Ripon responded to a new call signed by Bove, Loper, and about 50 others, and met in a little white schoolhouse in Ripon for a general uprising of the North. We went into the little meeting, Whigs, Free Soilers, and Democrats, Bove reported. We came out Republicans. Here, in this frontier settlement, men who had once shaped local resistance to local oppression now shaped national political destiny. Whigs and Free Soilers dissolved their local party organizations, and a committee of five was selected to organize the Republican Party. Among them were the two former anti-renters, Bove and Loper, one a Whig, the other a Free Soiler, and Jedediah Bowen, the Democrat. The House of Representatives passed the bill on May 26, 1854, and it went immediately to President Franklin Pierce for signature. The next morning, about 30 members of the House met in Washington, discussed the situation, and decided in favor of the new Republican Party. As it rocketed to power, many persons claimed the distinction of fathering the new party, and the little Ripon meeting was dismissed as accidental. Bove protested against attempts to discredit the Ripon founders. This was no blind unconscious movement of which the human family makes so many. We did not build better than we knew, as some have supposed. We built precisely as we knew. The actors in this remote little eddy of politics thought at the time that they were making a bit of history by that solitary tallow candle in the little white schoolhouse on the prairie. In New York City, Horace Greeley failed to respond as wholeheartedly as Bove had hoped, and much nagging was needed before he finally committed the Tribune to the Republican Party in June 1854. Even then he was not sure, and expressed his misgivings in a letter to Bove. I faintly hope the time has come which Daniel Webster predicted when he said, I think there will be a North. But I am a beaten, broken-down, used-up politician, and have the soreness of defeat in my bones. However, I am ready to follow any lead that promises to hasten the day of Northern emancipation. Your plan is all right if the people are right for it. I fear they, too, generally wish that they had a good plantation and Negroes in Alabama or even Kansas. However, we will try to do what we can. But remember that editors can only follow where the people's heart is already prepared to go with them. They can direct and animate a healthy indignation, but not create a soul beneath the ribs of death. But the people's conscience had already been stirred, and in most places where republicanism took hold, man's right to the soil was proclaimed. As enthusiasm for the new party surged across the nation, New York State's obstinate anti-renters, who had refused to surrender to political intriguers, saw clearly where their interests lay. The Democrats had so flouted democracy that the Jeffersons and the Jacksons, who gave it life and living faith, should lie uneasy in their graves. It was a hard decision for many farmers who had grown up in the traditions of the Democratic Party, but eventually, in a resolution adopted at a state convention in Albany in 1866, the tenant farmers turned their backs upon the past. Friends of liberty and progress, the great Republican Party of the nation, we have no hope or expectation of relief from the Democratic Party. We expect their hostility to the last, 
and therefore leave that party to its fate, and we turn to you, you who have so steadily and persistently stood up for the cause of universal emancipation and for right. In the months preceding the presidential campaign of 1860, the Democrats failed in their last chance to rob the new party of its working-class appeal. Andrew Johnson, an agrarian Democrat, did his best to hold back the Republican tidal wave by introducing a compromise homestead bill. Thomas DeVere put out a handbill on January 1, 1860, pointing to the danger ahead if the bill failed. Unlike most reformers of the day, he refused to countenance the new party. It is because the Democratic Party of the present day have turned their backs upon the great principle of democracy that they find themselves in their present position, for this is the true source of the preponderance of the Republican power in the northern states. But the retribution may still be averted by doing justice, even now at the eleventh hour. This can be done by the Democratic Party in the Senate taking up the measure and passing it through by a vote that will show they are in earnest. The passage of this law would be at once just and a final compromise of the existing difficulties. With the unchained enthusiasm of the northern states for free homes, the vessel of state would rapidly swing round to her old moorings. Still hoping that the Democratic Party would justify its name, De Vere included in the handbill a letter in his most resounding style, which he had written to Senator James Shields of Illinois eight years before, when an earlier homestead bill was pending. It read in part, Do as you please, do all of you as you please. I will not go down on my knees to you. I will not kiss the dust of your feet and implore you to save at once this republic from ruin and your names from eternal reproach. But I will tell you, when the wail of suffering and the howl of strife shall hereafter arise in the land— for strife, too, will start up before this drama is ended. There will be names uttered with a hissing curse, the names of those men who could have averted the destruction, but would not. In a letter to Andrew Johnson, De Vere insisted that the Democrats would be punished for opposing free homesteads. Most of the land reformers were old-line Jeffersonian Democrats. But the Republican Party, he said, had by deception drawn away nineteen-twentieths of our men. There was still time to enlist the party in the free land movement. The free soilers and their successors, the Republicans, De Vere declared, were and are impostors. If the Democrats were indeed Democrats, they could turn the tide against them. John Comerford made a similar appraisal of the situation in a letter to Johnson. I know that the Republicans attribute their success to other issues than the advocacy of the distribution of land among the people, but I am satisfied that they are mistaken. Thomas de Vere's prophecy soon came true, as the nation poised on the brink of civil war. President James Buchanan vetoed Johnson's Homestead Act, on the ground that it would go far to demoralize the people and introduce among us those pernicious social theories which have proved so disastrous in other countries. When Horace Greeley personally appealed to De Vere to help elect Abraham Lincoln, the compromise candidate for the presidency, De Vere printed an abusive handbill castigating Greeley for having used Lincoln to push aside William Seward, a far abler man, whom you have so long personally and bitterly opposed. De Vere clung to his opposition even after Lincoln made Seward his Secretary of State and gave him unusual leeway. The former governor continued to feel himself a man of destiny, and was to distinguish himself by many brilliant acts of statesmanship, including the purchase of Alaska from Russia, but De Vere could never forgive Lincoln. Alvin Bove, on the other hand, thought Lincoln the wisest possible choice. He wrote to Greeley on June 17, 1860, It seems to be the style now to discuss the sayings and doings of Horace Greeley. An obscure and humble individual away off in Wisconsin wishes to say this in relation to the prevailing subject. You did a splendid thing at Chicago and if it was through your sole efforts that William H. Seward was defeated, so much more glory and honor to you. It saved the Republican Party, and it saved the country, from four years more of the worst rule that any civilized country ever saw. 
Next to Simon Cameron, I think Lincoln's nomination was the strongest, and including Cameron's, I believe it was the best that could be made. That was my opinion for a year prior to the convention. I expressed it to you last winter at Madison. I held it down to the day of nomination, and I hold it still. I thank you, and I thank God, that Governor Seward was not nominated. And yet I would have elected him, and would gladly today, if I had the power. But now, when we have arrived at the point where success is possible for us, to throw away our chances for the love or admiration of any man, what madness of treason could equal it? De Vere would not have supported any Republican candidate, because he was convinced that the new party, reaching down to the masses with the Vote Yourself a Farm slogan of the Reformers, was actually the party of conservatism. Industrial slavery was already supplanting agricultural slavery. De Vere was sure that, despite its working-class roots, this new party was no triumph of the people, but a triumph for northern business enterprise. They had grasped at land agitation merely to aid free enterprise and increase dividends. Horace Greeley did not answer De Vere's handbill until after Lincoln had been elected, New York, November 26, 1860. Mr. T. A. DeVere. The only favor I shall ever ask of you, and I never asked one before, is this, that you procure and read Benedict Arnold's letter to his betrayed countrymen after he escaped from West Point to the British camp, and then take a steady look at your own face in the mirror. I loathe you too much for your treason to the rights of man to speak of you, but for what you have said or may say about me I care nothing. I remain glad that you have ceased personally to infest me. Horace Greeley Thomas de Vere's reply was equally incisive. Greeley, are you the rights of man? Are the political knaves associated with you the patriots of the last century? It is long since I knew your vices, but I never thought you were such an able and malignant scoundrel. De Vere carried his mistrust of republicanism to its logical conclusion of opposition to the Civil War. When the slaves were freed, he wrote bitterly that Negro emancipation had been carried triumphantly through ponds of blood and over fields of dead bodies and broken hearts, that the Negro is free, free to starve. If the Civil War had been a basic reform, a recognition of an evil, the negro would have been given a patch of land upon which to sustain himself. Instead, he was free to join the vast gang of wage slaves, indirect slavery, nominally the least odious, practically the worst of its forms. De Vere saw the whole conflict as only another step toward the enslavement of America by monopolists and stock gamblers. Ironically, it was through the Republican Party that Thomas de Vere's twenty-year agitation for free farms was rewarded. Lincoln's signature to the Homestead Act in 1862, just twenty years after de Vere's pact with the anti-renters, started a wave of westward migration that saw 2,500,000 acres settled within two years and 50 million acres within twenty years. Many of the people who had done the most for free farms were already dead before their dream was realized. Lawrence Van Dusen, the George Washington of anti-rent, died in 1852. After the free soil debacle of 1848, George Henry Evans went back to his farm in Granville to work the land, publish intermittent editions of Young America, and agitate for free homesteads. That pure-hearted man, wrote Thomas de Vere, had been literally starved back to his mortgaged spot in New Jersey, where, instead of cultivating the stony public mind, George went to cultivate melons. Some of the first money he made was used to pay the mortgage Horace Greeley held on the farm. Heart, soul, and voice of the land reform movement, George Evans died in February 1856 from an illness brought on by exposure to cold and wet. In 1874, a group of reverent land reformers, Thomas de Vere, Louis Mascarier, and John Comerford, went to pay homage to the man who had done so much for the cause. They found his grave on the Evans farm by a little worn path leading to a tall marble slab headstone amidst a wild growth of herbage, 
while the moaning breeze waved the branches of the overhanging trees like a banner, as if still inviting the landless and the pauperized masses to strike for perpetual and not a mere transient share in the soil. John Slingerland, who had dared the wrath of the Whigs with a homestead measure in 1848, died a few months before Lincoln signed the bill of which his had been the forerunner. In the last few years of his life he had emerged from political eclipse to serve as a Republican assemblyman. Slingerland's political godfather, Ira Harris, was elected to the United States Senate on his return from his trip to Europe with Stephen Van Rensselaer. His candidacy was successful largely because Thurlow Weed used him to defeat Horace Greeley, who no longer regarded Weed as such a pure and able man. While in Washington, according to one commentator, Harris was distinguished chiefly for his persistency in pressing candidates for office. I never think of going to sleep, Abraham Lincoln once said dryly, without first looking under my bed to see if Judge Harris is not there wanting something for somebody. Ira Harris wanted to forget his anti-rent past. In family-approved biographical articles and memorials published after his death in 1875, the anti-rent pages are blank. One of the youngest of the anti-rent heroes, Edward O'Connor, died of a fever on May 4, 1863, in Forestville, Michigan, hailed as a martyr and champion of the Free Soil Party. He left one son. His wife Janet had died ten years before, her health destroyed by the anxieties of those dreadful months when he awaited the gallows. After her death he had turned to the wilds of Michigan, leaving the child behind with relatives in the Platkill Valley. The boy grew to manhood and married a daughter of Henry Booten, one of Delaware County's first anti-renters and a member of the booten boughton family. Moses Earle, an old man even in the heyday of anti-rentism, continued to live on Dingle Hill after his release from prison. He had acquired such a habit of building walls at Danamora that he was unable to stop afterward. His steers and stone boat became as familiar to his neighbors in the hills as afternoon cloud shadows and storm sheets. During the winter evenings he sat alone before the big fire, except for his dog Bruce and his cats, for he outlived Sarah by many years. In 1863, there where Osmond Steele had died eighteen years earlier, Moses Earle passed away with an old red flannel nightcap on his head. He was buried beside his father in the field they had cleared near Trimperskill. Later his bones were moved, with those of the other earls, to a common grave in Andes, marked by a stone that bears only the name of his father and the record of his father's service in the Revolution. All that remains of Moses Earl is the briar-grown, tumbled foundations of his house, and most of the stone walls that still rib Dingle Hill. William Brisbane, drawn into the anti-rent agitation by a strong sense of justice, lived a long, useful life. After leaving Dingle Hill in 1849, he farmed for ten years in Fond du Lac County, Wisconsin, a neighbor of Alvin Bove and Amos Loper, and then in 1859 moved westward to Wilton, Waseca County, Minnesota, where he purchased 250 acres of prairie and timber. Driving a herd of 42 cattle over the westward trail was a struggle with April mud, and so slow was the progress that the Brisbanes sometimes camped two nights within sight of the same farm. The first year in frontier Wilton, Brisbane said, tried men's stomachs as well as their souls but he prospered, grew in influence, and served two terms in the Minnesota legislature as an independent Democrat. On July 25, 1890, at the age of 79, he died in the house he and his wife had built on arriving in Wilton. Eleven of his twelve children were still alive at the time of his death, and he left eighty head of cattle, thirteen horses, large barns, two granaries, and two houses. In reporting on his death, the Waseca Herald observed, Owing to natural sympathies for the poor and unfortunate, he took an active and prominent part in the anti-rent troubles. 
In politics and religion he was, without acknowledging it, a liberal in thought and sentiment. He was a rough diamond, somewhat warped and ill-shaped by surrounding circumstances and early habits, but still a diamond of no mean value. His ambition was great, his mind never ceased to work upon the problems of life, and he loved to study and discuss the principles of government. No American ever had a greater love for our American institutions than he. While some of his ideas were crude, owing to a want of early education, he was nevertheless honest in entertaining them, and fearless in giving them expression. He was a good neighbor, and though a man of strong passions, he could easily forgive. The editor could have added that Brisbane never relaxed his fight against the enemies of equal rights. Those men, as Brisbane said, whose only god is wealth, whose greatest study is how they can cheat and rob their fellow men of the fruits of their labor. Brisbane's former neighbor, Alvin Earl Bove, was elected twice to the Wisconsin legislature as a Republican. After serving in the Civil War as a major and as provost marshal of Norfolk and Portsmouth, Virginia, he returned to Ripon, where he remained for many years a political force. After 1880, he spent most of his time developing new communities along the North Dakota frontier, and returned to Ripon only at rare intervals. There are a few who still remember him, a tall spare figure with stooping shoulders, long legs, and flowing beard, walking with long steps and vigorous stride. Toward the end of the century, Bove returned to New York, a stately, dignified old gentleman, and lived for several years in a quiet corner of Brooklyn. New York had changed, and his old fellow radicals were dead, George Evans, Thomas DeVere, Horace Greeley, but he had many rich memories. In 1901, in search of health, Bove crossed the continent to California, and on January 29, 1903, he died in Santa Monica at the age of 85. Thomas Ange de Vere never laid down the crusader's sword until death took it from him. After leaving the anti-rent movement in 1846, he built up a small fortune by developing the East River waterfront and accumulating 400 building lots in Williamsburg, and spent much of it endowing radical papers. In 1876, he proposed that the Irish reformers in America depute thither to Ireland a few eloquent men like Wendell Phillips to educate the people in knowledge of their rights and prepare them for acting the part of men resolved to be free when the chosen hour shall come. He wrote volunteering to be one of the mental skirmishers himself. I am only approaching the old line of seventy years. In the intermediate space of two or three years, I expect to have a good deal of civil talk with the men whose crime blighted my childhood with poverty and sent me to explore other regions for the means of life, which they have feloniously taken away. When I look back at what I have acted and endured through the long years, and through the crime of those right honorable felons, I am doubly embraced to enter the field against them for a last encounter. I am not alarmed about the progress of years. I am yet eligible for the ranks of war. He has no personal ambition, commented Patrick Ford, editor of the Irish World, save that of doing good. His proposition to relinquish ease and home comfort and go forth to strike, we consider magnanimous and plucky. The plan to send agitators to Ireland failed, but Ford asked de Vere to join the staff of his paper, once more the wiry little man wrote tirelessly on his old theme of land reform, advocating the allotment of forty acres of land to each person as a bulwark against industrial wage enslavement. His most effective work was an editorial campaign that same year against the judicial murders, as he called them, in the Molly Maguire riots in the Pennsylvania coal fields, the New York Times comment that the mine agitators looked fit subjects for the gallows and were dangerous and brutal-looking evoked de Vere's full indignation. He accused the coal thieves and their friends, the newspapers and politicians of both parties, of wanting big dividends for themselves and helpless, hopeless slavery for the workers. The coal miner working in constrained and unnatural position, begrimed with dirt, 
was in all respects a blacker and less protected slave than the negro ever was he insisted de vere gave the miners much the same advice he had given the rensselaerwick tenants in eighteen forty two you are equal citizens be armed prepare resolutely for the next election prepare beforehand and proclaim a general strike on the week ending election day hope for the best but be prepared for the worst the inhuman and unjust men now riding over you will make desperate efforts to keep their seats they will stop at neither fraud nor force if serious trouble threatens them they can by one dash of their pens destroy the constitution by simply proclaiming martial law if that be done and the moment it is done accept the gauge of battle march into the arsenals capture the gun-rooms of the militia especially capture the ruffian newspaper offices and make their types tell truth for once in their lives take possession and let not a lie flash over the telegraph your enemies are thieves and thieves when justice overtakes them are mostly found to be cowards all this citizens is not a declaration of war it is simply a preparation for war and that has ever been one of the grand essentials toward preserving the peace on may twenty seventh eighteen eighty seven still battling for the common man against privilege and monopoly de vere died in brooklyn at the age of eighty two what of big thunder in some ways the most remarkable of all the heroes of the down-rent struggle the country doctor who risked his life and fortunes for an abstract principle and had the courage and the audacity to go to the great daniel webster himself for a legal opinion on anti-rentism in eighteen eighty at the age of seventy dr smith a boughton retired from the practice of medicine determined he said not to mix any more in the turmoils and busy scenes of life but to settle down to domestic tranquillity so acceptable in old age it was only a short stroll down the meadow to pike's pond back of his home in alps and he walked there often looking up at the wooded shoulder of pike's hill and remembering the days long ago when he had put on the flaming robes of big thunder to rally his neighbors to strike for the green graves of their sires reflecting on those turbulent days dr boughton was satisfied that he had reasserted the boughton proclivity for resisting tyranny he observed that great good has risen from our struggle the feudal landlords were stripped of their privilege and now a man could sit under his own vine and fig tree of his own planting with no one to make him afraid of being disturbed or driven from the land no longer did the landlords hold exclusive right to industrial enterprise hydraulic plants were rising along many of the larger streams that poured out of the manor counties and the doctor was gratified to see them doing immense business when they took the old doctor's body down the road to his last home in sand lake cemetery they raised a stone at his head dr s a boughton born september first eighteen ten died november fourteenth eighteen eighty eight aged seventy eight no epitaph told his story but a reminder of the long warfare was close by in the next plot an already well settled monument marked the grave of willard griggs the turncoat anti-renter who had died trying to evict william whitbeck it was walter church the farmers of alps said who had paid the stonecutter to chisel his tribute erected by a friend to the memory of willard griggs who was shot in fearless discharge of his duty as deputy sheriff in executing process and died august second eighteen sixty nine aged fifty eight the stone over dr boughton's grave marks the date of his death but his memory still lives in the hill country about two years ago dr boughton's grandson was driving on a back road above alps following the trails his grandfather had taken in his buggy and on horseback he stopped a bent and weathered man to ask directions and the old farmer's eyes peering sharply from under grizzled brows observed the questioner's angular frame his blue eyes and white hair what's your name boughton answered the younger man you're doc boughton's grandson the old man's face was bright and warm with recognition dr smith a boughton had from life the fruit he asked 
I have found the old maxim true, he wrote shortly before his death, that the man who attempts to overthrow an existing wrong or revolutionize a principle of government that is tyrannical must not expect to reap any reward, only in conscience and the satisfaction of knowing that his individual efforts bring a benefit to thousands. In this I am fully rewarded. End of section 23. Recording by Maria Casper. Section 24 of Tin Horns and Calico by Henry Christman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Appendix Songs and Ballads. Few men with a cause have left behind so great a body of song and ballad as the anti renters. They sang their way through the struggle with spirit and humor. From scores of verses handed down in broadsides, newspapers, and manuscripts, and by word of mouth, the following have been selected, some only for their topical interest, and others for their vigorous democratic appeal and faith in eventual victory by ballot rather than by arms. Many were written and sung for special occasions, Independence Day celebrations, political meetings, and organizing rallies, the End of Bill Snyder, the best known of the anti-rent songs, was written by S. H. Foster for a celebration on July 4, 1844, at Reedsville, first battleground of the anti-renters. Foster wrote also We Will Be Free for an Independence Day meeting at New Salem the following year. One of the most finished songsters, a resident of Middletown, Delaware County, signed himself only Forest Minstrel, Dozens of songs appeared in the columns of the Albany Freeholder, Anti-Renter, Voice of the People, Young America, and The Working Man's Advocate, and probably the volume of anti-rent verse is due in part to the editors who invited original contributions. Some of the ballads have been lost, except for snatches handed down from generation to generation, Many farmers in the anti-rent counties, especially Delaware, which seems to have been the most prolific in songs, still sing remembered quatrains. The songs below retain the misspellings and the occasionally eccentric punctuation of the original publications. Versified Account of the Sheriff's Raid on the Helderberg Anti-Renters on December 2, 1839 On Reedsville Hill a fray began, at Clark's Ale House it ended. The Dutch out o'er the soldiers ran, so merrily they bended. The sheriff from the city came, we young Prince John came he. The young, the old, the blind, the lame, they bore him good company. They reached the Helder Barrack Hill, said the sheriff, I see one farm, where I must seize for good or ill, therefore we'll sing a psalm. When they came to Reedsville Hill, as daylight did appear, they spied an aged Dutchman, and he did them draw near. Come hither, aged Dutchman, the sheriff, he did cry, and tell where are your stout men with all their great army. But verse you must gum del to me, if friends or vows you be. I hear you be de sheriff's mine, gum up from Albany. And if you be de sheriff, as I do think you be, I'm sorry you had bringed so view, mid you bad company. There's Joyce den thousand Dutchmen, stand vast upon de hill. Dell make cold junks of all your men, they want their bellies fill. Then up spoke Marcy sadly, for the Dutchmen I'm a match, I've tore my breeches badly, they must give me a patch. Then up spoke Prince John after, the Dutch girls to me high, he spoke midst shouts of laughter, to sleep with them this night. O oh, march men, cried the sheriff, and mind not all this rain. If the Dutch do not surrender, we'll all march back again. The Dutchmen dared them all to shoot, and threatened them to kill. They ran and stopped but at the foot of Helder Barrack Hill. And there Prince John did take a drink, and Marcy he drank too and said, Good troth, I truly think, we'll ne'er reach Westerloo. To small potatoes we will send, for troops these Dutch to fight, and then I will my breeches mend, and sleep away the night. 
Now let us all for Prince John pray, and Marcy long live he, although they had the worse that day with the Dutch company. From the New York Herald A Great Revolution Composed by a stranger traveling among the Helderbergs, who, being struck with their generosity and politeness, espoused at once their cause. A great revolution has happened of late, and the pride-fallen landlord laments his sad fate. The cry has gone out through the nine counties o'er, our landlord is falling to rise nevermore. They are striking examples of Hazel of old, who of future misrule by the prophets when told, with vehemence exclaimed, Is thy servant a dog? But our latter-day tyrants might have better said hog. This leads my reflection to days past and gone, when rank and high birth in close wedlock were joined, when aristocrats' sons lived in riotous way, and the poor tenants' earnings for their revels did pay, when honest old Holland sent forth her Dutch band, he offered them gratis large farms of wild land, Seven years passed, and then, as they least did suspect, they must pay him great rent, or them he would eject. Rather than be driven from farmhouse and home, to his oppressive exactions they reluctantly come. Hence many poor tenants have now to bewail, or their quarter-sale leases, and the devil entailed. If the land is e'er sold, it must be at low price, and the landlord can pocket one-fourth in a trice. Thus, while our Constitution proclaims equal rights, it is basely perverted by aristocrat might. They're the spirits of freedom, all honest and bold, and you can't buy and sell them like Arnold's of old. They all have the spirit of seventy-six. They have got the old landlord in a very bad fix. Like Bostonian Indians destroying the tea, by hook or by crook, they've resolved to be free. Go on, my brave brothers, I bid you Godspeed. It is time our republic from slavery was freed. Shall a free-born republic be ruled by a knave? Shall a tyrant prevail and the people be slaves? Brave men, you will seek no occasion for war, and the foul deeds of rapine you'll ever abhor. But if in defense of your rights you shall arm, let toils ne'er discourage nor dangers alarm. O'er Helderberg's mountains I have traveled to see if the tenants really were as represented to me. But I have found them humane, hospitable, kind, and a stranger with them an asylum may find. I've rode undisturbed o'er their hills and their dales, and have ne'er been molested by fair ones or males. No what is your business saluted my ear, or where are you going, or why come you here? I must say in frank justice to the anti-rent band, the view we have taken of you in our land was as villains and outlaws familiar with crime, and more brutal than savages of olden time. They are misrepresented, I see in the cause, they are all zealous lovers of order in laws, but at gross opposition they indignantly spurn, and will fight for the soil their forefathers have earned. So farewell, my brave fellows, I now have no time to spend with you longer in song or in rhyme. For if my name and abode you should have any calls, you have it. F. Austin, Warren County, Glens Falls. From the Albany Freeholder The Landlord's Lament Air, oh dear, what can the matter be? The Helderberg boys are playing the dickens, the night of confusion around me now thickens. Unless the rent business with some of us quickens, we'll all have to live without rents. Oh dear, dear, what can the matter be, dear, dear, what can the matter be? What shall I do with my tenants? How shall I get all my rents? I used to get rich through the poor toiling tenants. I spent all their earnings in pleasures satanic. But now I confess I am in a great panic because I can get no more rent. Oh dear, dear, what can the matter be, dear, dear, what can the matter be? 
what shall i do with my tenants oh how shall i get all my rents my tenants once to my office were flocking some without coat or a shoe or a stocking but now i declare it is really quite shocking to know i shall get no more rent oh dear dear what can the matter be dear dear what can the matter be what shall i do with my tenants how shall i get all my rents i must give up this business i vow it's no use to me it's been a continual source of abuse to me the friends of equal rights give no peace to me until they get clear of the rent oh dear dear what can the matter be dear dear what can the matter be what shall i do with my tenants how shall i get all my rents e p from the albany freeholder the end of bill snyder as sung by the utopian band of rensselaerville at the anti-land monopoly celebration at reedsville albany county july fourth eighteen forty four Air, old Dan Tucker. The moon was shining silver bright. The sheriff came in dead of night. High on a hill sat an Indian true, and on his horn this blast he blew. Oh, keep out of the way, Big Bill Snyder will tar your coat and feather your hide, sir. The Indians gathered at the sound. Bill cocked his pistol, looked around their painted faces by the moon. He saw and heard that same old tune. Oh, keep out of the way, Big Bill Snyder will tar your coat and feather your hide, sir. Says Bill, this music's not so sweet as I have heard. I think my feet had better be used, and he started to run. But the tin horn still kept sounding on. Oh, keep out of the way, Big Bill Snyder will tie your coat and feather your hide, sir. Legs do your duty now, says Bill. There's a thousand Indians on the hill. When they catch Tories, they tar their coats and feather their hides, and I hear the notes of keep out of the way, Big Bill Snyder will tar your coat and feather your hide, sir. He ran and he ran till he reached the wood, and there with horror still he stood, for he saw a savage tall and grim, and he heard a horn not a rod from him. Oh, keep out of the way, Big Bill Snyder will tar your coat and feather your hide, sir and he thought that he heard the sound of a gun and he cried in fright oh my race is run better had it been had i never been born than to come within sound of that tin horn keep out of the way big bill snyder will tie your coat and feather your hide sir and the news flew round and gained belief that bill was murdered by an indian chief and no one mourned that bill was slain but the horn sounded on again and again keep out of the way big bill snyder will tar your coat and feather your hide sir next day the body of bill was found his writs were scattered on the ground and by his side a jug of rum told how he had to his end come oh keep out of the way big bill snyder will tar your coat and feather your hide sir s h foster from a handbell the brave indian from rocky mountains we are come to free our lands from slavery never again to see our home till we execute our bravery a brave indian ne'er despise nor count him as a stranger remember he your country stays in the day and hour of danger your pleasant homes you shall enjoy we boldly have avowed it your peace the tyrants would destroy but we will not allow it our tawny arm is stretched out still to shield you and protect you our dearest blood will freely spill we never will neglect you a brave indian ne'er despise nor count him as a stranger remember he your country stays in the day and hour of danger 
fatiguing marches will endure that you may dwell in quiet your lands from rent we will secure at least we mean to try it at night in peace you need lie down upon your beds to rest you but we must wander through the town to see that none molest you a brave indian ne'er despise nor count him as a stranger remember he your country stays in the day and hour of danger don't drive poor indian from your door nor with disdain reject him but give him of your plenteous store how cruel to neglect him a brave indian ne'er despise nor count him as a stranger remember he your country stays in the day and hour of danger from original manuscript found among the papers of the editor of the albany freeholder the spring campaign or the tory exploits delaware county spring 1845 the delaware invincibles and wonder of the day and sheriff green that reliant man whose fame can ne'er decay green felt his race was nearly run and so resolved was he to do some deed to send his name down to posterity a posse first he ordered out to march to andy's town lord howe commander was it seems a tory of renown the wondrous feat they there performed stands bright on history's page they captured a prisoner but sixteen years of age the bloodhounds started out next day fresh laurels for to gain they stole four dollars worth of hay and made their boasts in vain their hands were in what could they do they must not idle be so the sheriff and his ruffians next set out for roxbury four natives they made out to take o oh, joyful news indeed they now could keep a posse upon pretense of need bovina next a visit got from this degraded clan was e'er such valor known before a hundred took one man to roxbury again they went resolved to have some fun they pulled the women out of bed because they fired a gun that night the horns began to toot and sheriff green looked pale he ordered out a pitchfork guard to watch the delhi jail some straw was placed beneath the jail and should the natives come were orders from sheriff green to fire the jail and run lord howe was lost amid the din that tory so renowned hid in a flour barrel at last was the old rascal found and bub steel too that hero brave where could the bloodhound be safe in an oven peeping out the dreadful scene to see rast edgerton was trembling he could not hold a gun old hathaway went into fits he thought his race was run judge wheeler crawled beneath the bed pete wright hid in a churn he said the native will be here the village they will burn the women ran from house to house to bid their friends farewell the horrors of that fearful night no mortal tongue can tell the great and gallant pitchfork guard stood looking quite austere they could not fight they could not run so struck were they with fear the night passed on the morning dawned the natives did not come the sheriff and his pitchfork guard once more beheld the sun when the four prisoners were tried old hathaway was there the devil with a cloven foot could not be more severe the judge while passing sentence on the prisoners shed tears because he couldn't sentence them to sing sing twenty years about those tears much has been said by both up rent and down but it is well known a crocodile might claim them as his own cannons were fired off for joy by fiends in human form they took delight in others woes but their reward will come and should the evils here described for ever be endured no by the ballot box will show such evils can be cured supplied by charles ellis grant of margaretville delaware county from anti-rent material gathered by his mother we will be free as sung by the Euterpian band at anti-land monopoly celebration at new salem albany county july fourth eighteen forty five air the boatman's dance 
Hail, patriots, hail, the sacred day, our fathers broke the tyrant's sway. Let earth resound with notes of glee, it is our nation's jubilee. Then shout, brothers, shout, oh, shout, brothers, shout. Loud sound the horn upon the morn of Independence Day. Huzzah, huzzah, we will be free from feudal rents and tyranny. Huzzah, huzzah, we will be free from feudal rents and tyranny. Our feudal lords in coaches ride, puffed up with vanity and pride. Their boasted wealth, they do forget, was purchased by the tenant's sweat. They ne'er remember that the bread upon their tables daily spread, and the rich viands which they eat are products of the farmer's wheat. Their wives and daughters richly dressed, for naught but golden charms caressed, oft treat one far more fair with scorn, because forsooth she's cottage born. But shout, brothers, shout, O oh, shout, brothers, shout, loud sound the horn upon the morn of Independence Day. Huzzah, huzzah, we will be free from feudal rents and tyranny. Huzzah, huzzah, we will be free from feudal rents and tyranny. Proud, haughty barons, ye may spy the tempest gathering in the sky. The storm ye once thought would not last, ye may discern has not yet passed. We sons of patriots, sires, now swear your loads we will no longer bear. A thousand hearts now beat as one to finish what we have begun. The time is past when we'll consent to pay for land a yearly rent. To you whose title is at best one which you dare not now contest. Then shout, brothers, shout, oh, shout, brothers, shout. Loud sound the horn upon the morn of Independence Day. Huzzah, huzzah, we will be free from feudal rents and tyranny. Huzzah, huzzah, we will be free from feudal rents and tyranny. No longer o'er the fields and roads our teams shall drag your heavy loads. We'll bring your tables to adorn, not one fat hen nor peppercorn. Of lands o'er which the waters run, we can consent to spare you none. For in those streams we fear a drought, if you should take the bottoms out. Then happy days return once more, no sheriff knocking at the door. With food enough upon our shelves, we'll spend the quarter sales ourselves. Then shout, brother, shout, oh, shout, brother, shout. Loud sound the horn upon the morn of Independence Day. Huzzah, huzzah, we will be free from feudal rents and tyranny. Huzzah, huzzah, we will be free from feudal rents and tyranny. S. H. Foster, from a handbell, originally published in the Albany Freeholder. The Uprent Major in Delaware County, an office seeker was caught taking down a liberty pole raised by the anti renters. The pioneers of freedom, the hardy sons of toil, resolved to claim their birthright, the freedom of the soil. No more to cringe and flatter, and bow with hat in hand, the tyrants who oppress them, and claim to own their land. So they solemnly united, and raised their standard high, with banner fair unfolded to meet the public eye. Heaven gave the fair foundation, and heaven gave the tree. The sons of freedom raised it, pledge of their liberty. 
It plainly showed the landlords their day of power was o'er. Henceforth they would be free men, and pay them rent no more. The landlords saw and trembled, the token well they knew. They feared the hands that raised it, and prudently withdrew. But secretly determined a fitting tool to find, who could be bought with lucre to act what they designed. They thought a man of honor would spurn their gilded bait, but they knew a quondam major whom their notice would elate. They knew that flattery fed him, that office was his aim. He'd be proud of chain and collar if it bore a landlord's name. So they hinted what they wanted, but oh, how big he grew. For twenty silver pieces I'll betray these men to you. Well, they bought him, dubbed him agent, or at least he hoped they would, if he proved a faithful donkey, and served them all he could. Then, like his predecessor, old Judas, on he went, we judge this by his conduct, to betray the innocent. So he pricked up his long harkers, and at once began the job. Perhaps the silver pieces were sinking in his fob. He wore a mask of friendship, he borrowed Jacob's art. Art thou in health, my brother? while he stabbed him in the heart. He assumed a tone of kindness, said he wished their minds to know, "'Twas his object to befriend them, and his good feelings show. "'They were old friends and neighbors, nor would he do them harm, "'but he wanted to advise them how each might hold his farm. "'Then he told them his old story, long as the moral law, "'about the Constitution, to fill their minds with awe, "'since the only way of safety, the wisest and most fit, "'since the landlords were the masters, was for them to submit.' that it really was their duty, and he thought their interest, too, all peacefully to settle, and let the landlords have their due. He'd one more thing to mention. That poll, you've acted wrong. The madam is offended. She will be back ere long. It has stood too long already. It must be taken down. She feels herself insulted. You'll be ruined by her frown. It surely must be leveled. It must no longer stand." The madam won't allow it. She'll drive you off her land. The law is hard against you, as you must plainly see. The landlord's claims are sacred, and honored they must be. Now we are here together. Let's take it down today. If you don't like to do it, I can and will straightway. But not a man that raised it would desecrate the tree. They loved the sacred symbol of their country's liberty. He saw their manly firmness, and with his bribe-stained hand, broke down their tree of freedom in its own native land. How did the forest natives their fury then restrain? Had justice claimed the forfeit, the blood that rock had stained? Or had one trace of honor, one spark of patriot zeal, one kindly throb of feeling allied to public weal, found shelter in his bosom, or warmed his fulsome frame, with this eternal stigma he would not have stained his name. Now we leave the quondam major, his hopes all come to naught. While he the brush was beating, another bird was caught. But long the tree shall flourish, and the banner proudly wave, till every uprent Tory shall fill a coward's grave. And long as splendid rivers shall roll their waves sublime, our cause shall be respected in every distant clime. Forest Minstrel, from Young America The Helderberg War Oh, hark, in the mountains I hear a great roar, Those Helderberg farmers are at it once more, With their war-whoops and Indians most wickedly bent, On shaving Van Rensselaer out of his rent. And the way they make war is to feather and tar, Every unfortunate law-seeking gent, Who by landlord or sheriff among them is sent, and then, when with soldiers you seek them, alas! For those chiefly concerned, it still came to pass. They might as soon with a thread think of catching a whale, or a swallow by throwing some salt on its tail. Even thus, when the sheriff, so warlike at need, sees a pack of them coming and thinks they are hisen, commands his stout posse to charge them with speed, and prepares in his triumph to march them to prison, they melt into air or creep into holes like nothing i'll swear but sprites or moles so the only thing the poor sheriff can do is to make them leave when they hover in view 
for he knows in his soul when they've vanished away that the finding a pin in a bundle of hay were as nothing compared with the labor so hobbling of finding those helderberg farmers or elves it would seem as though each were a mole or hobgoblin though their landlord would swear they're the devils themselves but tremble tremble ye farmers stout for our troops may assemble to ferret ye out even the troops of new york with invincible hearts who when they went picking last time in your parts succeeded in killing three pigs and a cow though they failed as to putting an end to the row like the duke of york and his merry men they marched up the hill and marched down again and will wager of pennies a hundred to ten that should they revisit your region so gory they'd eat you alive when they find you that's when and return with an equal division of glory oh our soldiers are boys that fear no noise unless they are mounted on horses but then they are very like to fall off them again should their steeds show their mettle and therefore they fear every sound that may fall on the sensitive ear we speak not of privates or sergeants or such nay the captains themselves are below us a touch but of generals and staff who would make a dog laugh upon horses hired out for two dollars a day as leaving their shops they prepare for the fray one keeps his saddle without any thanks by anchoring his spurs in the poor horse's flanks one tugs at the curb till his charge shows blood and deposits his rider at ease in the mud a colonel so carries his legs that a child might perceive at a glance he's a tailor run wild while a general who much in the service takes pride has belted his rapier on his right side on the whole they look like a parcel of flats knocked for their sins into three cocked hats but still at a distance when people don't see how badly themselves and their horses agree and what dismal long faces among them abound for fear they might measure their length on the ground with their falchions so bold and their coats laced with gold and their feathers so fine they cut a great shine though not quite napoleons as sure as a gun might steal the soft heart from the breast of a nun which all must admit if their tastes be but true who gaze on a picture so warlike to view but there's one sort of soldiering done in new york which the dander might raise in a stoic or turk and make strangers suppose if they gazed on our woes that with all our boasting we yankee doodles were the sublimest of this world's noodles we speak of our train band gatherings raw which fools of us make according to law and mulked us in fines which are spent in dinners to fatten a pack of lazy sinners who study the stupid drills to make and bad as may be for their stomach's sake for the more are shamed into paying the fine the better that awkward squad can dine you doughheads whom still we must take into grace and vote up in albany if you are true and worth half the rhino you get by your place relieve us from this or go hang yourselves do from the working man's advocate at two dollars per day albany city is a very rough place filled up with those land sharks of killian's race the city's too small to hold all the breed they rove round the country like every bad weed in columbia county and state of new york lived some of those prowlers much worse than the turks for legally robbing they have made themselves known their acts of oppression the land doth bemoan in columbia county town of hillsdale where people assembled or wrong to prevail to talk of their grievances and hit on some plan how they could get rid of this lord of the land the natives assembled in motley array with pistols in belt as people do say a pistol went off and we do lament it shot a pale face without an intent the news then to hudson with speed it did come the judge to the sheriff with speed he did run he says to the sheriff you must go with me we'll take up those rebels wherever they be the judge and the sheriff away they did steer at the place of conflict they quick did appear they arrested one bouton and he they did say had been the ringleader of this very fray the people of hudson in arms they did rise for fear of the men who put on the disguise placed a guard at the jail in the midst of the fray for fear the red men would take bouton away 
The people of Hudson in council they went, to call on the governor, it was their intent, for arms from the arsenal and men from that place, to shield them from cost and from lasting disgrace. The late legislature was in a great stew, to save Mr. Governor and carry him through, but I fear he will stumble and fall on the plain, if he ever puts up to be governor again. Oh, now, says his lordship, you must pay these men, who went out a-cruising in the last campaign. They went to old Hudson, and there, they did say, they gambled and drank at two dollars per day. C. S. From the Albany Freeholder THE PRISONERS IN JAIL Lines composed in the Columbia County Jail, July 9, 1845 There is Boughton and Belden and many beside. They are quite clever fellows, or else they're belied. For what they're in jail I scarcely do know. But it's base at the best. Well, let it go so, in these hard times. The sheriffs will out with their array of men. The county will find them what money they spend. They will seize upon prisoners, and into the cell. If there's anything worse, it must be in hell, in these hard times. And there they will keep them confined in the jail, without any liberty for to get bail. They will do as they please, in spite of your friends, and God only knows where this matter will end, in these hard times. But the sheriff and others who go in the huddle I'm fearful are getting themselves into trouble, for unless they keep themselves somewhere near straight, they will be twitched at the eye at a hell of a rate in these hard times. But we are prisoners in jail, our cases are hard, they look all around to keep on their guard, their feet fast in irons chained down to the floor, they are pretty sheriffs, what can they do more in these hard times? And as for the jailer, he's a man of renown. He spends all his time in ironing them down. He says for their keeping they don't get half pay, though he gives them but two poor meals a day in these hard times. The judges and jurors are a very fine crew. They take the poor prisoners and drive them right through. The sheriffs will falter, all hell they don't fear. They will bring them in guilty if they prove themselves clear in these hard times. They will send them to jail, and there for to lie, on bread and cold water, or else they must die, or else down to Sing Sing, and there for to dwell, for twenty-five dollars they would send us to hell, in these hard times. The district attorney is a handsome young man, he spends all his time in laying some plan, and as for the sheriff, he's a man I despise, he will go to the governor with his mouth full of lies, in these hard times. He seizes upon property, and that he will sell, and drink, by the way, he can do very well. He will do anything that will profit himself, for Uncle Sam has to pay him as well as the rest, in these hard times. And as for the council, they seem to be clever. They tell them fine stories, make all things fair weather. But it's for money they go, as you're all well aware, and without it they don't care a don how we fare, in these hard times. But there is the doctor I like to forgot. Still he is the meanest of all the whole lot. He says he will cure them, for half they possess, and when they are dead he will sue for the rest, in these hard times. Although he says the old jail's very filthy, and the jailer must clean it, or else he will see, the prisoners are fast declining, and the jailer is to blame. If he don't do his duty, he'll report him very soon, in these hard times." but I think now it's time to finish my song. I can prove all I've said if you think I've done wrong, for they're prisoners in jail without any bail, and I think they don't like this lying in jail in these hard times. Mortimer C. Belden, Little Thunder, from the Albany Freeholder Come, all true anti-renters, Come, all true anti-renters, who live by honest toil, Come sing a song right gaily about the right of soil. When proud and haughty tyrants would live on others' gain, The shout against oppression was running o'er land and main. Ye form a noble phalanx of men upright and bold, 
and to your rights undoubting ye firmly now must hold. Come, to the contest gather, and vote now once again, and soon the strife is over, the victory soon is won. Come, cast your trusty ballots for friends of anti-rent, and when your work is ended, your time will be well spent. From the Albany Freeholder Lay Down the Musket Lay down the murderous musket, put by the glittering steel. We ask the rights of free men, and to free men we appeal. A weapon far more potent, the ballot box shall yield. It is the only weapon a yeoman's hand should wield. We ask no princely favors, we ask for this alone. The rightful boon of free men, a spot to call our own. Would you bid us leave these valleys? and on the prairies west erect our humble hamlets to be with freedom blest when up our mountain streamlets and o'er these hills we rove we trace our fathers footsteps amid the scenes we love tis here their graves are scattered how were they wont to toil and by these sacred memories we are wedded to this soil and you the princely owners of this rich and wide domain what boots it longer proudly to regard us with disdain? We envy not your riches, though increased an hundredfold, but why are landed titles preferred to shining gold? No gift, however humble, we are asking at your hand. We ask the rightful purchase of the freehold of our land. We ask the glorious privilege, be every honest will, of gaining independence and wooing fortune's smile. We ask no princely favors, we ask for this alone, the rightful boon of free men, a spot to call our own. From the Albany Freeholder End of Section 24 Recording by Maria Casper End of Tin Horns and Calico by Henry Christman